I think we're there. Hey, everybody, it's Adam Farkas along with Paul Farkas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to yet another edition of CE Wire, CE Wire 2019. And if you're watching this, thank you for getting up early. <laughs> Uh, not on the East Coast. Yeah. Yes, so we're out on the West Coast and it is very early here. The sun is not up yet, but we are here broadcasting live. And uh, so, Paul, it should be an interesting show today. We've got, we got a lot of stuff going on. This is the by far the biggest show that we've done with 56 Absolutely. credits, um, you know, four tracks running simultaneously. It's just going to be total anarchy and chaos. And I hope everybody has a great time today. Um, on the live stream here today, we're going to sort of talk and hang on one second here. Let me just... Uh, Make, before we get started here, this is why we always test things before we go. I'm going to run on over to our live stream page and make sure that everybody can see us. Who is beeping? Who's, whose phone no, is that? No, my phone is on. <laughs> probably when I turned it off. Probably me. I'm off. That's you. Probably me. Okay. But, um, okay, so we are streaming here, so yes, it does seem to work. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so, as everyone may or may, or may not know, Steve Silberberg will be here today, too, uh, online. Um, so you can see in the live stream right now, if, you, if you're pulling up the live stream window, underneath there's a chat window. You can discuss what's going on at the conference right there. Steve is actually, was supposed to be here. A, and A victim. He is a, <laughs> yeah, a victim of the... Of the slowdown. So, well, and, and a victim apparently of bad airplanes because he was about to get on an airplane and, and apparently they had to reboot the airplane. So I guess airplanes have very fancy computers these days and they couldn't reboot it in time. And then and something so was got, coming from Boston. He got stuck uh, back in New Jersey and couldn't make it out here. But Steve is there uh, on the chat window right now. I'll say hi, Steve. And we will uh, go from there. Um, so yeah, so there's going to be a lot going on here today, and uh, I'm trying to think, before we really get underway, um, we want to go through our discounts that people, you know, that we're going to be giving. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah the we want to also talk about our sponsors before we start. Yeah, probably a good idea, yeah, so, so let's do that. And the, the, these booths are ready for action. And do you want to just move over a little bit? <clears throat> sure. Keep going. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We got to get a little bit better in frame here. You could you could tell it's early, right? Um, and in fact, I have no. Sure, the, ah. the booths are open right yes. now, so people. Can so yes, yeah, so the booths are in. open. So let me uh, let me uh, um, pull this up for you guys, right here. So, and fingers crossed that this works properly. So let me pull you out of the way here, Mr. Browser. So. You will go out of the way, and I will show everyone the discounts today. And I will pull this up. Bear with me. Okay, that's better. So let me pull it up on the screen. Look at the number of sponsors this year. So let me pull this up so everyone can see it. So here we are with the, the number of sponsors that we have here. It's a, a huge number. I think I counted it was, uh, there's, there's 18 companies in total here. Um, or some, something ridiculous like that. It's a, it's a big number, and many are offering discounts today. So if we scroll through, we can take a look and see what everyone's, what's everyone's offering. Um, so why don't we just go through it real quickly. First and foremost, we need to thank Marco uh, for sponsoring the conference today. Absolutely. Um, so Marco yeah. sponsors the live stream. They've done it for the last five years, and we thank them so much. We couldn't do this without them. Um, and so go check out their booth, see what's going on with Marco. We're going to have Tim Petito from Marco on later today, and we're going to see what's going on with him and, and get an update. Um, Oculus is here with us again, and again, they're another sponsor. They've been with us the whole time. So Oculus it has a, a deal of offering $3,000 of their devices uh, at the booth. So if you want to get into their booth, talk them up, and the offer is going to expire at the end of the conference. $3,000 off anything. So it's a lot. So, you know, if you're thinking about buying a Pentacam, this, this may be the time to do it. Will they give you a $1,000 rebate if you only order $2,000 worth? <laughs> only you would think of such a thing. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> Oculus. <laughs> Vision Web, so makers of the Uprise uh, uh, EHR that, that so many people are, are using. And Vision Web, again, is a sponsor. They've been with us for the entire run of CE Wire. So thanks uh, to them for being here. Check, head on to their booth, see what's going on with them and with Uprise. Uh, the platform continues to mature, and as you may or may not know, Uprise is really the only one of the only latest generation systems 
uh, out there in eye care. So Flash, which is officially going to die very soon, uh, is something that they never had to deal with because they built from the ground up on HTML5. So Vision Web and Uprise. And for those of you that don't understand a word of what Adam just said. Oh, sorry, I was speaking in <laughs> jargon. <laughs> what? Press play, Gretchen. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, so if, why don't you put that in English? Um, it, um, so, yeah, so f put it in English for Vision Web? Oh, yeah, so they make an EHR that's web-based, so you don't have to install anything. You don't have to have any servers or deal with any uh, in-house IT nonsense. You just go to the web, you know, you have thin cli web clients, and that's how you actually access Vision Web. So, for many people, it's a much better deal than trying to set up computers with, uh, you know, Windows software and install it individually on each computer. So it's just easier to do. It's a turnkey operation yeah. for those who are yep. ignorant. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's much better to do things web-based, especially these days. In the beginning, there was always the question, will this work? Because the web, you know, wasn't very advanced in the beginning. The interfaces weren't very rich, but now they are. And so um, web-based applications are the way to go for, for the majority of apps that people use today. There are some exceptions, right? Like games, you need that real-time interaction, or the software that we're using to broadcast this obviously is not web-based. But for the most part, for business software, web-based is the way to go. And in fact, uh, I will say that we made extensive use of cloud-based documents when we were putting this conference together so we could all share much easier. So web is, is definitely the way to go. Okay, uh, Zeiss. So you know them and you love them, and today they are having huge savings. Now, um, they couldn't advertise all of them with us publicly beforehand, but now if you go to their booth, you can see what they've got going on. Uh, so Zeiss uh, has up to 30% on a bunch of their different equipment, all their OCTs, the new Ultra Wide Field Fundus uh, Claris Imaging Camera. Um, and they're also having combo packages. Uh, so if you buy multiple uh, different instruments, you can get even deeper discounts. So that's Zeiss. Head, head into their booth to actually qualify for those discounts. Uh, EMS. So EMS, uh, as you know, was acquired by Lombard, I guess it was last year. Um, so EMS uh, makes a lot, they sell pre-owned equipment and they move a lot of Zeiss units and you can see that they have some great deals today at the show. Um, you can see up there for the Cirrus 400, 4000 and 5000, uh, they're throwing in an extra year of warranty for only $1000 as well. So lots of good stuff. They also have these lane packages and I won't go into the details about each one because there's a lot of stuff. But what you can see is that they hit different price points. Um, and they also have 10% off their patternless edging systems that they stock. So and, and they're with the previously owned material, they'll guarantee repairs and all that as if it were new. Correct, yes, they, do, they, they uh, service what they sell. Um, and so uh, I think what you want to do is go into their booth to learn more about what they have. It's a great deal, especially if you're getting started, right? I mean, there's no, um, you know, if, if you're started and you're cash constrained, this, this can be a very good deal uh, to get your practice up and running. So NeuroLens, we're going to have folks from NeuroLens on. Uh, uh, later in the show, and we're going to learn all about how their new product works um, and how it, it creates these micro prisms for, for your. And they'll describe what the. the and they'll, they'll is. describe exactly how it works because it is something very new and very different, and it's something that most people have not heard of yet. Um, you know, they only launched recently, uh, and so we're going to learn an awful lot about it. We have some in-depth slides about it too, um, and I believe there's a couple lectures at the conference that is, that's talking about yeah, neurons as well. Right. So we're going to have a couple of the docs on as well to discuss the actual technology and how it works. I had a chance to actually try the NeuroLens system out in, I don't, I don't even remember, was it Vegas? It was one of the Vision Expos. Uh, so it was a really uh, neat system. So it's a combination of a device and then they uh, create lenses uh, from the output of the device. Uh, Lombard, again, a sponsor, and this is, we're talking about uh, Lombard Instrument, the um, distributor, not, not just little EMS, which is a piece of Lombard, but Lombard themselves are also advertising here. They have their own booth. Uh, and you can see they're also offering some lane packages on a variety of different equipment at different price points, you know, from it says up to $13,000 all the way up to, um, you know, the $61,000 platinum lane package. So, and, and these are all virtual booths, so they didn't have to carry the instruments. Right. So the big issue is, you know, people always ask, why are these companies offering these discounts? And the reason is because they don't have to set up a gigantic booth. Uh, they don't have to... You know, just getting the equipment from one place to another costs a huge amount of money, and obviously they don't have to do any of that here. Um, nor do they have to pay any union people to set up their booth and 
hang the little signs and so forth. So, um, so again, they, they have all kinds of discounts going on on Topcon equipment as well. Um, so check them out. So ABB, uh, the largest contact lens distributor in the country, and I believe they actually sell more contact lenses than any other company, period. Um, because, you know, they sell to doctors, and I think they have more volume than anybody. So, so you want to check them out, too. They're not just contact lenses, though. You know, they also, they also do um, not just soft lenses. They do gas perms, right? They have their own lab. Um, so, so check them out. So there, there might be more there than, than what you know already. Lance Leasing, so uh, if you want to buy or lease any of this equipment, you probably want to stop in to see how you can get it financed. <laughs> and Lance is here today uh, to help you finance any of this equipment that we're talking about. Um, so they have two promotions that are being combined, that you can combine together, um, where they'll pick up your documentation fees. And if you can bundle more than two vendors in the same agreement, they'll lower your rates even more, right? So, right. you know, if, if you buy something from Zeiss and you buy something from Oculus, and you need to, to get financing for it, you know, they can lower your rate. Um, I Care Pro, so if you need to market your practice and who doesn't, the, they are sort of a one-stop shop to go to. They can not just help you with your web, web presence, but also SEO. They can help you with your social media presence. Um, so basically, if you don't have the time or ability <laughs> to handle this yourself, yep. you may as well let professionals do it. And, and I Care Pro, they certainly know what they're doing. You know, hundreds of practices have used them. Um, so they, they understand the eye care space incredibly well. Pivotal. So I had a, a quick interview with the Pivotal folks uh, yesterday, and we'll be playing that back sometime today or tomorrow. Um, so Pivotal is a brand new buying group. They only launched maybe about a year ago. Totally free to join. Um, they have in incredibly good rates and deals uh, you know, with a variety of different vendors. They also have this online education uh, that they're offering through their portal as well. So they've got a, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and again, I'll play back those interviews for you later to learn more about them. So they're sort of the new kid on the block. They're very aggressive in, in doing things that uh, the other companies really weren't. And it's for free. And it's for free. Yeah, you can sign up for free. There's no obligation. Um, so you want to check them out as well. Uh, Vision Equipment Inc. So Leo Hadley, and hopefully we'll get Leo on the, on the phone here today, although I, <laughs> I was trading emails with poor Leo. He's losing his voice. So... Um, so he's got a little bit of laryngitis going on, so I don't know if we're going to be able to get him. Maybe tomorrow he'll, be, he'll recover a little better. But his booth is open and he's in there. And fortunately, I guess, at a show like this, you don't actually have to talk at your booth. You can just type. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, so Leo's offering 20% off his lowest prices on Santinelli Edgers at the show and 10% discounts on anything that he's got in stock. Um, and so Leo's got a, a huge inventory of uh, pre-owned equipment, so definitely go check out his booth. Um, Acuity Eye Care Group, and so uh, this is, uh, I guess, what you would refer to in the business as a private equity group. Um, so they go out and they look for very good practices to acquire and integrate into their group. Um, and we're going to be speaking with Ben Chudner uh, later today, I think, um, to talk a little bit about what they do and, you know, is, is private equity right for you? Um, and it's not always right, which is the fascinating thing. You know, people always assume that, you know, when, when a, a group like this approaches them, they get the hard sell, but they really want to get the right fit. Um, right. And Ben talks about that a lot, about who this is for and who this is not for. And he's giving a one-hour course. He's giving a one-hour course, the COPE approved course, all about this as well. So then that's in, in CUIR, so you definitely want to go check it out um, if you're interested in private equity at all, you're just learning how it all works. Um, you know, sort of what to look for, what some pitfalls might be. So interesting talk. And Optometry Times, practical chair-side advice. And so we have Gretchen Bailey here with us today as well, uh, and she's going to be helping me out with a lot of the interviews today. Um, and so Gretchen's the editor-in-chief of Optometry Times. And what can I say? What can I say to you about this publication that we haven't already said? Um, so it's timely. It's got these bite-sized nuggets so you don't have to read super long articles yep. that you're just going to forget. Um, they recommend that you throw the, the publication out, which I find really cool. So they don't want these things to hang around for 10 years. They want, you know, this is practical, this is in the now, stuff that you can use immediately. So sort of refreshing. and Sort of like different. USA Today, <laughs> but better. I, Gretchen, I think Gretchen's <laughs> going to throw something at your head. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely check them out, um, Optometry Times. And Gretchen, you know, next time we, we run through this, you can tell us a little bit more about what's going on at Optometry Times um, when you come back in. So that's all for the sponsors right now. And let me pull this down. All right. So 
so that's about it. So at the show, let me actually bring up the schedule so I can sort of show everybody what's going on as well um, at the show because classes have not started yet, but they are about to. And let's pull it up and show everybody what's going on. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, so, well, so it looks like to sort of kick things off, uh, we have Crystal Brimer talking about ocular surface disease. In, uh, and uh, by the way, everyone, if you've noticed or maybe you haven't, we have set up separate rooms this year. So on the right side of the screen, you'll see there's a treatment, sy uh, systemic, practice management, and general. Um, so there's four different tracks running at the same time. Um, so the fir first off in uh, treatment, we're going to have Crystal Brimer talking about ocular surface disease. Um, and Crystal is very well known. Um, right. And she runs, she runs an institute as well for dry eye. And we're going to talk to her later uh, in the live stream about her institute and, and what it's all about. Um, so fascinating stuff. Um, you know, she has a methodology for diagnosing and treating dry eye, a real algorithm that you can go through and use. Um, so Grand Rounds, Neuro-Ophthalmology and Systemic Disease. So this is going to be some rapid fire cases about the relationship between systemic and ocular disease. Um, so again, refresher if this is, if this is something uh, that you might have forgotten. About. A refresher or learn for the first time <laughs> if you're older. <laughs> for you, Paul, it's, it's, all, it's all the first well, time. Well, no. um, uh, and then uh, the next up, at the same time, we have uh, maximizing profit opt-out and alternative lens sourcing. And this is with Mark Sturm from Pivotal. Um, so as he told me yesterday in the interview, opting out um, is something that doctors can do apparently in 14 states now. So, and um, growing. And growing. So, uh, so this is something that people are starting to do. And it's actually funny. I think a lot of people don't even realize that they live in an opt-out state. Um, and I don't, I don't know what they all are. I should probably actually go find that out. Um, but it's, it's a trend now. Um, and it can definitely impact your practice. So you want to check that out as well. Uh, so then we have Clark Chang and, and Chris Rapuano talking about keratoconus. Um, so these two folks, um, you know, from, from Wills, they're, they're sort of the authorities on keratoconus. Absolutely. So uh, you, you might, if you're interested in the topic at all, you definitely want to sit in on that lecture uh, and learn all about it. From someone that wrote the book. From someone that literally wrote the book. <laughs> so it's very rare that we, we have that kind of opportunity. Chris is going to be stopping by as well, the live stream, just to chat a bit. Um, and so those, I believe, are the first set of classes that are going to be coming up, starting at 11 Eastern time. And, and you've got to remember to be able, you can ask questions because the instructors are there. Correct. So ask, ask questions and they will be there to answer them in real time. That is correct. So yes, so that's, that's one of the big differences with uh, CWIRE. When you take it live, we have the staff there that you can text chat and they'll answer your questions. And so that's why you get COPE interactive credits for it. If you come back, you know, and the lectures are going to be up here till July 1st, if you come back at right. another time, you're going to get enduring credit, which is a different number. But if you're sitting in on a course, your, your slip will say that you took it interactive. Correct. And then you should check with your state board mm -hmm. if that's considered live. Right. Yep. And so there are some states like New York where our interactive credits are like live credits. I, I think Missouri is that way. Yeah. And so. for sure, uh, Ontario. Yes, so for, for our Canadian friends, and a huge proportion of folks who are taking the CUR courses are from Canada, these are Category A credits. Um, so I think that's probably why we have so many Canadians coming in. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, because they can use literally like all of these credits. Uh, and uh, we got approved in New Zealand as well. I don't know if you saw that little footnote um, that all of the, the clinical stuff was approved for New Zealand credits too. Yeah. So um, that's good news for you, so you 10 people that have signed up. From New Zealand. <laughs> now, come on now. <laughs> All right, yes, it is true. We don't have too many people from New Zealand, but if, if you are from New Zealand and you do need the credits, feel free to come on in now. The, the credits are good. Uh, you can't take the practice management classes by and large. So, for instance, you don't care about VSP. <laughs> so, the board did not approve those, but all of the clinical uh, courses you can take. So, I would just stay out of that practice management room uh, and you should be fine. And that is about it. And so I wonder if Steve is around and wants to uh, say anything to us. Let me check it out and see here. Okay. So Steve, if you actually want to come in and, uh, and talk to us at all uh, before we get going here in our first interview, let me know because um, we have about 10 minutes to go until it starts. Sure. Steve will be uh, visiting courses during the entire day 
to make sure there are no problems. Right. So if you have the live stream up and running, and I can I can show people, uh, and I guess if you're listening to my voice, you probably do. Um, beneath this live stream, you can see the little chat window right there, and. Uh, here's when you, you can type in questions and uh, interact with folks. If you're having problems at the conference at all, this is the place where you can um, put in questions about it as well. So Steve is there to help. Um, yeah, <laughs> he's saying fly, take an earlier flight next year. Yeah, I mean, actually, what happened to Steve is a really good. Um, it really shows why Internet CE is important, right? Because <laughs> who wants to deal with this <laughs> traveling place to place? Sure. Um, when you don't have to. So it's, it's sort of a good object lesson. The travel has just become so difficult. Um, and it's sometimes nicer just to be able to do your C at home. So that is Steve. So let me put that away. All right. So I guess in a couple minutes we have who's coming up? Uh, we have folks from Lombard coming up. We have Dan Haney from Lombard as, right. our, as our first person to talk yeah, to. 30. Yep. And so. That's in a little while, but for right now, uh, why don't I give Steve a call since he's sitting there? Okay, so Steve, let me uh, pull up his number. <laughs> you think this is easy, Steve? Do I already have his number in there? Wow, I'm I so just clever. Put it in. Do you want me to tell you? Sorry. I got it. Thank you, Gretchen. This is great. It's like having a production assistant right here. Hi, Adam. Hey, how's it going, Steve? Hi, Steve. Let me turn off your feet because you're um, seven seconds late or something. <laughs> yes, I'm here and um, I'm awake and uh, want me to go through my ordeal and tell people to make uh, a little bit earlier plans. <laughs> I wonder well, how many people were stuck that had to go to Las Vegas for this weekend. Uh, it was a lot. Um, the, the anything going out far to the west was was delayed and delayed and delayed. And then I got the fortunate uh, experience of going on a plane. And after I was on the plane and on the tarmac for an hour, the plane was out of service. So I would be getting in just about now. Uh, oh my God! <laughs> with no sleep. Actually, it would have been two a.m. Um, and by the time we get to the hotel, it would be four a.m. But uh, it was a, it was a perfect storm of the. Um, air traffic controllers going on strike and then a technical problem with my plane. So I'm sorry I, I'm sorry you don't see my mug there this year, everybody, but uh, I'll make an effort. I'll, I'll probably start coming in July next year for the January <laughs> conference so I get there in time. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it, it was a d disaster for you. And, and I just, you know, I, it was just underscoring how traveling these days is such a pain that I can see why so many people have decided to take Internet CE whenever they can. Absolutely. This is a, a, a good testimony for it, and it's a great commercial for it also. A lot of people were getting connecting flights to go to some places in Canada and uh, the Far East, and they, had a, they like me, canceled the, the flight because they, it just wasn't going to work, and they were just going to get off the next day. Um, so I apologize, and uh, I'll be here to help you out in, in my backroom scene, and uh, I'm sure I'll be talking throughout the conference. Uh, by the way, this year um, it was. Uh, we have the greatest array of speakers. I'm sure um, they'll go over that in Paul and Gretchen. Um, but we have the most credits, and we have the the best A-list speakers in every single lecture. It's very diverse, whether it be treatment. Uh, we try to make it more about the systemic aspects of eye care, uh, but other things have entered into the fray, and there's some really good practice management stuff. Uh, something that people might want to focus on, a, a new buzzword in, in medical care and eye care and dentistry is um, private equity. And we actually have two courses on that, and I knew nothing about it beforehand. I ordered the courses already, and they're, they're excellent pieces of information. And I'm sure um, Adam and Paul will comment on them also. So uh, I hope everybody enjoys the conference. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm scrolling through the list right now, and the lineup this year was, was definitely the most diverse that we've ever had. Um, in terms of the, the course offerings and, and the people who are here. Um, and, and I think we made a conscious effort as well. People will notice that there are fewer two hour long courses. Um, and that was because just based on the feedback that we got, people wanted the one hour long courses. Right. They didn't necessarily want to sit through, through two hours. Um, so very few of the courses this year are actually two hours long, two credit courses. So you can you know, sort of see I'm, I'm scrolling through some of them, but um, most of them are, are just one credit hour. Most of the, 
uh, the ones of the two hour <coughs> courses are uh, most of them are given by two people, so there'll be some interaction there, so it'll make it a little bit more uh, informative to watch and more fun. Um, but yes, even the speakers that wanted to do two hours or we allowed to do two hours did two one hour courses. It's much easier. Uh, you can digest the information easier. And, and just to make a point that I think you might have made, but if you're taking the course for live credits, like, for example, New York offers live interactive credits, you can take the test any time you want thereafter. You can take it after the live conference is over. You can take it June 30th. Uh, our uh, platform uh, closes down July 1st. So you don't have to be in a rush to take the test, but please take notes so you remember the stuff. And, that, and that's another thing that this uh, platform does offer. Um, when people are sitting and listening to see live, often they're on their phones or reading the paper or just not listening. And here you have um, some accountability. You have to take a test, you have to listen, and the computer has to be on for that amount of time. So um, in all manner of shape and form, I think this is the best uh, way of getting some continued education. Yeah, one, very, for one very common question is, what if I flunk the test the first time? You have to get a 70%. So Correct. You, you can take you can the test can take as many it. times as you, as you want, but unlike other places where they certify you, they don't tell you which questions, we don't tell you which questions you got wrong. So, so you, you, you really have to have take, to know what you're doing. And, and you have to go back. So you have to take it right. on demand again and just take the course again. And so uh, you'll, you'll, you you'll really to, learn your stuff. You don't have to you don't take, really the have take the course again. You don't have to take the course again. You don't have to. Test again. Right. No, just take but the you test can. again. But you suspect what questions you got wrong and what you can do is go back and go right. through that part of the course and listen to that particular slide or two slides. And, and most often the, the uh, speakers are very good at putting all the content that's in the test in the course. Right. Um, so I don't think we'll have a problem with that. But um, listen, take notes during the courses, and I think you'll have no trouble. The quizzes are not made to be difficult. They're made to no. be fair. Uh, I wouldn't say easy, but they're easy enough to pass with, uh, with just some uh, listening to the uh, the lectures themselves. Right, and, and, I, and I will reiterate to people, you know, the way the technology works, so COPE has requirements for us because we're doing this online. When you watch the lecture, the computer marks the fact that you've been watching it. So our servers mark that. So it knows, okay, person X showed up right now watching this course live and they were there for 46 minutes. So it marks it. So then when you take the test, it looks to see, okay, did this person actually sit through the course? And if you didn't sit through the course, the system's not going to issue you a certificate. So it's critical. So it is critical that you actually sit through the course. Um, obviously, I, I can't, you know, force you, you to you stare at the screen, can, right? I, I can't put like toothpicks <laughs> in your eyes to keep them open, but uh, but the system will keep track of it, and it won't issue you that certificate if you just say went to the test and just started taking it without even looking at the course. And I got to say, for, with these speakers, you'll stay awake. Because if you don't stay awake, they won't be back next year. That's true. For sure. Well, yeah, I mean, that is true. So we, we take the feedback of the people who take the courses as well and into account when we, you know, rejigger the schedule. So the other thing... To, go ahead, Steve. I agree with you, Adam. You have to um, actually listen to the course. In other words, uh, if you try to take the test without the course, first of all, even by playing the course and just saying, well, I'll go back and take it, unless you are... Uh, very versed in that particular area, you're not, you're not going to pass the test. So right. You really do have to take the course. Interestingly enough, there was another vague platform that I went on that was offering uh, CE for uh, a certain amount of money or, or for free. And um, I looked at the course. I said, oh, I know this stuff. I took the test, never listened to the webinar or the course, passed the test, and I got a CE certificate printed. So uh, they're not doing it the way COPE well, demands to do it. So uh, uh, it's a very small company, and I think that uh, they'll, they'll close them down. But we require, we're, we're doing it straight and narrow the way COPE wants it. In fact, they view all our outlines, and we can't even, um, let's say, promote companies or be um, very biased towards things. The lectures have to be c completely sanitary as far as that's concerned. Correct, yes. Yeah. So they actually look at the content to make sure that it's not biased towards any one manufacturer. So it's, you know, what's, what I find really fascinating, too, and I don't, know if just, I don't know if COPE likes us talking about their behind the scenes and how it all works, but what I find really interesting, too, is when we get a lecture, we submit it to COPE twice. So it goes in for interactive credit and for enduring credit, and sometimes right. they'll even take the two different, the same lecture that we're submitting twice, and they'll send it to two different reviewers which I find really interesting. Um, so you'll have two different people reviewing the same course, um, and uh, I, I always find that interesting. So there's real quality control here. Um, there are people looking at these courses before they go online, before they get COPE sort of stamp and seal of approval. Right. 
And that was correct. In fact, we have this massive spreadsheet, you could imagine, all you listeners, of all the speakers, all the things they have to get in. And sometimes uh, one uh, type of Coke credit was uh, entered and the other one wasn't because one speaker passed it, one speaker didn't. There might have been a problem with a slide or two, and, and the speaker got things in right. So it, it is a, a massive undertaking that we make, and, and Coke, um, I guess, loves it because that's how they make money. But they, <laughs> they do a really good job. Uh, I have to say they really are trying to – uh, do the education the way it should be. And the fact that they have these two types of online credits is a, is a good testimonial to them. Yeah, but in, in, in defense of COPE, they make very little money yeah. per course. So they, they are really wonderful people, and we want to make sure that they stay around for a while. That yeah, no one else takes them over. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's the really interesting thing. You know, when, we, when you submit a course, you pay a certain fee to COPE, and it's small. You know, each individual course is relatively small. Um, but Every single time you do that, they have to take that course, they have to look at it, they have to parse it out to a reviewer, right? So every course that you do, that has to go through this entire process. Um, and so, you know, they're not going to be buying a private island <laughs> with a secret <laughs> fleet of, of Coke jets with this. And on our <laughs> end, we yeah. um, make it easy because if you enter your OE tracker number, um, we'll automatically send that course that you passed onto COPE and you'll have it in your transcript if you want to print it at any time. A lot of lectures I attend, um, they don't do that for you and you have to submit it yourself or you don't submit it. So everybody who's taking tests, just be aware there's a little box to put your OE tracker number in right. and we'll automatically send it out to them and, uh, and also you can print out a transcript yourself from the website as you're taking all the courses. Right, and in fact... Proof. Yeah, in fact, Steve, I'm at the website right now. I just put it up on the screen for people to look at. You don't see it there right now because it's not there yet. Um, but at the top of the page, there's going to be a link right at the top, like where it says login right there. There's going to be a link for your certificates as well. Um, so when you want to go and retrieve your certificates later, you can do that and look at it. But whether you retrieve them or not, we submit all of the stuff to Arbo constantly, right? It goes out in batches. I think it's like every five days or so. We take all the courses that people have passed and transmit it into the, the OE tracker. Um, so Correct. you don't, you don't, you shouldn't in theory have to do anything, but you can come back here and look at your credits. Sure. And, and um, kudos to Arbo because they got their act together and we want them to stay around for a while. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and to access the credit, just to make it more clear to the attendees, they, they're uh, uh, four or five um, tabs at the top of the, uh, of the C wire list and it's the help center they go to. Once they go to the help center, they'll be uh, prompted to print out their transcript of what they've taken already. You can do it individually or you can do it um, in total when you finish with the whole conference. Right. Yep. So, but for the most part, people in general don't need to actually even look at their certificates. It just happens automatically and then you can look in your tracker and they'll be there. And if there's a discrepancy, if you see that like you're missing a course that you think should be in your tracker but isn't, you can always just contact us and we can try to dig it up for you. Um, I'd say the, the biggest tech support problem that we've seen is that occasionally someone will not sit through a class long enough and they'll take the test and they'll pass it, but the computer says, well, you were only sat here for 30 minutes, um, so we're not going to issue that certificate automatically. So that's probably one of the, the biggest tech support things we've seen in post. Um, but again, if you see that something's missing, don't panic, just contact us and we can help you with it. <laughs> So. But we, we've gotten better and better, and uh, <laughs> uh, software uh, platform people have gotten better and better. It used to be a delay. <clears throat> now, from last year's conference, and I assume this year, literally the second you pass a course, and then you look at your transcript, it's there. So uh, it's almost an instantaneous uh, um, uh, migration over. So uh, you can look as you go if you want to, just to make sure. And again, uh, like Adam said, if you didn't take the course for the length of, the length of time that the computer will, uh, will uh, time you, you're not going to get credit for it. Right. Well, that's an interesting question then. Do you have to take the course over? And do you have to take um, the exam over? That's an interesting question. You don't have to take the exam over if you pass. I would assume that you have to, I, I, I don't know that technicality, I assume that you would have to listen to the required 45 minutes to 50 minutes of the course. Right. And then retake the test, probably, uh, but you already passed the test, so that should be a, a formality. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think you actually physically have to go in and hit the buttons again to retake the test because the data is saved. It's there already. So, um, But again, before anyone resorts to doing that, if you don't see a credit there for whatever reason, just contact us first so you don't have to you know, necessarily right. sit through something that you don't want to. So, um, yep. you know, we're, we're here to help. So uh, troubleshooting is a lot of what, what we do, um, especially you know, in the immediate uh, post-conference period. Um, 
you know, we've, what's funny too is over the past five years, people have definitely become much more savvy about how everything works. The amount of tech support we've had to do has dropped dramatically uh, in terms of just, you know, how do I log in? How does this all work? Um, so I think people are getting, you know, accustomed to it. And, and just, yep. uh, and just like watching a, a prize winning film for a second time, you may have enjoyed a course and you may want to see it a second time mm -hmm. and you'll have until July yep. to see that same course again. Correct, yes. Yeah. So all the courses will remain up on the site through July. Um, and then after that, you know, the, the, the big issue, people asked us, why do the courses have to come down at all? Um, so the speakers themselves don't necessarily want all of their lectures up perpetually year-round, and they've told us this. Uh, the fact that we were able to extend it out to July this year uh, is, amazing. You know, is, is good. I mean, I think speakers are getting more comfortable about having their material online. That's probably part of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, but you know, uh, my, by my way of thinking, you know, you have how many months? Five months? <laughs> it's a, it's a yep. fair amount of time um, to actually get everything in. So I don't think it's going to be a big problem, at least not this year. Interestingly enough, I'm giving the same lecture live at the end of March in a, uh, a small regional conference with uh, just uh, eight, eight credits on a Sunday. Hmm. Um, and um, I uh, said to Arbo, well, uh, is that good enough? And they said, no, you have to submit now for a live event. Mm -hmm. So my course will have three numbers on it. It'll essentially, it'll be the same course that, I, that I'm delivering um, on, on C-Wire. Uh, uh, Paul and Adam didn't mention, but the testimony that I love is the fact that um, a great majority of the people attending this conference attended our previous conferences, so that's a, a, a nice uh, little pat on our back that we're doing a good job. They they always they love it. I, we get tremendous feedback. Uh, I think 99.99 percent positive. Um, and thank you all for coming back for our conference. Yeah, I mean, we we obviously couldn't do it without without the folks who, who keep coming back year after year. So thank you for that. And the uh, interesting thing too is that um, as the courses have evolved, I think we've gotten a lot better too about picking the content just based on what people are, have been telling us. Um, so I think we we've got it down to a, pretty much to a science at this point, which is great. And if you have any good ideas, just go on OD Wire during the year. Oh yeah, go on and complain. Know. Complain. <laughs> we like people who complain. Come onto the site and start you know lambasting us. We're happy to hear it. Um, because the worst thing for us is if we don't get any feedback at all, because then we have no idea what's what's going on. Right. Um, the one thing that I, I would like to see from from more folks is if you could just um, go into the exhibit hall. I think that's that's the one thing that I think I'd like to see more people do. Um, you know, there are huge discounts. I ran through them all before, but definitely stop in because the vendors are there. They're waiting. They'd like to, to talk to you if you're interested in any piece of equipment. The discounts are big again because they don't have to carry the equipment. Um, so just you know, head on into the exhibit hall and just check it out. And they're open from what, ten in the morning till Eastern yeah. time. And yeah, un until the end, seven. until the bitter end. And um, you know, even if even if it's after hours, you can still go into the exhibit hall. It's not like a real show where you know you get arrested. Here, you can go in, and you can just if you see something you're interested in, just t there's a, a, a form where you can actually shoot off an email to whoever the the person is on the other end. So even if they're not there live, you can actually just go in and, and contact right. them that way. So. And just for I, I, I just uh, entered the sessions, and everyone is playing. There's four sessions playing now, uh, all great lectures, and they're all playing seamlessly. So uh, everything's working like it should. Excellent. Yeah, and actually, since I'm going to see if I can get in myself, this is probably going to cause the entire rig here to blow up. But yeah, yeah just shut off the volume because you'll have two volumes. Yeah, yeah, yep. So everything's off here. Um, but I just want to show everyone if they've never actually been into a CE wire, because right, so some of the people watching the live stream have never attended one of our events. So, um, so this is what the lobby looks like. I'm actually uh, logged in right now to the conference. I, I'm logged in as a student, although it shouldn't make a difference one way or the other. Um, you know, sort of showing you what it looks like when you're logged in. So you'll notice here that we have different doors that you walk through, or I guess they have whiteboards now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a, if you can believe it or not, this is kind of a COPE requirement. Um, the idea that you separate out the sessions from the exhibit hall, um, they need to be completely separate. This is, of right. course, why when you're at Expo, they are very clearly marked and it's all separate as well. So it's the same thing here. Um, it's all separate. Uh, you know, you'll see Steve mentioned there's the help desk right here. If, if anything goes wrong for you in the conference today, go in there. Uh, there's folks who can you can text chat with who can actually help you as things are going on. Um, the live stream, obviously, if you ever want to come back and watch us, we're going to be here for the whole time that the show is running. Um, you can just click on the live stream to get to it. 
um, sessions are here. And here's the exhibit hall. And I'm going to try to click on this and hope that I don't make the entire world explode here uh, from our live stream, just to show people what it looks like. Um, so you can see there's the list of booths here. Um, and if you want to go in and you know talk to the folks or obtain a discount, it's it's real easy to do. Um, you know, take go into Zeiss. Why not? Um, and so you can see once I'm inside the chat room, you can see uh, that there's a booth chat. So you can see that uh, there's the two uh, reps from Zeiss are here right now, uh, who you can talk to if you want to. And then there's all the information about their different products. Um, so you can see that they talk about Cirrus and Claris, um, and they have uh, videos. I'm not going to actually run the videos right now because that's the last thing our live stream needs to so blow sure. it up here from our bandwidth constrained environment. Um, uh, but you can see that they have all their information and then uh, PDFs and stuff and then product promotions. And so this is where they're going to talk about the special savings and then you can chat with the reps here as well to try so to So if you want to chat them. with a rep, what would you do? So on the right side of the screen, you can see um, that here they are and then you enter your message right there. I don't want to do it because I don't want to bother these guys, but you enter your message right there and then click send. And then that's how you do it. So pretty straightforward. Um, and if, if the booth is busy, they'll get back to you, I assume. Correct. And so if people aren't around to chat, instead of having a chat here, there'll be an email form where you just type in what you're interested in, and then they'll get an email as well. Um, but the important thing is that you do it the next two days Correct. To get those discounts. Yep. So yeah, these discounts are, are for a lot of these companies are going away uh, after the show is yeah. over. And to add to it, uh, having a lease company here that's uh, uh, minimizing their fees it will be much more helpful for you getting the equipment uh, on both ends. Uh, uh, it's a great idea to have uh, a lease company and equipment companies in the same um, platform. They don't talk, they don't know each other, but they uh, certainly have dealt with them, um, whether it be Zeiss, uh, Marco, Oculus, VSI, uh, etc. So um, I encourage you, if you're going to do uh, buy a piece of equipment, try to get the best deal, and Lens Leasing is here to help you. Who's there at Lens? So let me see if, if he's uh, around right now. So I'm, I'm in the Lance Leasing booth right now. Um, and so right as of right now, so nobody's there live right now in the Lance booth. Um, whoops. But then what you can do is just send him an email. Um, you click Ask a Question, and then that'll be an email form that it'll go to. Right. So that's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. Promotions. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, they have promotions going on here. So, yeah. oh, so that's interesting too. I didn't realize that, that they have turnkey programs if you're um, renovating your practice too for stuff other than uh, actual equipment, HVAC systems, security systems. Huh. Cool stuff. All right, so that is the exhibit hall. So again, I urge everyone to try to just roam around and uh, take advantage of, of what you can. And let me... And, and between our major manufacturers, I think you can find any piece of equipment you want, whether it be an OCT, an angiographer, and mm -hmm. um, like Adam mentioned, um, I actually took the NeuroLens test myself with him. I believe it was at the Academy meeting, Adam, by the way. Yeah, you had forgotten. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was pretty impressive. Um, and I, I encourage everybody to listen to the lectures, and I'm sure they'll be here to be interviewed to find out the this new technology that uh, might uh, actually change optometry a great deal. Yeah, let me actually pop their booth open again so people can see it. So, because I know the Neuralens is one of the companies that I'm I'm certain. Oh wait, there's a video running. Let me shut that down so I don't destroy uh, our live stream. But um, the I think that of all the companies that are exhibiting here today, people will know the least about Neuralens since they're brand new. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to those two lectures and then to, and then to talk to folks about it as right. well. Yeah, that booth was pretty impressive. When you when you go in, you're gonna have a video play. Yeah. Yep, and they have a whole bunch of documents too about the technology and and uh, and its usefulness. So pretty cool. Dr. Geffen should be very interesting. I know you're interviewing him um, at another time. Yeah, he's gonna. I think we have him on the schedule for for Sunday. Um, and I apologize, I didn't actually post the schedule up for the folks that we're going to be interviewing. I probably should do that. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll have our special mystery guest popping by here too later in the day. <laughs> our myst our mystery uh, OD wire clinician will be coming. Um, direct from the trenches. Direct from the trenches. <laughs>
All right, cool. Well, great. Well, Steve, thanks for this. So uh, yeah. ho hopefully you'll keep track of everything that's going on today and, uh, and you know, it'll go smoothly. Mm -hmm. You know, four rooms one going at once. Thing. So we'll see. Yeah. One last thing. Uh, there's an interesting question uh, from uh, Gary F. West who posted on, um, on your feed. Um, he's a new ophthalmic technician in Watertown, New York, and he works part-time. He loves, he's retired, and uh, he loves the, his forms, and he, he wants to have a form like this for uh, technicians. And uh, we've considered uh, doing other platforms, whether it be for opticians, optometric technicians, um, and that might be something we do in the future. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so Steve, yeah, so what's interesting is that the CE requirements are different for um, opticians, right? And uh, We've, we've gone back and forth because sometimes the requirements are actually um, more stringent in some cases where you need more questions on tests and things like that. So even though there's overlap in the courses, it's a little bit challenging to create uh, separate tests and put it through a separate certification process. But it's, if it's something people are interested in, you know, we, we could definitely consider it because it's, you know, yep. it's, not, that, it's, not, it's not a huge leap. It's not like we're getting into dermatology. It's, you know, <laughs> it's adjacent. So yes, I agree. Yep. Well, what are the requirements you might know better than I for CME credits for if an, an ophthalmology wants to do this? Uh, is it less stringent or about the same? Uh, for CME is, is way less stringent in so many ways. You, it, it's, it's, it's so, I mean, you'd, you'd be scared actually to go into your physician's office if you knew how easy um, CE was for, <laughs> for physicians because, so there's, it can be all done online, which is fine, as you know, we, we like online stuff here, but uh, in medical stuff, you can actually get the tests before you take the, the class. So it's open book to the extreme, um, such that, you know, you could easily, you know, if, if you read quickly, you could easily get through a class, a 10 hour long class in three hours, right? Because um, there's no requirement that you sit there and watch anything. Um, you have the questions for the exams beforehand, so you can motor through. So in a lot of ways, it's a lot less strict. Yeah, but on the other hand, this is for state board licensing. Once you wanted to get it for your, your specialty, you're speaking about a totally different exam. Correct. So yeah, this is just for licensing for your state board. Um, you know, the, those, are, those are category one CME. Um, they're not stringent at all. The, your, your specialty board is a very different thing and each specialty board is very different. Uh, although we did see internal medicine had a little um, insurrection a few years ago right, where they were so incensed over what their state board was doing with MOC that they had a riot. And I don't even know what happened with that, if the internists, the still if they threw out uh, the people in charge of their specialty board or not, I don't know what happened. Um, but yes, the specialty boards are definitely much harder than uh, regular CE. And what about if a new <coughs> surgical procedure comes online, like for example, MIG surgery, collagen cross-linking, et cetera, um, they might have to take some CME, but they don't have to physically um, certify that they are competent in doing it, correct? They correct. Have to yeah, say they are. most people will actually go and do real hands-on surgical, you know, training for the new procedures. They won't just, I mean, I hope. Okay. You gotta <laughs> hope. I hope they won't go <laughs> off that I, I, Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm assuming, I'm hoping so, but yeah. Um, yeah, so, but it, it's it's really interesting because the, they're, you're given much, much wider berth to do what you want. Um, yep. versus optometry where everything is legislated down to the letter. Um, and and it's, plus it's national rather than state run as far as the um, C, uh, CME requirements. Yeah, I mean, what, what would have to happen here is that the, the 50 state boards in optometry would have to say, you know what, COPE is good enough, period, the end. We're all going to have a standard process, and that's it. And that's kind of what medicine does, where getting licensed in each individual state is not a big deal. Um, you don't have to jump through many hoops to do it. You just have to pay you know, some absurd fees to get licensed, but they honor your license from other states. And you don't see that a lot in optometry. It's, uh, it's actually kind of shocking um, just seeing the, the, the different states and how they operate. Like Florida, for instance, just now opened up, what two, was it, like two, two, two credits? Two measly hours. <laughs> <laughs> two <laughs> online CE credit hours in Florida. Um, Plus, if you want to move from New Jersey to Florida, which I might anticipate in several years in the future, um, it's literally impossible to get a license. You have to, I believe, take the national board starting with right. year one. And um, I forgot my Purkinje images and uh, other things that Paul long since forgot about also, but uh, <laughs> they make it very difficult. Other well, states make it very easy just by endorsement. So it yeah. should be more of a, of a 
of a similar playing field in, in optometry. I, I, I don't know why we got so diverse, but we did. Well, I think, I think the problem is, you know, with just the scope of practice is so different in each state that it's difficult for some states to say, yeah, we're going to take you in because we don't know, you know, what, what it is that you actually know. No, it's big. And also the states don't want practitioners that are walking into the exam in a walker or with, with a cane. <laughs> they, they don't want older <laughs> practitioners to come into the state who are just about ready to retire. So this is an issue as well for some the good, the good retirement states. Mm. Well, not only that, but the good states. Uh, people were migrating. There was a recent article I read: um, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and California. They're migrating to Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Delaware, um, uh, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, because of the uh, changes in the tax law, and uh, just a little bit better place to practice. Right. So, so this, it is definitely a, an older population. I agree in the in the southeast, Paul. But other people just want to migrate to get a better standard of living, and and that is difficult. So you, you're talking about the young OD that sometimes wants to do that. Yep. Yeah. So I guess it's a it's a it's a thorny problem. And in fact, I, I wish Mike Olson would come on and talk to us a little bit more. Well, he got he got hit too. He moved from <laughs> Kansas to Minneapolis. No, 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 not Kansas. He was in I, he Iowa. Was in Iowa. And They're not the same, you know. <laughs> really? <laughs> you don't put your shoes about Iowa now. Yeah. But he, he got hit for a $3,000 fee yeah. because he didn't activate his license for 20-some-odd years. Right. So each state board is, has their own little idiosyncrasy. Yep. But I think we've made some small penetration in the five years we've been doing these conferences, and, and some states have loosened up a little bit and some a great deal. So uh, we're making inroads slowly but surely. Yep. Yeah. So I, I you know, this is this is how the future is going to go. I hope. Um, you know, it's it just it's. I I remember we had an ironic experience of actually re recording one of the lectures that we did for RCE when we yeah. were at Expo. <laughs> <laughs> no. Literally, you know, we had to duck into a side room and record when we were there. And I was just thinking, like, my gosh, like, you know, it's literally the same content with the same people that would go to a regular in-person show. Yet here we are having to jump through these insane hoops to get recognized as having the same education. So I, and with the, with the fact that we have people from New Zealand, from Australia, from Latvia, I believe we have a whole group from Latvia yep. who are able to take our credits, and and it's perfectly okay with their countries. So uh, we're not talking about a third world country when you're talking about any of those three. Yep. So it's uh, you know we we can just keep pushing and uh, hope that a lot of the states here come to their senses. I don't know. Steve, did any of the courses have questions? Have you noticed? Um, well, I, I, I've been talking to you, but I was I, when I was in Rapuano's course. Chris Rapuano is the head cornea guy at Will's Eye. Um, and you're not going to get a better lesson. There's, there's quite a bit of interaction. Um, yes. Uh, let me go through the other courses and see, because you can actually very easily see the, the question and answers. Uh, usually people get shy, and then the um, doors open up. Let me just shut up the volume. Yeah, Crystal Brimmer is getting a lot of, um, a lot of, of questions. She's doing, a, uh, of course, her uh, May Lou is dry eye, and it's a, it's a big um, thing nowadays. Let me go to... Uh, uh, we have a new speaker, Brian Hall, who I've listened to personally. He is out of New Jersey. And again, as I scroll down, there's about 15, 20 questions already. And that, this is what's great about it. Uh, when you go to a live event, and this is something that people don't realize, when you go to a live event, people don't want to raise their hand. Uh, some are shy, but also some just don't want to interrupt the lecture. I mean, it, it just it, it, it loses this train of thought, and it's just not the right thing to do. And you have these gunners in the audience. They, they might raise their hand, and it, it makes a problem. Here... People are asking questions via text as the lecture is going on. They're not interrupting anything, and the lecturer gets back to them at some opportune time um, or, or right away. So it's actually a better way of listening to a lecture and interacting. Plus, if you are shy, you can do it as a private question or you can do it anonymously so that you don't look like a fool if you're asking a, a silly question that you think is a silly question but often is not a silly question. Um, so it's a really good platform to get the information. Typically, the speakers also will give you their email address at the end. I'm looking for free hits from them. And so if somebody has a question afterwards, they can always email them and get a more, um, let's say, complete answer to their question. Right. So it's a really good platform. Cool. So the courses are robust. They're, they're robust. They're busy. Let me go to the fourth course. I'm just going to get in there. It's, it's so easy to navigate. It's, it's crazy. 
I think I'll get credit for all four of these quotes. So this is Mark Sturm, and uh, there's a, you know, quite a quite a few people are asking about things, and most of them about price um, and and how to uh, uh, let's say not join, not opt out, as we have discussed that many states are allowing people to opt out. There's a, a nice little conversation going. So, um, and uh, I believe that after the courses are over, all the text messages are still saved, so when somebody is watching the course, they can see the uh, text messages that were asked during the live event, which is a, a nice little addition. Cool. And this is early for the West Coast, so... Oh, is it ever. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm counting the amount of people in each room. Um, let me just go to private, that way I'll oh, get it. Uh, Steve, oh, you know what? We actually have to go. I didn't realize. We, uh, <laughs> we have an interview coming up. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, Steve, have fun today at the conference, um, and yep. uh, well, I'm sure we'll check in with you later. Call me whenever you have to. I'll be here. All right, cool. I have a, a bull and chain. All, All right. right. <laughs> Catch you later. All right, yes. Thank you, Gretchen, for reminding us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we have an interview coming up, don't we? So yes. Let me... Pull this up. We have Dan Haney from, from Lombard. Uh, he's the sales director of Advanced Technology. Um, so, And one reminder that these interviews do not have to be COPE approved. <laughs> so you may be seeing some serious marketing. They are the opposite of COPE approved. <laughs> and let's see. And, and hopefully these numbers are correct. <laughs> I wrote them down, <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> yeah, this is always the, the big challenge is uh, does Paul write down the numbers correctly? And uh, Yeah, so we're going to be seeing someone that, that's an employee. Yes, so Dan uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is the sales director of Advanced Technology, so let me get him going here. And let's see if we can get him on the phone. Lombard Instruments, Dan. Hey, Dan. It's Adam and Paul Farkas from uh, CEO. Hi, Dan. How Paul Farkas here. Dan, you've been in the field hey, how are for, you guys? for how long? Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> you've been here for, for how many years as a... With uh, the so, technology, yeah. I've been working on. Yeah, I've working on in the uh, I can for about eight and a half years. So, uh, right, I'm kind of been all over the place. But yeah, so I'm currently out here in California now. <laughs> oh, you had to wake up like us. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I apologize <laughs> yeah. for this. It is so. It is so early. It's so painful to be doing this now. But uh, yeah, especially on a weekend. But I, I'm th thank you for taking the time to come out, though. Um, you know, we Lombard's a, a big sponsor of this conference this year with with all you and all of your divisions, right? So now, of course, we have we have EMS here. Um, now, of course, you guys have teamed up a little bit with Marco, as we've as we've discovered. So it's uh, it's become like the the Lombard yeah. conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sort of. Dan, yeah, we, uh, we literally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So why don't we kick this off? And uh, let me ask you one question. A lot of people are very confused about ordering through a distributor. Or buying direct, can you tell well, what's the difference if, from your vantage point? Yeah, well, uh, there's a couple different models. One, some manufacturers uh, prefer the distributor model. Um, reasons being, as you know, with uh, nationwide distributors like uh, Lombard, we have we have bodies and offices in place all across the country. Um, another unique thing, though, is that. I believe we can be more of a we can be more of a consultant. You know, we at like at Lombard, we carry so many different brands and products that we're not going to be pushing one particular item just because that's the only thing that we have. You know, if you're looking for a new camera or a new OCT or anything for that matter, we can actually bring in multiple brands. And uh, you know, I think we take a lot of the pressure off that with the, the buying uh, with buying uh, equipment because you know instead of just telling you why this one is the perfect unit and it's the only op um, option that we offer. Here we can actually bring multiple brands, put them up side by side, and actually kind of see what really uh, works best for the practice. Right. 
And you know, when I when I take a look at your site, you really do seem to have the entire breadth <laughs> of instrumentation in the industry. So I guess the question is, um, and in fact, even looking in your specials, you know, you have all these packages that you put together. So the question, I guess, would be for the clinician who's like a little bit overwhelmed by all of this: How do you go about choosing? Yeah. You know what what they what they should be should be buying. Well, then that's kind of where you, like we have different reps that do different things in our uh, company. Um, I'm one of the advanced tech reps. So for example, what I do uh, a lot of times is I bring in products side by side. We'll do demos and we'll, you know, work in the clinic with patients and uh, really kind of see what fits for the practice. Because, you know, as we all know, there's not a perfect piece of equipment that does absolutely everything. You know, there's one brand might do this, but it, it lacks this feature. One brand might have that, but it lacks that feature. So you know, a lot of the times we can bring them all into the clinic and see what works best. Um, and so us having, you know, people all across the country that can, you know, go in and do demos and stuff like that, I think it really helps. And that's why we have, I think, so many uh, return customers because we're not, I think we take a lot of the pressure off. Like I said, uh, you know, I hate to repeat myself, but, you know, to always uh, push one product because that's the only thing we have to offer, I think it takes a lot of that pressure off when I just, I can start the, um, the conversation with you know hey doctor what are you trying to accomplish and then we can kind of go with that and then we can kind of check off the box on what you know features make the most amount of sense for that practice right and you know you made a good point you actually physically go into to offices right to show people sort of how this stuff works yeah yeah that's one of the really benefits of a lombard incident is just we have you know we have offices all across the country so yes we can do that um I basically live in an airplane. I'm kind of flying all over the place and, <laughs> and doing demos with some of the reps. But, but it's fun. We like it. Um, and because of that, we have tons of referrals. That you know, it's pretty hard to find a doctor that hasn't done business with Lombard in the past. Sure. Yeah. Because if I look at the, um, you know, at your discounts, like taking a look, I put them up on the screen here so people can see the different like lane packages that you have at CUR today. Um, they're pretty diverse in terms of the brands that you have and the different kinds of instruments. So if I'm a clinician and I purchase one of these packages, do you have reps who come in on site and sort of help the doc through actually getting everything going and learning how, how things work? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, and that's where, you know, we can have, you know, some of our lane packages will carry multiple brands. So we don't just stick with just one. You know, we, we try to put the best uh, product in each package. I um, mean, especially for, you know, and depending on like a lane package, sometimes we have some that are more um, value sensitive versus some clinics want just top of the line, you know, deluxe e equipment. So um, because of that, we can mix and match and um, all of our guys, our service reps across the country are trained to, uh, you know, install and train these doctors on how to use all of this equipment as well. So so basically, how, how long do you uh, hold the hand of a of an OD? that has some, something brand new, and you came in there and you trained them and trained the staff, but then they have staff turnover, and you have to mm -hmm. retrain. How long would, would uh, Lombard come in to, to help out this OD? Uh, that's, um, honestly, that just depends on you know, the clinic and where they're at, but typically um, we don't charge for that sort of stuff, ongoing training and support. And that, I think, is another really good... Uh, reason to go to a distributor versus a manufacturer because a lot of times the manufacturers will charge for training and installation where we we typically do not and then on retraining and, and things like that um, we do that all the time and depending on the clinic uh, you know some of these trainings can last uh, you know as short as you know 20 minutes to you know a day and a half depending on the implementation on what we're, we're trying to do as well as uh, with all the new technology a lot of this stuff um, you know, for older doctors, they didn't learn it in school, you know, with OCTs and things like that. So, you know, sometimes we have to uh, spend a lot of time, you know, doing a little more uh, training with the doctors just to get them comfortable with the products. Because the last thing we want to do is sell something and people don't know how to use it or what they're looking at. Right. And, so and we try to really uh, help that out. Yeah, because, I mean, I, you know, I'm looking, I have it up on the screen right now that you guys, you know, you, you sell the, the Rikert ORA and the, the Topcon Triton. I mean, these are very high-tech pieces of equipment that would scare a lot yeah, of people, from, I'm sure. From, <laughs> from an older practitioner's point yeah. of view, I can, under, <laughs> I can understand. I, I got a gift from, from my daughter uh, with, for, for a watch that you wear to, to monitor how many steps you take 
how many flights of steps you go up. Yep. I don't have a clue how to, to do anything <laughs> with it, right. you know. And I wish I had somebody from Lombard come in and, and show me how to do it. <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's probably the one avenue we don't carry yeah. in but I'll have to let the powers be that now yeah, it, uh, the market for if you, have, if you ever want to put one of your reps through something incredibly grueling as like a training exercise, just have them come out here and deal with him for a while. Oh, yeah. So they would be like trial by fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. God. Um, so great. So, yeah, so I have all the packages up, up here on the screen as well. And so I'm encouraging folks to come on into your booth here at CE Wire um, because it looks like the discounts you have here are pretty deep. Dan, are you, yeah. are you uh, manning the booths or are you one of the reps that, that will be in the booth? Yeah, so I'll be uh, in the booth uh, most of today. And then my colleague, uh, Nate, he's going to be um, handling it tomorrow, as well as we have a couple of other employees that will be popping in and out as well, just to make sure we can answer um, any questions, you know, on a promptly uh, basis. Okay, cool. And, you know, the, the booths, I, I always like to tell this to the, uh, the companies who work with us, the booths are going to be sitting there until July 1st. Um, so don't be surprised if, you know, you get out of the blue some emails going forward. As people come back and take the classes over the next five months, um, you know, the exhibit hall okay. is still there. It's, it's kind of, it's sort of like, I, I almost imagine like Vision Expo with like an abandoned exhibit hall, right? People come in in ones, ones and twos over the course of five months here. But, um, but people know the discounts are just two days. Right. So, yeah. So your discounts, I believe, are limited for these two days, right? Um, I'm trying to remember. I Yes, we also have some that are quarterly as well. Okay. So, um, you know, just if you look on our promotion page too, it'll it'll give you the uh, the details on expiration dates and things like that. Um, as well as we've got some stuff that isn't featured on our promotion page. Just you know, let us know what you're looking for because uh, you know, with uh, you mentioned earlier, but with us partnering with EMS and, and Marco as well, we've got a huge selection of inventory with new and used equipment. So you know, just feel free to ask what you're you're looking for, and we'll be able to to help you and make sure we get you the best deal we can on whatever product it is you're looking for. Right. You know, I, now that I have you here, I can put you on the spot too, which is great because uh, <laughs> I know a lot of folks on ODYR and on CYR are really interested about, you know, this, this partnership now that you have with Marco, this, this coming together. Um, I don't know how much you can share. You know, we've all sort of just read it in the trade press about what's been going on. But what do, what do you think this is going to mean going forward for folks who, who work with Marco or Lombard? Uh, I think it's going to be great. Um, again, we have Marco has built a huge and a great reputation, a massive company across the, uh, the country, as well as teaming up with Lombard. I mean, we are the, the largest distributor in the industry as well. And I just think we both do what we do best. And I think teaming up together is actually going to help us out quite a bit with just what I do, giving more of a consultative, uh, consultative uh, approach with uh, my doctors. I think it just gives us some more, more products to, uh, better suit the practice's needs. And so there's a lot of stuff that uh, we're still ironing out. Um, so even a lot of that stuff I'm learning as, as we go. Sure. But um, all in all, everything's been really exciting. And in fact, we've had a lot of doctors that have reached out and I think we're we glad that them. we're teaming up. So. Yep, <laughs> yeah. All right, well, cool. Well, thanks so much for being here. And uh, you know, I'm gonna keep urging people to come on into your booth and, uh, and hopefully you guys have a great show. Uh, awesome, well, thanks guys. Thanks. You too. All right. Um, my sound went off. Uh oh. Paul's hearing is gone. So well, let I can, me. Uh, I can hear you, but you, you can hear sure, me. But uh, you sure the world can hear us? Everyone can hear us. Okay. <laughs> then we're all right. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So that was cool. So we, I learned a lot, and uh, hopefully, folks can come on into Lombard's booth. Um, you know, because the, the savings there are definitely real. So if we pop on in. So you just go right in there, and there they are. And they have lists of all their promotions and their new equipment and their used equipment. So there you go. Much, much prettier than the way I wrote it out. So you can, you can get a sense of the different packages that they have. Um, yeah, so my, my hope is that, uh, you know, folks do take advantage of this if they're thinking about it. Um, you know, there are, the trade show season is, is coming up again. You know, I guess Seco is starting soon right. and the next bone and stuff like that. But, you know, if you know what you want and you don't actually need to physically go 
manhandle the machines at a show, this is a great way to actually go ahead and get it. Would you call discount. Steve just for a moment and make sure that we're on? Because I'm afraid we've lost the outside world. They say we're on. Okay, then let's double check with Steve. <laughs> He's around. <laughs> Well, the outside world is still here. We're still here. Um, so, yeah. Here, I will show you. We're still here. And... See, we're still here. That's me and my spreadsheet. I lost the last speaker, the last few words. Hmm. So maybe yours is working. It's all that counts. Okay. See? And Leo is here watching and he tells us we're on, so we're on. Okay. Does Leo want to talk to us? Uh, we have 15 minutes. We do. So if Leo, if, Leo, if your voice works... <laughs> Uh, so, and we'll see if he's got any time to talk to us here for a few minutes. And I'm assuming uh, that's fine. And hang on here, just helping fall out. Uh, and then we will get Leo on the line. Good? Well, let's see if when the call comes in. Okay. How do I sound to you? Well, I hear you. I hear it. You don't hear me through your headphones? I don't think so. <laughs> uh oh. How about now? How about now? No. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh. <coughs> Let me clear my voice for a second. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so let me uh, call, oh, actually, let me get Leo's number, so. And I will give Leo a call. Okay. All righty. Hang on here, Leo. I will be with you in one second. Hello, this is Leo. Hey, Leo, it's Adam and Paul. Hey, hi, Leo. I heard hey. you had laryngitis. <laughs> I, I've been fighting it for a couple of weeks, actually, and um, about a month ago, I had the flu, and that's when it started. And 
you know, basically I talk on the phone every day, all day. Mm. And by the end of the day, I start cutting out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just... So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And yesterday I was cutting out. I wanted to talk to you guys last night. Uh, you sound perfect but, um, now. I, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us, so, so what is going on? I guess, you know, so for everyone who doesn't know Leo, I think everybody knows you by now, right? I would imagine. I mean, I, I, I would hope so. We, we've been here from the beginning. Yeah, you've been here from the beginning. So, um, so, so Leo uh, runs uh, Vision Equipment Inc. Um, right. So, so yep. what? So what is going on with you? I guess is the big question these well, days. Um, well, uh, first I want to uh, first of all congratulate you guys because uh, this uh, CE wire is getting bigger and bigger every year, and uh, it's great. You know, when I remember when you first started it, and you know it was real small and. But I really love the idea, and uh, now look at you. I pretty know. Pretty it's... soon we're going to have a packed exhibit hall. It is. It <laughs> is. We're going to have to move into a new virtual hall. That, that's the great thing about being virtual, right? You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's infinitely it's expandable. So, but no, yeah, it's, we we've been surprised too by how the conference has, has gone over the last several years. But I guess it's it's the way of the world, right? No one wants to travel. Yeah, so. I, I like I like it a lot. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so this uh, this year, this past year, actually, we um, moved into a bigger building, and um, you know we still refurbish all brands of lane equipment, diagnostic equipment. Um, but what we're really growing the most um, is our edgers, you mm. know, and and we're doing things that we've never really did before, um, as far as like repairing people's edgers and uh, refurbishing other people's edgers um, before we used to only, you know, build our own and, and sell them. Um, so we can offer a lot of different services for a lot less money than people normally pay for repairs. And um, if you look in our booth, uh, there's a, actually a section this year for uh, repair. Oh, really? And, uh, you can see some, yeah, you can see some pictures of what we do to the edgers. Huh. Um, we, we tear them down to nothing and just rebuild them with perfect parts. Right. Now, now you guys are in Florida, right? So let's say that I'm here yeah. in Oregon. So what if I wanted to get my edger sort of remade? How do I do that? Well, it, I mean, a lot of times when people want that, their edger's not even functioning. <laughs> right. So we, um, we will we'll actually pick it up. Um, I, I have a freight company come in there, and we, we pick it up, bring <laughs> it in. And we'll just strip it down to nothing and rebuild it. Um, but there's also situations where maybe one of the functions of your edgers isn't working. You know, we, we can also refurbish and sell individual components that are inside the edgers. Hmm. And that's pretty easy. And then we'll also, you know, a lot of doctors are very, very handy because they're working on equipment all the time. Right. <laughs> and, um, we can walk you through over the phone uh, replacing uh, one of the assemblies inside the edger. And it's all really just um, Allen screws. You know, it's, if you can turn a wrench, we can, uh, we can walk you through anything. Huh. I like to say I can, I can build an edger with your hands. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, I've noticed, whoops, I've noticed, sorry about that. I've noticed too that uh, looking, you know, at, I'm on your webpage right now, actually. I'm scrolling through it. Everyone can see it. Um, you know, you have a lot of older equipment here as well. Do you ever have situations where the doctors might want to like upgrade to like a brand new edger or, or maybe one slightly, slightly, you know, used and refurbished and they just trade you their yeah, old one and they just say, here, take my old one and, and give me a credit and yeah, I want something so we, new. We do a lot of trade-ins. Mm -hmm. um, that's most of our business is trading people up into something else. Um, but we do, you know, you, you paid a lot of money and, and you bought a brand new edger from a manufacturer 10 years ago. You're not really ready to give it up. We can keep it running for another 10 years. Right. You know, for, for a fraction of the cost. And that's what we like to do. We like to help people, and, and that's how our reputation is spreading. And Well, many uh, ODs are I, still using edgers for the first time, and they see what a, what a cost-effective system it is how much less expensive yeah, it is to turn it out. Definitely. Do, do you have and, situations and where they fall in love with their edger <laughs> and they want to keep a second edger in a practice mm -hmm. to keep it, to, to keep the edgers running all of the time? Yeah, a lot of people do have a backup edger. Um, and I can say from, you know, 30 years ago when 
when I was edging, um, if, if your edger goes down, you're in trouble. Yeah. And, you, you know, you have a stack of jobs sitting there that need to be cut, and people need their eyeglasses, and you feel so overwhelmed, and now all of a sudden you're wrapping everything up and sending it off to another lab. I lived that life before. So I understand. <laughs> when, and, and same with my, my people over there. If, if somebody calls their edgers down, it's like an emergency for us. You know, so it, it is a lot of people do have a second edger just for that situation. But we our goal is to keep you running and um, we can keep you running over the phone. A lot of a lot of times it's something very simple, like a loose wire mm. will will cause chaos. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you call us up and say, hey, I got edger or, you know, this edger and this error, we can tell you what the error is and probably guide you in how to fix it for free right over the phone. And you don't even have to be our customer for that. Well, Leo, you know, we, we have a lot of new optometrists and students possibly tuning in. Well, what, what's the ballpark for a refurbished well, edger a cost? Great question. And um, this is hard to believe, but it's very true. I, and I just did it this week for a doctor who's never edged before. They want to get into it. I can install a complete finish lab with everything you need for under fifteen thousand dollars. Really? Wow. Yeah. And you make and, that up in a couple of months. Yeah. yeah. I mean there's there's edgers, there's new edgers out there that cost thirty, forty grand. Right. <laughs> and you know, you don't need all that. Um, it's nice to have all that. I do love all the new technology and hopefully that'll be in our future. Um, but I can set you up for a where you can do any pair of eyeglasses by any manufacturer for under fifteen thousand wow. dollars, and, and not only that, there's a return on investment includes, there. Mm. Yeah, and that also includes installation and training. So right. we're going to come in, we're going to show you everything, and um, and then you have lifetime phone support, and it's not so much for repairing things when you have problems. It, it can we can support just basic questions like how do I lay out this kind of lens or that kind of lens? We're opticians as well. So we can help you with all that. Um, and my, my last question that I remember that had nothing to do with service was uh, a, a optician came across the round seg they were laying out and that's not a very popular lens anymore. Um, so, you know, we walk them through how to do it over the phone. Well, you know, well, you've been with, with, with CE wire for, for the past five years You've been with OD yep. Wire for I don't know how long, and we have <laughs> never ever had a complaint about your company. That's true. You know, with three part by uh, that is a remarkable statement to make, but it's absolutely true. It's only been well, we, great applause. Yeah, we we appreciate it, and we love the community, and and um, you know, it's it's all I've ever done since I was 18 years old, and. I'm getting up there now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Leo, I've had I have your your booth up on the screen right now. Anything you want to tell us about any sort of uh, specials you have going on? You know, Will you you'll be manning well, the booth, um, Leo? I, I have quoted a lot of edgers in the last few months, and so people pretty much know our prices. We are doing twenty percent off um, all our edgers in the next three days. That includes Monday as well. Um, and uh, that's a huge discount. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to put the number out there. Sure. <laughs> but um, I, I already have a lot of quotes out there, and I'm knocking 20% off of everything for the next three days. Awesome. Oh, you can imagine. That's our biggest, oh. that's our biggest promotion. And the other thing is um, we're doing 10% off everything else in stock, which is OCTs, cameras, perimeters, lane equipment, uh, whatever it is we have in stock. Wow. Yeah. So I have and it up. That'll also be for the next three days. Yeah, I have it up on the screen right now. So that's incredible. So yeah. So three. So you. So it's three days. So it's to the uh, end of the month. So everyone really needs to get on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, the thing is too with you. You know, you have inventory that comes and goes. So people they can't just kind of sit there, right? It's it's not right. like you know this is like a new car dealership where you, you get it made up. Like right. you know, if, if you have something, you have something. So people, I think, really do need to make decisions pretty quickly. Yeah, and we, um, in, in fact, you know, after I, I built the booth and put the specials up there, in the last couple of days, we uh, 
acquired a, a Topcon Maestro pre-owned, mm. which is very rare. I don't think anybody has a pre-owned one. And um, also some Topcon NW400 cameras. Oh, very so, cool. Uh, those Great. are very modern technology and uh, actually brand new technology. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've only seen maybe three Maestros pre-owned in the last two years. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I've ever so, seen um, one. I don't think I've ever seen one for sale in the secondary market. So wow, this is uh, something different. Great. Yeah. Cool. So okay. uh, it's a great way to save thousands of dollars. Okay. I hope your voice holds out for the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be manning yeah, the booth? I'm, I'm usually good. Yeah, I'm, I'm manning the booth, and um, we're doing everything through email pretty much because I am going between offices right now. Um, so, but I mean, we'll we'll respond to your email within minutes. And, Excellent. Um, okay. Well, wow. uh, I, I wish you guys a very successful CEY 2019. Thank you. So we should have a we should have some kind of big party for 2020. You know, I was thinking about that. Like for 2020, yeah. it's like 2020. <laughs> like, am I going to have to redo this logo so it's like ornate because it's 2020? Am yeah. I going to put a slash yeah. through it? Like, you know, what's it going to be? <laughs> okay. So, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Leo, and uh, we, we got to get going because it's 9 o'clock, but uh, right. we'll talk later. Okay, thanks, All for, right, great. thanks, thanks for the time, Leo. Bye. Bye. And I'm going to put this up on the screen one more time so everyone can see exactly what it is we got going on here. So, you know, because Leo has a ton of stuff for sale. Absolutely. And but those edgers, that, that's amazing. Yeah. They can, a, a, a recent grad can open up. For, for very little money. Yep. So that that is a, a great advantage. Let me just run over here for a second. Yeah, but it's true what I said about Leo. We have never ever had a complaint when he was with his former company or since he's opened up his new company. Never, never a bad word about uh, responding to a call or service yep. with his company. That's for sure. All right. Sorry, let me just get myself situated here. I wonder if anyone is actually watching us. What do you think? Oh, yeah, they are. Are they? How do you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, they definitely are. Um, so if anyone has questions for us, is there a place that they, they can write into us? Well, sure. The, 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 uh, on the live stream itself, there's the question area right down here. Okay, so if anyone wants to say hello. Yeah, I mean, right now people are really engaged in their classes too. As Steve was saying, hundreds of people are taking the classes. It's amazing right now, the so. numbers. Yeah. So, you know, again, a lot of people do want to take this live because they're not necessarily going to get credit for on demand at certain states like New York. So they really want to come in and, and do this stuff. But live, some so. just you know, tune in here in the middle of a class. They're just starting. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's on the West Coast, it's early. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, take a look here and see what's so what's coming up for us next. It's going to be we have an interview coming up. Ah yes, Tim with Marco. So I've, I've been waiting to speak to him for a while. So let me pull him up. Good old Dr. Tim. Okay. And Marco. And let me get Tim's stuff because it's nine o'clock on the nose and I will give him a call. Tim, Tim, Tim. Okay. Never want to call the wrong number, <laughs> especially when it's early in the morning, right on a weekend, because like oh. that's. The... Hey, Tim, <laughs> Hi, it's, Tim. It's Adam and Paul. How you doing? Good. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can sure. hear you perfectly. How How do we sound? Okay. Sound do, great. Do we sound good? I'm using these. New... Yeah, I have these new ear pods that, with an iPhone and. Uh, 
I never know if I talk loud enough or too loud or whatever. Oh, you're good. No, yeah, in, you know, because you yeah. can't hear yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird experience. But no, you sound, you sound great. You know, the thing that I hate about that, though, is like, this is, you know, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but what grinds my gears is that they got rid of the headphone jack on the phones. It drives me crazy. Having to, to like, charge something else drives me nuts. Okay, well. Right. <laughs> It's got this little this little case you plug into the same thing your phone plugs into. Right. Yeah. And I always forget to do it. <laughs> so when I want to use them, then they're not plug they're not charged. Right. And, you know, so hopefully, these are they say they're charged. So we should be good. Oh, well, good. So you, know, you actually, Tim, you bring back memories. You know, I I was a spokesperson for Marco. I don't know when the nineteen, I was still far about <laughs> in the late eighties. <laughs> with a, a, a course called Re-Engineering Your Practice. And I guess it never ends so that people have to keep re-engineering. That is true. You, you That's can't. true. So maybe today we can talk about a little bit about what Marco is doing to re-engineer new practices. That uh, somebody well, wants it, to, after 30 yeah. years in practice, wants to, to have a new slate. <laughs> but what would you suggest for them? Well, it's, you know, we actually have a, a gentleman that's done lectures all over the country, is, and he's got a, a, a OD Wire radio show and a webinar both on, uh, on your site. His name is Kevin Henney from uh, Winter Haven, Florida. And he had that same experience of, you know, being in, you know, we're all, you know, you're a little older than me, but not... That's Everybody that's is younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> if they're, they're older than me, they're not around. So, <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, we're all getting to that age. You know, we went into practice in the late 80s and, and early, mid 80s. Getting to that stage where you're starting to wonder, you know, is it, is it time to hang up the, the uh, peropter or, or is it, you know, are, are we going to do this differently or how, you know, what's, What's the next phase? So he, he ran into that problem a few years ago. And, uh, and you know, his, his daughter was in optometry school at the time and uh, not sure whether she was going to join the practice or not and all that kind of stuff. So he kind of took a, a hard look at what, what's the future going to be uh, for his practice. And we worked with him to really re-engineer it. Um, he's, he delegates refraction, uses an Epic workstation, uh, first tried a lot of other things to become more efficient, and it turns out that was the kind of the magic, uh, the magic bullet for him. Um, trained some, trained his uh, his staff to do the refractions, re-engineered his workflow, and now he's uh, almost tripled his office. He bought the ophthalmology office next door, and uh, combined the two buildings into one massive clinic. Uh, it's, it's gorgeous, beautiful. Um, and it's it's the thing that we we really like to do. You know, you really work on the front end of practices and try to make kids coming out of school or residencies uh, figure out how to how to hit the ground running. And then you, you take a look at, at practices at that five year to seven year range where you kind of uh, you've used the, the the techniques to get into practice relatively inexpensively, and now. You want to grow into something more that you want to, you know, really grow the practice and grow your, your uh, capabilities. And then it's time to re-engineer everything. And we, we do a, a great deal of that consulting work as part of our sales process. Well, right. Well, you know, it was, it's interesting. Marco, of all the companies, um, sort of had a, a much more forward-thinking streak in them, right? So you were synonymous with the auto refractor back in the days when people were scared of them. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, that was like the cutting edge of technology and people were, were literally afraid to implement these things in, in their practices. So I can sort of see how you have this, you know, 30 year history or more of trying to push people forward um, and just get them to, to think a little bit beyond what they're doing. Because now, obviously, right, the auto refractor is like, you know, standard well, you know, piece of equipment, one, right? But back in the one day, One side really effect that younger practitioners won't know about is any optometrist beyond a certain age could expect lower back pains. <laughs> you could, it, would, it went right. with the territory uh, because you were seeing uh, X number of patients per day and leaning over. Now, younger people don't have to lean over patients anymore when they're doing that better one or two business. <laughs> so but, but that, lower back correct. pain is gone for optometry. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's one yeah of the, that's right. 
yeah. side, side effect of modern technology. But it's interesting because, Tim, I'm sure that you still get pushback. You know, as Marco comes out with devices that are more and more advanced, how do you actually get inside the clinicians' heads to let them know this is sort of where the puck is going? And, and how do you get them there? Well, you know, there's sometimes they under, understand their own pain. Uh, it could be lower back, could be shoulder, or it could be, <laughs> you know, economic and, and uh, pain from competition. Sometimes they don't understand it. You know, it's a big, the biggest problem is people don't know what they don't know. Right. So if I didn't, when, I mean, I only transformed my practice, you know, seven years ago with this technology and, and my shoulders have taken the brunt of that. You know, my, my, both my shoulders are not in great shape because of all the years of reaching up, uh, you know, to a manual foropter and, and doing things at the slit lamp as well. And, you know, you don't understand it if you haven't seen it. If nobody's seen somebody else's practice function the way that mine does and, and Dr. Henny's does and people have made these transitions to, uh, to workflow management do, they, you know, they just don't know that they're missing out on that stuff. And it's hard to tell them, you know, because everybody, you know, nobody wants to be sold. You know, we, salesman's math and, and promises over years and years and, you know, that didn't pan out and things like that have made us all jaded and, and uh, you know, kind of skeptical. So it's hard to sit down with, with somebody and say, look, you know, you can do X, X amount more things for your patients, with your patients, for your practice, if you invest in technology such as X, Y, Z. Right. You know, they don't want to, they think you're trying to reach in their pocket all the time. So it's, it's great if you can show them and, and, you know, we do like your father did, you know, we have, we have consultants and, and, you know, key opinion leaders that tell their story in, in various either CE, you know, forums or, you know, meetings. And, you know, it's it, the most effective way to learn something is peer to peer and colleague to colleague. So when you hear enough people, Dr. Uh, Mike Talone out of, out of uh, Pennsylvania, tells a similar story to Dr. Henny. And these guys are, are guys that, you know, lived it and want to tell and help their colleagues. That's why I joined Marco. You know, when I transformed my practice, it, my practice is, is kind of unique. I'm probably 60% low vision and, and the rest is almost all the rest is, is niche practice of weird contact lens patients and <clears throat> referral sources from ophthalmologists that can't figure out what's going on, why people can't see. So it's, you know, mine was not a uh, practice where I'd see, you know, 60 people in a day. I, I was seeing, you know, I still do, uh, you know, practice two days a week. And I see, you know, 24, 20, 24 patients. And they're all complex. And, and so I never saw the value of having all this, you know, technology that related to the refractive process because you know only five of those maybe or six of them were refractive patients but transforming my diagnostic processes with integrated wavefront amperometry really changed everything and so after a couple of years of that marco was looking for somebody to help them kind of uh represent that you know the p potential to the to the professions and that's, that's why I joined it, because I wanted to be able to tell that story and find others who, with similar stories to help our colleagues, you know, meet the challenges coming forward. Right. You know, we have to be more efficient. We're, the, the world is expecting a lot from us, and, and it should. You know, I'm not saying that it shouldn't, but, you know, we have to do a lot more for patients in a lot less time and probably for less money coming in the future. So. We have to find, Let's, you know, ways to accomplish that without cutting corners and putting outcomes at risk. Well, you know, one of the things that I liked about Dr. Henney's narrative, um, and, you know, everyone at Marco, they tell the same story, it wasn't just about the piece of equipment. And if you go back and listen to Dr. Henney's thing, it's all about actually transforming the way he practiced. So it wasn't just, I bought this expensive piece of equipment, I plopped it down, you know, in the middle that's of my That's the office. same Dr. Henny that's on our radio show. Yes. And podcast. Yes. Which you can tune in on ODR. Yes, that's right. The, the, it's still up there. You can still watch the it. The webinar hour. is still there. But that, that to me was the most interesting aspect. It, was, it wasn't it was about the actual piece of equipment. It was the, the piece of equipment was sort of the center of the change, but he changed his processes around it. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong, right? They're assuming that this one piece of equipment 
is going to change everything, and it really doesn't unless you, you know, change what you're doing around it as well. And what you have to do, especially if you're an older practitioner, is go over the, over the mindset of listening to speakers and say, well, that may work for you, but my practice is different. <laughs> you keep hearing that over and over again. Yeah. Either, well, you're in a big city practice and I'm in a small town, or whatever it is, they always think that they're different. But there are very, very successful practices no matter where you go. And it seems to be there's always one leader in the community that has the outstanding practice. And you go in there and buy George, they have the best equipment and the best staff of, of all the other practices in the area. So there is no differences wherever you practice. Yeah, good is good, I guess, right? No matter where you're practicing, right? And uh, yeah, so it's, it's... Tim, speaking of practice, where do you practice? I'm, my practice is in St. Petersburg, Florida. So you're in a, uh, where, you where know, it's an older community. The world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. When I, when, I pra when I got to Florida in 1989, um, St. Petersburg is in Pinellas County, which was the oldest county in Florida. And Hillsborough County, which is Tampa, right across the Tampa Bay, is, was the youngest uh, county in Florida, you know, demographically. And, and that's changed dramatically. Say, Pinellas County is now the second youngest county in Florida. So really? it's, uh, it's changed. If anybody hasn't been to St. Petersburg in, say, 10 years, you would not recognize the place. It, hmm. It's really transformed very vibrant community now. You know, we have restaurants, you know, to, to rival any city you can name in the world except maybe Tokyo. Um, it's it, we've got four James Beard Award winner chefs that have restaurants there. We've got uh, museums. We've got sports teams. We've got everything. I mean, it's a it's a phenomenal community. You need Marco a you you need a new baseball stadium. You need a new baseball stadium, though. I gotta that's, say, that, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's a that's a story all by itself. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a it's a great place. Um, yeah, to live, to practice, everything. I, I've moved to, so I practice there still two days a week, and then I've moved to Jacksonville because of, you know, I'm with Marco, and that's a full-time gig. Right. So, uh, you know, it's funny. And you, we typically um, kind of slow down as we get older and cut down our days and stuff. Well, you know, five years ago, I went from working four days a week to working six. <laughs> so I'm going in the wrong direction. Yikes. So, Does David take you on his airplane? Does he still have that uh, <laughs> the passenger plane? I remember I, yeah, I, I, I flew on that in the 80s. <laughs> what, what does he use now? Well, it's not the same plane anymore. <laughs> I hope yeah. not. <laughs> uh, we have a, a Citation Jet 2. Oh, nice. Ah. Corporate jet. And uh, I occasionally will uh, if my if my need to travel and his need to travel line up then i get to hitch a ride you know stand on the tarmac with my thumb out like a hitchhiker <laughs> and they'll pick me up <laughs> and somehow i'm sure you make it your business to have your business schedules aligned right mm -hmm. it's so, as not i an recall accident. there used to be a world war ii <laughs> airplane that they kept at the corporate office is that still hanging up there <laughs> so, there's no world there's, war ii well, fighter plane they have, yeah, the, they, he has a P-53, a P-52, I'm not sure. The, it would be the, a P-51. See, I remember World War II. P-51, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, exactly. So, oh boy. This, this is a really interesting story. So that's at the, we have a hangar at the, at the airport for the corporate planes. There's a bunch of them. And it's funny, I was, one of the trips I came back from as they were wheeling the plane in to the hangar and doing all that stuff, I was walking around looking at stuff, and there's a, there's a Rolls-Royce engine that is the, the engine that goes into P-51, which, is, which was made in Detroit you know, during World War II. It's a Packard motor car company. They, you know, they brought the Rolls-Royce engine uh, production equipment over and set up the Packard motor company factory to make and for those engines, that don't remember uh, Packard were, that was the Cadillac's com competition it's when, <laughs> okay. until they went out of business <laughs> and and the, the so the the circular part of the story is my mother worked on those engines she was Whoa. a Rosie the Riveter person 
Ah. working in that Packard motor car company making those very engines. So the Mitchell engine I was standing there looking at was was likely one that she worked on, you know, huh. in 1941, uh, 2 or 3. Wow. Or 4, something like that. So, That's crazy. Uh, it was it was kind of a unique moment to to sit there and look at that engine, you know, she's been gone, you know, a few years now, but uh it was it was kind of an interesting moment to uh to run into just uh, just walking around this hangar that's amazing you know I, there was just so many stories i'm on I be, did i tell you i became on the board of the uh, of the optometric historical society oh congratulations well, the, well you know <laughs> you, you, you survive until a certain age you get on the board <laughs> <laughs> but there is just so many historical optometric stories that could be told and and we hate to lose them you know and, and that would be one of them you yeah, did, that is a good and story. And you just told it. Yeah. Well, now it's now it's here permanently, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you have it. You have it archived for yeah. us. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, that is that is a great story, though. So, yeah, so I have a question then about Marco in general for you. So there's this, this tie-up now, right, with private equity and Lombard. So can you share anything with us about right. what's going on? I know this just happened, so everyone's probably still sorting everything out. Um, but what does this, this mean for you, for the company, for, for everyone who's who maybe a Marco customer? Well, you know, sub, sub, uh, two years ago or 18 months ago, uh, a PE firm by the name of Atlantic Street Capital purchased Lombard and uh, as kind of the, the initial foray into uh, medicine, uh, equipment sales, all these, all these things that we could describe. And uh, they've added a couple of more uh, companies to, to Lombard as a portfolio. So the Lombard now has EMS, which is a used uh, equipment dealer in uh, in Tarpon Springs, Florida, and uh, they have uh, Innova, which is a, was the exclusive NIDEC dealer in uh, in Canada and Mexico, and a very large uh, distributor of other equipment in Canada. Right. And um, and then that became that was. Uh, kind of a portfolio company called Lombard. They use this Lombard name. And now just last, a couple of weeks ago, they've uh, announced that they're going to merge that portfolio company, Lombard, with Marco and create uh, a holding company for the for the entire suite of companies called Advancing Eye Care. Right. So uh, they just announced that, you know, to us and then to the world a couple of days later, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So there's, you know, there's no, you know, I don't even know if it's officially closed as a deal yet. Cause you know, that sometimes takes a little longer. Um, but it's a, you know, they're looking at synergies that, that make sense for, um, you know, for both companies, you know, Lombard's a distributor. It's, it's very, uh, it's very broad based. It's got, uh, companies and, and warehouses and, you know, service options across the country. Marco is a leader in, in high tech and, uh, and, you know, forward thinking technology we already were discussing. And to put the two together made a lot of sense from that perspective, as well as having somewhere to, uh, to provide a stream of trade in, which, you know, uh, Lombard did but not in a large way and before EMS right. and Marco really never did that much of. So it gives it, you know, there's some important synergies that we hope will, uh, will make will really make it so that we can take care of whatever the needs of the practices are across the country, uh, whether it's in the used world or new world is transforming practices as we discussed. So all of that stuff, um, uh, Hopefully, we'll will go smoothly and seamlessly become a uh, a more effective company. Sounds good. Yeah, no, yeah, it sounds it sounds like there definitely could be some stuff there, and I never really considered it about the pipeline of equipment as well, because um, you know EMS is is of course a sponsor here at at o, at a C Wire as well, so EMS Lombard and Marco. So it was kind of funny actually. Well, everyone everyone got rolled up over the years, <laughs> right? Because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We've known all you guys separately, and then it's like a tidal wave. You all come together, so that's kind of funny um, if you look at the exhibit hall. So pretty cool, though. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what happens. 
right. going ahead. And, and Marco, in general, yeah, anything it, anything else going on that we should know about? I'm kind of curious. Well, not not that. Uh, not for publication. Not for publication. <laughs> as far as, as well, as far as I know, <laughs> that's a pretty big thing. Right. <laughs> you know, that's that's going to occupy everybody's uh, attention for a little while now. Sure. Sure. And you, is the branding going to change at all, or is it going to? Do you think it's going to be the same, or have you haven't even thought about that? Um, well, I haven't thought about it. I don't know if they've thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> they, well, they did say when they when they announced it to uh, the employees, they did say that the the brands are going to stay operating as as uh, separate entities. So right. I think all both EMS and Marco and Lombard are all going to and and Innova in in uh, in Canada and Mexico. I think are still going to be operating under those badges, the brand. Right, because they're quality brands. Yeah. So you don't want to eliminate Correct. them. Yeah. yeah. All right. Right. Well, exactly. You know. Lombard, I don't know how old Lombard is, but Marco's 50 year old brand and it's, you know, it's spread, it spread its message that we were talking about earlier, you know, pretty effectively over that 50 years. So to throw that away wouldn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Tim, thanks so much for this, this update. I think you've caught us up to speed pretty well on what's, what's going right. on. So, um, you know, if people want to stop into the Marco booth here at the show, you know, you can feel free to stop in there and ask questions too, to see what's, what's going on in the world of Marco. And, and Tim, I guess I'll be seeing you in a, a couple weeks at Seco. Yes, that's correct. Awesome. I'll I be there for all of Seco and then Vision Expo just a couple of weeks later. Excellent. So yeah, so if anyone wants to catch up with Tim, I'm sure that you know, you're, you're always around. We just have to remember to go to the correct city this year for Seco. I don't want to end up in the wrong place. <laughs> you know, Force of habit. I've made that mistake many times. I've, <laughs> I've said to, I've, in, in, in emails and in, in conversations, I've said to people, well, I'll see you in, in Atlanta. In Atlanta. Like, yep. in Atlanta. <laughs> well, you've got to hope I, that the airlines are working. I don't even in, want to think in, about that. In let's three just, weeks. Let's, I'm not thinking about that. That's not, well, he, what does he care? He can always get on the, the, the corporate jet. The That's rest, true. The rest of us, we're but, screwed. But there we're won't gonna... be anybody there. <laughs> yeah, that may be one I get the hitchhike out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tim. Well, thanks so much for being here. Thanks. Take care. Okay, bye, bye. now. Bye. Oh my gosh. Well, that was interesting. Right? Yeah, so it's, it's good to sort of hear about what's going on in, in the world of... Uh, Sure. Of industry, you know, because I, I don't think most people pay attention to it usually, right? Until until it's too late. Until it's too late. <laughs> um, but no, it's good. It's good to hear what Marco's up to, and you know, yeah. Okay, so we have. Well, you're going to have a, a double because you're going to switch with me. Oh, uh, you're leaving, eh? I'm going to be leaving for a while. Because who's coming up? Oh, speaking of consolidation. <laughs> Yeah, Ben Chudner coming on. Ah, good. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to speak to Ben for a while, so this will be a, a good thing having him here. Yeah, he's, he, for those of you that are, are unfamiliar, he is the expert now on private equity for optometrists yep. that want to move their practice in, into a private equity situation. Yep. So it, it'll the be good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. You're going to learn about so it'll, during this interview. Plus, Ben has a... He just gave a talk. I he just gave a talk. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna talk to him all about that and, and see how it went. So, so if anyone has any questions, can people c c come to our little conversation and ask, yeah, so, ask questions as well? Yeah, if they want to. So in in the little chat box, so I have it up on the screen right now, and I'll leave it here. So there you go. Uh, so this chat box, you can come here and just type in, and we can answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I guess, so Paul, you're you're vacating the premises for a while. Yes, yeah, so I'm so gonna let clear me, out. I'm, I'm gonna okay. So we'll get you out of here. Let me. Uh, Okay, so I've cut, I've cut Paul's mic. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you later. Um, carry all of it. Carry all of it. Carry, carry yourself out of here. <laughs> it all goes with you. It all goes with this too. Yeah, you can leave that on your head if you want, if you want to listen to what's going on out here. So. Oh, yeah. Okay, it will be interesting. <laughs> I can cough a little bit here. <laughs> Got it. Oh, here you go. All right. So in the meantime, while Paul vacates, let me uh, flip this over. And I'll let everyone know about the exhibit hall here, since he is on his way out. And 
So why don't I just talk a little bit for a second, since we have about five minutes before Ben uh, makes his way over here, uh, just to talk a little bit about what's going on at the conference today. So, um, so we, uh, so let me pull it up uh, and get Gretchen in here. And so we have the exhibit hall uh, list right up here for you too. I'm gonna just run through this really briefly because we only have a couple minutes, but just to hit the highlights. So we just got off with Marco and we're gonna talk about them later. So just really briefly about the discounts. If you head into the exhibit hall, um, $3,000 off any device and that offer expires. Uh, for Oculus, the offer expires at the end of the conference. So hurry on into their booth. Um, so VisionWeb, again, makers of the, the Uprise EHR, and I won't go into any technical jargon with you, but just know that it's web-based, HTML5-based, so none of that flash that's going away. Um, so it's the most highly advanced EHR that you can get, so stop into their booth. Zeiss is offering up to 30% off devices as well, so they're a big sponsor of the conference. Head on into their booth. Um, EMS, we were just talking about EMS, their division of Lombard, and now, of course, tied up with Marco as well, and they're having deep discounts here on pre-owned equipment. So you can take a look at the prices fully listed in their booth, uh, including the packages that they have uh, for sale. Um, NeuroLens, we're going to speak with them, too, about their, this new uh, technology, this microprism technology that they have as well. Lombard, we've spoken to. Again, you can look. They have packages available in their booth. You can save a lot of money on those devices. Um, and <laughs> lots of stuff. ABB, of course, is the largest contact lens distributor. They also do gas perms. Of course, I suspect that a lot of people hearing this message will not care as much about gas perms because they're probably all in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, since uh, GSLS is actually going on right now. Uh, simultaneously. This was the only weekend that we could pick this year, though, um, due to time constraints. Next year, we will do our best to avoid that conference and pick a different weekend, even if it means interfering with football playoffs. So It might be heresy, depending yes. upon the, the team that, you support. That, that could be. So let me, uh, Gretchen, let me get your mic back on here. Boop. There we go. And you all good? I'm good. You're good? Got power? I'm powered. <laughs> I was afraid I'd drop my battery pack in the oh. bathroom. That wouldn't have been good. Oh, that wouldn't have been good. So hang on. So let me clear this out here because uh, we have got Ben coming up here very soon. Um, so. <laughs> good morning. Gretchen is here. That's right. This is the first time on camera this morning for Gretchen. Let me get Tim's picture out of here. So just to be clear, it is 930 Pacific time. Yes. I have been awake since 430 Pacific time. And Sorry. We've been rocking. No, no, it's not your fault. <laughs> we've been rocking and rolling since 730. Yes. So it's, it's been a day already. It, 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 it feels like it's time for lunch. Yes, it really does. And a nap. A nap would be great. That's um, not good, though. We've only been at this for two hours. And I just sat down, so I guess I can't complain. Uh, but I still will. But you still will. So let me get Ben going here, if I can find. By the way, Ben mentioned that his talk is after our conversation. Oh, it's after. OK. So sorry for that. Uh, sorry. That's, so we're going to have to get him out of here, then. We'll get him in and out quickly so he can. Uh, sorry, Ben. <laughs> We'll get worried. you on the phone, and then we'll get the hook. Yeah. All right, let me take a slug here, and let me call Ben because it is time, right? I don't like being late. That's always, like, the worst. So so far, so good, though, at the conference. Um, from what we understand, it has been extremely well attended. Um, that's great, especially as you mentioned that there is another conference going on at the same weekend. So that's, that's hard for people. Um, but I guess that says a lot about the course offerings. So that's thanks to Steve and to you and to Paul. And I think that's fabulous that people are very interested in getting up at the crack of dawn or at the crack of, <laughs> now, crack of noon on the East Coast. Well, that's the thing. Like, if you're on the East Coast, this is an easy meeting to go to, right? And we, we have to sort of pander to the East Coast because that's where most of the people live. So Maybe you should come to Philly next time instead of Gretchen coming to Portland. Then we'd be on East Coast. Oh, time. I could sleep late. You could. It would be so nice. You could. I think we need to have a chat. Yes. All right. Well, let me get Ben going here. Okay. Let's see if we can find him. Ben. Okay, Ben, where are you? Hello. Hey, Ben. It's Adam and Gretchen. How you doing? Good morning. I'm great. How are you guys? We are good. Hanging in there. So, uh, so you, you ready for your uh, your big CUR lecture? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And you guys look great. I'm actually watching you on the screen right now. Oh, cool. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ben, you are the chief medical officer at Acuity Eye Care Group, which is, I guess, one of the, the largest private equity groups going right now in eye care. Um, yep. And so I know that this is a word that confuses and confounds a lot of people, or a phrase, right? Private equity makes people nervous. They start sweating. Um, so I guess your talk is going to be an interesting one, right? Really explaining what, what it's about, um, you know, who's a good fit for it, uh, and, and who might not be. So I was just wondering if you could just really briefly, you know, sort of at a very high level, explain what this is all about um, and whether people should be concerned or happy about it. And why sure. is there such an interest in optometry for private equity? Because mm. it seemed like this was lying low for a while and then it, it really has risen up in the past eight to 10 years. And now we hear a lot about it. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really big. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of confusion around what this is. I mean, at, you, at the heart of this, it's just consolidation, right? So you have these large investment companies now that are getting involved, and they are picking up practices and consolidating them. And the, and the, the idea behind it is, you know, optometry is very fragmented. Um, and you have these practices that have to do all these different things, but and and a lot of them, while they do them okay, they don't do them as well as they could. And so mm -hmm. these companies come in with the idea that they can do it better. So, for example, you can be a vision source doctor and start to net down your overhead by lowering your cost of goods, but are you really taking advantage of EHR the way you should, or a point of sale system, or frameboard management, or even a lab network and, and a distribution center? So you know these are things that you know in general private practice optometrists don't do very well, uh, and so there's a lot of opportunity uh, for these investment companies to come in, improve the situation, and honestly get out and sell and, and make their money. Um, you know, so I think that you know from an optometry perspective, the optometrist perspective, you know this is an opportunity to, to really sell your practice for a lot of money. So, you know, we get asked, I think in the U.S., is this good or bad for optometry? I think that's really a, a, a tough question to, to answer. But what I can tell you is you kind of look historically, uh, you know, and when I graduated from optometry, optometry school in the 90s, the idea was you get into private practice, you own it for 20 or 30 years, and you sell, and that's your retirement. And I right. think that was right. what a lot of us grew up with, right? And if you look back in the last 10 years or so, that was dramatically changing. Doctors, and you've seen it on OD wire where you see practices that just are closing, right? And they're not, being, not able to sell. And these, and these younger doctors that are coming out of school these days are not necessarily interested in ownership. So that idea of being able to sell your practice and have it be a retirement, you know, is, is becoming less and less of a possibility until these private equity groups come in. And now it becomes a possibility, and not only that, they're paying these premium prices where you may only get a year's growth or a year's net, whatever the number may be. Now you're getting, you know, anywhere from five to ten times your your annual revenue. So it now becomes an opportunity for people uh, to get out and retire uh, and and make some good money. But that being said, it's definitely not for everyone. And what we'll talk about in, in the talk, you know, is, is going to be who the players are. That's for one. People need to understand that because there are some players out there uh, that people need to know what's going on about. Uh, and then it's going to be, you know, is it right for you? And, and you know, I don't want to ruin it because the talk's coming up at, in one, at 115 Eastern. But the bottom line is, is if, if you're just about the money, if this is just about to make as much money as possible by selling your practice, then you need to see, you, you need to really determine how far you are out from retirement. If you're one or two years out from retirement, this is a no brainer. You should be selling to private equity if they, if they want to buy you. If you're 10 years out of retirement, I actually think this is a bad deal for you. And if you look at the numbers, you'll actually make less money in the long run by selling to private equity, even with a 10 times multiple. And we'll get into it in the top. But then you will, if you hold on to the practice for 10 years and then sell it even at a two times multiple that you would probably get from a private practice sale or an OD to OD sale. Hmm. So I think that, you know, th those are the two extremes. Then the question becomes when you're, you know, three to, to nine years out, what do you do? And, and then you have to think about, you know, other considerations, not just financial, but your personal considerations. What are your personal goals and your professional considerations? So if you, if you, if you're looking to get out and you, it doesn't matter about the money, well then you should definitely get out and sell to private equity and how many years you have left doesn't matter. But again, if you, if it goes to strictly financial, uh, I think timing plays a big role. Well, Ben, I have a couple of big picture questions here. So for many people, private equity is, those are bad words that it just doesn't have a good connotation because let's be real, private equity is there 
to make money. They're purchasing companies or practices to make an investment. And they're looking at the bottom line. They want to make mm -hmm. money. So if we step back and take a look at why doctors aren't maximizing their practices, is there a different way to go? I mean, for as long as I've been in this industry, there's always been talk of we need to have a practice management university. Should there be a fifth year in optometry, optometry school to talk about this, about how to manage a practice? And if we compare optometry versus ophthalmology, optometrists are not trained with the office manager model. I mean, they're, I mean, ophthalmologists, and I'm stereotyping here, but they're, they're involved in their practices, but they aren't really chief cook and bottle washers the way optometrists are. So, right. and I'm not looking to throw anybody under the bus, but is there a different way to, I guess, to help optometrists become better at managing their practices so they don't need to sell them in order for somebody else to do it for them? No, I think it's a great question. You know, I think with, with ophthalmology, you know, a lot of cases they can make money in spite of themselves. So they don't have to be good business people. And, and I think to your point, Gretchen, they, they kind of live in this office manager model where they can have people run their practice. But if you think about ophthalmology, you, know, you take the general ophthalmologist and they have retail out, out of the picture. But, you know, they're doing surgery. And it's very high, if they're a high-volume surgeon, it's very high-profitable procedures. So, you know, for them, uh, you know, they don't have to run as lean as optometrists do. So I think you're right. I think I think when you say an optometrist kind of does it all, it's kind of the model of optometry, that mom and pop model. And and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus either. But you know, most people that are teaching in our schools, and again, I'm going to be very broad. I don't want to, to offend anyone. Most of them have never been in private practice, and or, or or didn't do well in private practice. And 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 so they're teaching for you know whatever the reason is, and I, hopefully it's a passion for education. But I don't think they have a lot of experience in running practices. And in, in my experience, even the practice management uh, instructors or professors don't have a lot of experience running practices or have, or have one successful practice and don't understand all the different nuances between the different ones. So I think that is an issue. I think it's, it's difficult because um, optometry does run fairly lean, and there's so much to running a, a big business that optometrists just aren't prepared for. I think if you're if you're looking for another way out other than private equity, which which I can understand. I mean, I, you know, when I first heard of private equity, I didn't know what to think of it and thought it was probably evil. Um, I think doctors <laughs> are going to have to start coming together and and working together, and and that's very hard for optometrists to do. But I'll tell you, when I sold my practice uh, back in 2011, the, one of the reasons why. I did is I saw I saw kind of the hist the what I thought was the future. I was I was slightly right and slightly wrong, but I saw consolidation. I just never imagined it would be private equity. I saw practices coming together and, and being large multi door locations with multi owners that kind of took over an area and then corporate optometry. So your you know, your your Luxottica brands or or your vision works and America's best. And I saw that was kind of the future and I had just, you know, solo practice a decent size, I and mean, we did over a million a year, but I saw that those practices were going to struggle uh, to survive in this in a world that, that would be consolidation. We were starting to see it with buying groups, and I thought the next step from a buying group would be just a group consolidating, um, which, interesting enough, is going to start happening, which we can talk about. But um, And so I tried to do that in my area, and I got together with four other practices. Uh, one was a practice that shared uh, my associate doctor. She worked for me part-time and was buying into this other practice. Another one was a good friend of mine who was buying into a practice, and then there was a practice uh, that was in a different town that I was good friends with. We, we, I, I tried to get us all together with the idea of, of a pseudo-consolidation model, and this was in 2010. I said, hey, let's just combine practices, and this will age my, me a little bit, but I said, we'll advertise together in the Yellow Pages. So we, instead of having four big yellow page ads to the tune of 15000 a piece, we'd have one with all of our information on it so that would reduce our overhead there. At that time, I was consulting quite a bit for contact lens companies, so I knew I could get discounts and change our buying power because we'd be four large practices buying together. And, and I, I said, we'll share no financial information. The only thing I ask is when you guys are each ready to retire and the, and the principals in those practices were 10 to 15 years, years older than me, I said the group, get, the group would get first right refusal and yeah. not – and, and not that we had to buy it, but we would get the first option to buy it. And, and, and if you got a better deal, we had the right to at least match that deal because it would be worth, worth more than us. And one by one, each one of those practices dropped out of the discussions. With, and there was no risk to them. I was giving them a guaranteed buyout. And eventually the three younger doctors in the group of us would own four locations. And then we'd have our, we would kind of insulate ourselves and, and be our own little mini buying group. And one by one, they dropped out. And when the last doctor dropped out, 
I put my practice on the market and went basically to go work for Bash and Long. So why did those doctors drop answer, out? Do you know? I, you know, I think they were scared. I, I, I think, you know, in general, they were mistrusting and, you know, mm. so they didn't trust me, which, you know, I think I'm fairly trustworthy and I, I you know, I would have put <laughs> in the paper, but, uh, you guys shouldn't laugh at that. Uh, no, I, I, I'm laughing you know, the way you laugh. say I'm, I'm, fairly, I'm trusting. fairly, I'm fairly trustworthy. <laughs> that, that's a qualifier yeah, in there, and, only fairly. Yeah. Well, you know, you never know. But and, and quite honestly, I was looking out for my friend and my associate that we would have, you know, future for us to own these practices and, and really build something and really, you know, have a place for optometrists to come work for us and treat them the way we, you know, we felt uh, OD should be treated as employees. And I, I think one by one, I think they just didn't, they didn't trust the mod. They didn't trust what I was trying to do. And they thought we would steal their patient. I don't know. You know, again, I, I don't know all the details because they weren't really very forthcoming, but, but uh, it was, it was eye-opening for me in realizing that optometrists in general just don't want to work together. Yeah. And you know, one, one other thing that I find really interesting too is, you know, <clears throat> first of all, I want to congratulate you and thank you for your bravery coming on here today. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, because, sure. because, you know, people, when they hear private equity now, it's like they tighten up all of a sudden, they clench. And I think the yeah. one thing that I would just like to, to get out there to people is the fact that not all groups are the same. Um, yep. They use that one term, but it actually means a lot of things, depending on the group. Yep. So I, I, was, I was, you know, hoping that you could get into that a little bit, too, to explain to people that it's not some monolithic thing that's coming for them, like a, like a monster in a movie or something, right? That each of the groups right. does have their own personality and their own different models. Right. Yeah. So there's there's about six really I mean recognizable private equity companies out there, but there's really only three large ones, and then I in my talk include a fourth because um, it's it's really with people we all know. So you know it's one one that Ben Gaddy and, and Paul Carpecki are involved with. So mm -hmm. I felt obligated to include them, and these are the four groups that are. Uh, that are always seen at the Vision Expo meetings. Uh, you know, so you've got you've got Acuity, which is my group. Uh, you've got Total Eye Care Partners, which is Paul uh, Karpacki, Ben Gaddy, and Jay Binkowitz. Uh, and then you've got Eye Care Partners, and you've got My Eye Doctor. And I think um, you know if, you, if there's a spectrum where uh, of private equity, where you have on one end you have the private equity group that's consolidating under a national brand. That's my eye doctor. And again, I'm not here to knock anybody, but that, that they're forming a national brand. So when you sell your practice, your practice will become my eye doctor. And the, the proof will be because that's where Ossip has gone and that's where Schaefer has gone. I'm being told, now I, I, I don't work for the company, but I have good friends there, uh, that those practices will be changing their name. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it'll be Schaefer Eye Center or whatever, Schaefer Eye Care powered by my eye doctor, or it's going to be my eye doctor powered by Schaefer. Same with Ossip. So those are two very recognizable brand names in our in our industry and definitely in their areas that are going to become my eye doctor practices, which will include rebranding inside the stores uh, or what they will call stores. Um, so that that's that's a different one. I think that one, you know, people have to look at if that's really what you want. I mean, I, I understand why Jack and and why Greg did what they did, right? Uh, because they got you know they got to be on the board and they're gonna they're getting money outside of the money. I don't I don't knock anyone for their decisions. But that's a different model, and, and that model, I will tell you, the only place that's going to end up is at a Luxottica or an NBI or something like that because it's, it's already prepackaged for them. They're all going to be my eye doctor. So I think that one gives us all a bad name. And then you have on the complete opposite end of the spectrum is Total Eye Care Partners, which this is a group that really leaves the practices alone. So they don't make any significant changes to them. They definitely don't change the name. The brand stay intact. And this is Neil Gaylemore went this way and Alan and Glazier, you know, went this way. Their practice stay the same. And their goal, which is very noble, I think, is to try to use their expertise to improve the way these practices approach medical optometry. So you've got very sharp guys, well-recognized, you know, an anterior seg. You've got Paul. You've got glaucoma with Ben. You've got myopia control. Uh, with Alan and, of course, uh, Neil with practice management, their job is you, you join that network and it's designed to enhance what you're doing. But make, make no mistake, you're an employee of that organization. Right. So that's the, the complete opposite end. And then in the middle, you have us and, and eye care partners where um, I think eye care partners is going to skew a little bit more towards my eye doctor because they're really operating under the Clarkson name. So a lot of their acquisitions will probably fall under Clarkson. Not all of them. Uh, they have some other big ones, uh, Rinkoff and Toma and Sutton. So they'll they'll try to consolidate under those under those big regional names. And then ours, where you know we've got eight different brands. We try to keep the brand names intact. We're buying practices, and and we want to maintain that brand integrity. So, so I think when you when and you know to be clear, as we go into regions, we may buy one-off practices and either use the powered by name or change their name to the larger brand in the region. That, that's yet to be seen. 
But the idea is we're keeping the regional brand names intact, very similar to what iCare Partners are doing. So I think in that respect, um, you know, I think it's good. It's keeping that, that private practice feel that we don't remodel to make them all look the same. We, you know, they're very much all going to maintain their integrity. Um, I think in this round, that can be very good for optometry. So we're actually giving these, these private practices, you know, a competitive edge with, our, you know, with, with the, the synergies that we can create. What happens in the future, that's, you know, that's going to be tough to see because, I mean, what's next after this is the consolidation of the consolidators. Someone's got to come in and buy eye care partners and, and acuity and create some massive group with all those brands. And, uh, and, and I don't know what that means yet for optometry. And then after that, who else is left to buy but VSP or Esplor Luxottica, I mean, if we're, if we're being honest. So how is this going down this road with the different models that you've described, how is this different from going down a corporate optometry road? Because it sounds like even for the models that keep a practice name, keep a practice look and feel, it's still corporate in that you are following a different protocol. And obviously you, you want to change and improve. That's why a doctor would be doing this in the first place. But if we, similar to what you were just saying, if we look down the road a little bit, where does private practice live? Because this isn't really private practice anymore. Yeah, I think that's a great call. I mean, make no mistake, this is a form of corporate optometry, right? I mean, you, you become an employee. You, there, is a, there is a corporate protocol that will be put in place. You're answering to investors. Where I think the difference is, and again, I, I can't speak to eye care partners as much. Um, I, you know, it's interesting, in doing the research for this talk, nobody wanted to uh, be very forthcoming with how they do things. And I asked them all. The only one that well, I, I had a really good conversation with Jay Binkowitz, and, and, uh, and, and that was probably through my, my relationship with Ben Gaddy, and, and he kind of helped me through stuff. So I, I, can, I can't really speak to all, but, but you, you take the Maya Doctor approach. That's, that's, that is corporate optometry, just slightly different. You take the total eye care partners, which is, again is Jay and Ben and Paul, and, and what they're trying to do is actually enhance your, your medical capabilities and what you do from a medical practice. So I think that's where you see some of the differences. When you look at the acuity group, my job is specifically to look to enhance our ability to provide medical eye care. And, and when you look at where things are going, and, and I'll explain how it's different from corporate, because as you know, I, I was the chief uh, or the senior clinical director for, for Luxottica for a while. But um, when you look at what we're trying to accomplish, you know, you look at OCT is a perfect example. I'd love to bring an OCT into every location that we have, but at you know anywhere from thirty to sixty thousand dollars depending on the unit, and us having over ninety units now, a lot of them have OCTs. But let's say we didn't, that's really hard to do. Right. But if I have a, if I have five or six practices, say in the Denver area, and that don't have an OCT, and between between all of them, they have enough patients to justify purchasing an OCT, I can buy one, and now I can start actually referring patients in to to a center or to one of my locations that has an OCT. But at $42 of you know, bilateral reimbursement, how does, someone, how does a private practice buy an OCT? And on the flip side of that, corporate optometry has no interest in that. You know, and, and one of the reasons why um, I left Luxottica, and, and you know, Luxottica was very good to me, uh, was because what I was trying to accomplish was that. I was trying to find a way for the doctors to practice more medical than they were in their current locations but not necessarily do it in those locations, which a lot of, you know, some people thought was a great idea, other people thought was a horrible idea. Um, and it finally got Luxottica to understand that, you know, that that's something we needed to do. They wanted their doctors to be happier. They wanted them to do more medical because that's a way of maintaining patients and keeping the doctors happy and successful affiliating with Luxottica. What I try to tell them is, bottom line is that you don't want those procedures done actually in a lens crafters or in a target. Those take away from, uh, from patients that would be coming in for a refractive exam that are going to buy glasses at your optical. So my idea was let's move medical outside of lens crafters, have centralized locations for lens crafters, and have all those doctors that are sublease doctors have an ownership in that center and see their own patients in that center. And then that way you can separate out medical from refractive care. Refractive care can be done at the store where they're going to buy glasses. And the doctor can have a center where all they do is medical for a day or two a week. And we would provide the instrument so they didn't have to buy an OCT or, or you know, Lipaflow, which is another great example, $21,000, $22,000. Mm -hmm. um, very hard to get that done in a corporation. Um, and so 
uh, when I had the opportunity to go into a private equity group, I don't have the layers. I don't have to go through the uh, leadership team in Mason, Ohio, and then who has to go through the leadership team in Milan to get approval for that. I can go, you know, I, I get to make that decision. And, and so, I, you know, as long as I can show an ROI, the, the equity guys, they, they want to be a part of it. So I think when you, you look at where the difference is, we're going to be highly invested, at least my organization, I think I care, total I care partners as well, highly invested in finding a way to enhance medical in these practices because we know that's a, you know, it generates revenue, but it keeps patients there and keeps them happy. So I think that's where, I mean, short answer is I believe that's where the difference is between the true corporate model and this corporate private equity model. All right. I, can I ask one more question? Sure, go for it, Gretchen. <laughs> I want to just follow up on what we were talking about at the beginning about private practice. So if, if we zoom back and, and take a really high level view, a lot of things have happened in optometry over the last 10 to 20 years. Things have changed a lot. Corporate optometry is has changed. There are students who are now new doctors, as you mentioned, who aren't as interested in practice ownership. We've got private equity partners. So I ask, and then we're not even talking about disruptive technology. Uh, such as Opternative Now Visibly or other entities that are looking to sell consumers, not patients, uh, a refraction and leave out the ocular health exam. So we have all these things going on. And again, where does that leave private practice? So are those folks who are very interested in private practice and maintaining that status quo, are we guys who are hanging on from, you know, the, 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 the previous look of optometry and the whole face of optometry is changing and time to get with the program and things are moving on and times have to move and we have to change with them? Or I guess I'm just wondering what's happening to all this? It, will there still be a sure. private practice? And is that to the benefit or detriment of optometry? And is it to the benefit sure. and detriment of patients? Yeah, great questions. I think, um, I think in the in the foreseeable near future, I think this can be good for optometry. I, I think, but I think to your point, we we have to rethink what private practice optometry is. As reimbursements stay stagnant, instruments become more and more expensive. And, you know, the, our ability to do things now compared to when I graduated, you know, is is incredible. I can't even imagine what we're going to be able to do in ten years from now. But it, but it's expensive. Right. And you know, you look at. Uh, reimbursements and you know, uh, you know as we look at the ERG is a great example the code just changed for ERG where now it's not covered it's a level three code is what I'm being told so it's it's all patient pay which is going to dramatically decrease utilization of ERG at least in this next year um, and so you know to buy a unit to think that you're going to get revenue because insurance companies will cover it and, and reimbursements either stop or, or decrease makes it very difficult for that mom and pop practice to survive so I think if you go back 50 years, and it's a shame, Adam, your, your, your dad's on the call, but, you know, with his practice, now granted his was unique and it was contact lenses only, but back in that day, the mom and pop practice was where it was all about. I think those days are, are long gone. I, th I think, you you know, we're gonna, you have to think bigger, and, and that solo optometrist practice is going to struggle against this consolidation. And I th so I think you have to have to look at it differently. I think consolidation is key. I think you can still maintain private practice feel even though you're consolidated, it, you know, depending on, on who the consolidator is. Uh, and I think that's the way we're going to compete. I think, you know, um, as I, as I look at, at where the future, this is, you just look at where the vendors are with, you know, the vendors are want to deal with organizations like ours now, because they know they're more likely to place six or seven of these right. than they have you know, than they have to go to six or seven practices to try to place those in, in all of them. So um, I think, yeah, I think, I think we as optometrists uh, have to think differently about what this, what this is. But the good news is the majority, from what I've seen, of, of, patient, of doctors who are coming out of school nowadays aren't really looking to buy into it. First of all, I don't know how they can. They're $150,000 to $250,000 in debt. They're paying it out over 30 years. I don't know how they can afford to buy into a practice. They definitely don't necessarily want to. Uh, these these uh, new graduates now have different different needs and wants. I mean, they're about experiences and, and actually doing good in the world and, and, and owning a practice and being part of that machine is not necessarily in broad strokes here, but not necessarily what they're interested in. Interested in. So opportunities like what, what we're doing at, at Acuity with Total Eye Care Partners and Eye Care Partners are doing is giving them an opportunity to practice full scope optometry in a private practice setting as an employee working, yes, for a corporation, 
but different than going into a you know a spin and grin mill that all you're doing is six minute exams and doing refractions and you know in, in refract and refer. Well, but you're talking I think, about. I think the time is right. You're you're talking about optometrists need to decide, and let's be real: is up are optometrists going to get together, figure it out, or is it going to happen to them? It's going to happen to them. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to be optimistic and say they're going to, I mean, it, it, it'll start happening to them, and then I think that'll force them to decide. Right. But, you know, again, you've, you've got practice, these 500, 600,000 are your practices, you know, which run really, really lean, and the doctor makes a really good living, you know, $200,000 a year, um, with, that may not even be attractive to private equity or consolidator. Um, you know, I just don't know how, you know, again, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I just don't know how they survive without consolidating to put themselves in a better place. Yeah. I think it's tough. Yep. It is tough. And, and, and it will happen. Well, and listen, you know, I, I don't bring this up in my talk very much. We're learning more about it. But, you know, the, what we're hearing now in the industry is, is Vision Source has changed their contract. Uh, it's such that uh, they, if you sign the new Vision Source contract, you are not allowed to sell your practice for four years. That tells me that Exo Luxottica is looking to start buying these practices. And, and the rumors are that they're starting to work with a private equity group to, to be able to buy them. And, and that on makes top sense of that for revolution, them. it totally makes sense for them. I mean, they need to compete with, with this because they're, well, in Luxottica in general, they're losing Pearl Visions. They're losing them to my eye doctor, actually. And, and so um, because of the, you know, the franchise agreement at 10 years, they can get out. So, um, so that's a problem for them. And, it, and, and they're losing, and no one's talking about this, but last year was the first year that they lost members, uh, they had a net loss of members at Vision Source. So the other issue is Revolution is looking to spin off Revolution EHR and PECA, and VSP is shopping. So or, or, we're looking, they're being shopped to VSP. So VSP is going to get in this game, too. Um, it's going to be a different world five years from now. Oh. It sure sounds like it. So that means we're going to have to talk more. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, happy to. All right. Well, I, Ben. I get, I, it's really exciting for me, so I, I love talking about it. Awesome. Well, Ben, thanks for doing this, and uh, you have a talk coming up, so good luck with that. And uh, I hope people Thanks, ask sir. you a bunch of interesting questions. I'm sure they will. I might actually drop in on that lecture, too, because I'm <laughs> curious. Um, so good luck yeah, with I'll it. I'll be there in the chat. All right. So we'll talk soon. Thanks, Ben. All right. Sounds good. Good talking to you guys. Take care. Bye. 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 Yep. Always, wow. always fun speaking to him. And if you weren't scared before, be scared now. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't not, think that's what he's trying to Exci say. Excited, I think, is probably more. I mean, there's always stuff going on, right? There's a lot of stuff happening, so you have to keep abreast of it. You know, whether or not you are nervous about it, that's up to you. But isn't there a saying that opportunity has two meanings? That one is positive and one is negative. True. And I think um, a lot of people view opportunity in a negative way. I know I do. I'm a bit risk averse, and so change is scary. Yep. And I think it might be in stereotyping here, but it might be an optometrist's DNA about change being scary. But there are some cutting edge ODs out there who are really taking the bull by the horns and, and making big changes. And maybe we should talk to some of those people, what, what they're doing with their um, private equity practices. Because as Ben said, the models are very different and I don't think people are aware of that. Yeah, they, they are very different. And uh, and it's it's what's interesting is who knows which one will be successful. <laughs> right. You don't, right? So you're, you're rolling the dice. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know that it needs to come down to a zero sum game where we have only one. Yeah. I, I do think that just over the natural course of business, some will succeed and, and keep growing and others will start to fall by the wayside. But it, the models are very different and what might work for Dr. A's practice, might not work for Dr. B. And I think Ben makes a very good point. It depends on where a doctor is in, in his or her practice lifespan. Right. What do you want to do? Yep. And I can imagine, too, if he, for, for the older doctor, I, I almost wonder, you know, selling out's great, but can you imagine taking orders from someone? Like, I'm trying to think of him, you know, selling out. And sorry, I'm pointing to my father over there and just imagining what it might what it must be like <laughs> if he's suddenly taking orders now from you know some, from some distant boss telling him what to do in his practice every day I can I, I can imagine a work stoppage every day well you know we have um, a new practice management author at optometry times Chris Roten and he has shared some information about that about how uh, some people say that having the selling doctor stay on for a long time is a good thing to do because sure. it keeps the doctor involved it's continuity for staff the community and patients and you can tap into that brain trust but in oops sorry earbud problem 
Um, for other situations, you want to move that pre uh, selling doctor out in a big hurry right. because the doctor could be a drag on the practice. Like, well, that's not how we used to do it. And and have a hard time if a lot of new technology comes in or if there's a lot of big change here she might be very resistant right so i think that also depends on the willingness of the new of the selling doctor to get involved with change and i think it's very individual you can't yep. say move the old guy out or keep him in or her to to keep the continuity of the practice right Meanwhile, we have a call now, don't we? We with, do. With we Whitney. do. We are talking with oh, we're ta uh, Whitney, Whitney Hauser. Whitney Hauser. All right. Let me find Whitney here. All righty. This is Dr. Whitney Hauser. Yep. Please leave me a message. <laughs> At the tone, please record your message. Like when you right finish recording, right to voice you may hang up or press one for more options. Hey, Whitney, it's Adam Farkas and Gretchen Bailey. Um, I guess we went straight to your voicemail. So uh, we'll try again in a few minutes and hopefully uh, your phone will be up and alive. Thanks. I don't have the schedule in front of me and I guess I should. Um, I she... will I will put it up in front of all of us because everyone needs to know if I can find it. Did she? Um, she has a class. Did she just finish her class? Let's see. Oh, she's just finishing now. Yeah, That's probably why. Uh, okay, so she's probably being tortured by people who are asking questions. So she is being inundated with eager and interested attendees who want to know more. Yes, tortured. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, so you can see actually we have the, the schedule up here for what people have just been through. So you can see that she's one of the, the classes. Uh, wh what else was going on at this hour? Ocular manifestation of systemic disease, so that's another good one. Justin Bazan, always an interesting talk. Help for hire. Mm. Gary Gerber, oh he's starting now talking about myopia management. Yep, yeah, so Gary just started. Uh, who else is starting right now? We got and multiple Jen things. Jen Lyerly talking about uh, aesthetics and ocular surface disease. There's been a lot of talk lately about that. Yep. And then Deanna Fitzgerald talking about concussion. So we have a bunch of different talks about concussion this year. Um, it's a big topic. I've covered it, it a lot in optometry yeah. times, and we've had a lot of interest and engagement around that. Yep. And just overall healthcare too. People are paying more attention to concussion. It isn't as as benign as people thought. And in fact, my daughter had a concussion her six weeks after she went to school the first time. Oh, no. She ended up having to drop a class. She was, fortunately, she doesn't go to school very far from home, so she came home for two weeks, and she really did want to heal. She listened to the doctors, but for a college freshman, no cell phone, no laptop, no video games. That's a nightmare. It was, but she really wanted to heal. She was very good about that, but I think for a lot of people not having any devices at all is very hard to do and what vision plays a really big role in that. What caused the concussion? Oh, what caused her concussion? She went to the bathroom in the middle of the night and the freshmen were housed in an older dorm so there were stone tile floors, stone sinks, and there was water on the floor from some girls who don't like to put the shower curtain in the shower. So she slipped on water and <laughs> smacked her head. Oof. Yeah, so she didn't realize that it was a problem until about um, 36 to 48 hours later, and that could have been part of the problem, too. So there's a lot of concern around concussion, and especially with sports, too, football players, So too. Whitney, I think, just tried to call us, so I'm going to call oh, her Oh, right good. Back. She might be ready. Yeah. Okay. Fingers crossed. Hello. Hey, Whitney. It's Adam and Gretchen. How you doing? Good. How are you? Sorry about the voicemail thing. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, we we figured that you were being tortured at your lecture by people asking tortured. you questions. I said inundated <laughs> by interested attendees. I say torture. 
Uh, no, I've, I, have, I have escaped the, the <laughs> raucous mob and made my way to my hotel room, and um, you're the only thing between me and a, and a break, so oh, I'm boy. glad I got you. Well, excellent. You deserve a break. Yeah. Thank you for spending that time with Thanks. us. It's good to talk to you. How did your class go? Well. Uh, I think it went well. I didn't, I didn't seem to have any trouble, so the went smoothly from a technical perspective and hopefully the course is well received as well. Good. Excellent. Excellent. So you, you gave a talk all about dry eye, of course. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I I'm kind of, yeah, you did. So I, I know, um, you know, one of the big things uh, these days, you know, people are trying to come up with algorithms and everything else to try to diagnose it because they, in general, people do such a bad job. <laughs> I mean, not to stereotype, but in general, there's not really a, a systematic approach that a lot of people take. So, um, but you're an expert at this. Well, so, you know, I, I mean, so you, you obviously yeah. have it down. And I'm kind of wondering from what you've seen out there, how often do people blow it? <laughs> <laughs> kind of curious. Blow it. That, yeah. That's a great way to put well, it out. There's, there's so much to what you just said. For, for one, I appreciate the, the being labeled expert. For two, when you say you have it down, it's funny. That's just when you figure you don't. Right. So I guess I'm always open-minded to learning new things, new ways to approach the disease process, the multifactorial nature of it. You know, we say that word all the time in lectures to a point that it's sort of ad nauseum, that I think audiences want to just, you know, it's so rote that you think, ah, eh, multifactorial nature, blah, blah, blah. But it's so important. You know, the mechanism of the blink of is are the eyes closing all the way is there a lid hygiene problem you know are, do they have an obstructive evaporative problem is there an autoimmune component what about their medications they're taking you know and if you take them bit by bit and look at it just sort of you know as individual pieces then you can really ascertain what the problem is but sometimes all of the multifactorial nature of it's just too overwhelming for a lot of doctors and they're like i've got more to do in my day than to, than to tackle dry eye with vigor so hopefully we'll see more and more people doing it because it's just not going away. Right. And, you know, I think that the other problem is there are a lot of diseases that, that can masquerade. Um, you know, what do, what do you yeah. see out there that, that kind of fool the clinicians who are trying to diagnose this? Right. Right. That was that was what most of the lecture was about just now. The, you know, allergy is one of the biggest things that we see that masquerades as dry eye disease and also as a lid hygiene issue. If you ask any doctor, you know, an eye care provider, if I say itch, what's your reflex? And even if I say itch to most laymen or to most patients, their reflex is going to be allergy. Mm. But Demodex, one of the chief complaints with that, you know, and it's a parasitic infestation of lid margin, which is really commonly seen, their, their complaint is itch. And what we find is that doctors oftentimes hear the word itch, they prescribe the allergy medication for the patient that doesn't tend to resolve the issue because it was really never the problem. Right. So we need to make sure we're doing what we need to do observationally to make the right diagnosis, which in turn makes the right treatment, which in turn makes a happy patient. Right. Are we still going back and forth with allergy and dry eye? Maybe I've seen so much content about that, but haven't we figured that out yet? What's, <laughs> what's the disconnect? <laughs> between allergy and dry eye with disconnect? Wait, what's the disconnect with, with the misdiagnosis or uh -oh. not really Wait. under... Oh, Wait. We, we lost her. Oh, no. Come back. Come back. Wait, let me try again. Sorry about that. Sorry, Whitney. We didn't hang up on you. I might go right to her voicemail. She doesn't realize the call just dropped. Sorry, but you are not allowed to make this call. Uh, ID six. You're not allowed to make that call, Adam. That was cute. Huh. Okay then. <laughs> Should we try one more time? I will try one more time. Oh, she just texted Gur my connection, so I'll tell her that we're trying to call back. Unless she's watching us, then she'll know. <laughs> Boo. All right. Go stand near a window, Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like disco music. 
Are we there? Sorry. Uh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> Trinidad, Trinidad is not friends with the phone. That's where you are? Oh, she's gone again. Oh my gosh. Okay, if she's in Trinidad, I thought she was at GSLS in Vegas. So did I. So if she's in Trinidad, girlfriend, don't be talking to us, yeah, man. Seriously. Go out to the go beach. Fun. Do something else. Go have Jeez. a go have a fruity drink. Oh my gosh. Or yeah. something. That's hilarious. Well, all right. <laughs> Should we try one more time? We or can, do we, can we try, want to Well, we could try one more time and uh, you know, if not, we'll catch up with her later, okay. I guess, when she's I'll got let her a know. better connection. That is hilarious in some ways. I'll tell her we will try one more time. And then I'll tell her just go to the beach or the pool or something yeah. because boy, I wish I were there. I need a tropical vacation. Maybe, maybe we can do that next year for CE Wire. Anywhere but here. It's been raining for six months. Grand Cayman. <laughs> Have internet connection, will travel. All right. All I'm right. for it. I'm hanging out a window, literally. <laughs> <laughs> You're in Trinidad? Yeah, I'm in Trinidad. I did a CE edit forward this morning, and I'm in my... Uh, they were nice enough to time my CE wire so I could make it as well. Wow. Well, we're grateful for that, yeah. but I'm saying, shoot, yeah. you don't need to be talking with us, man. Yeah. You need to be doing something much more fun. <laughs> yeah. So if, if it dies, we'll catch... Are you kidding? I mean, yeah. And so if it dies, we'll just catch up with you some other time for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, cause yeah, I'm so sorry. You That's should be okay. on the beach anyway, seriously. So yeah, I was asking, I <laughs> before we lost the call, I was asking, why haven't we in the industry figured it out yet between allergy and dry eye? Why is that still something we talk about? Well, it's, it's when there's an overlap. You know, you, you have both. You have signs and symptoms of both. And then you start to treat the allergy and it exacerbates the dryness and it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and a wheel, like a, a cycle you can't get off of. Mm. So, you know, things, you want to say, gosh, dry is not that tough, allergy not that tough, but you put them together uh, and it, it really kind of doubles down on you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the question is, what can doctors do about this to, to make the diagnosis a little more accurately, I guess? That's a good question. Well, yeah. So the, a couple things. One, make sure your itch isn't related to something else. Make sure it's not a blepharitis itch, a demodex itch. Look for the response of papillae. And then if you start to medicate your patient for allergy and you're medicating with an ophthalmic, you're medicating with an oral uh, whatever the case may be, make sure that then you cycle back and say, look, one of our expected adverse events from doing this treatment is an uptick in dryness, and we're going to do that. What we're going to do is going to offset that by then starting at least a baseline dry regimen to sort of offset the side effects that you may be inducing. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't do that, then we're, you know, kind of setting the patient up to treat one thing and then create another problem. Got it. That's true. That's true. Cool. Me? Okay, sorry. Go ahead, we're Gretchen. We're stepping Hi. on each other here. So <laughs> you mentioned allergy, and you also that's mentioned... A live, that's, a, that's a true live interview. It that's really right. is. We pull no punches. <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about allergy, and we're also talking about Demodex as masquerators for dry eye, what would, you, what would be a couple of other things that doctors should be looking for that actually you might want to consider dry eye in your deferential. Right. It might look like this, but oops, right. nope, it's dry eye. Right. And one of the most commonly overlooked components is epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Uh, and we see SDK, but we don't really recognize that there's areas of epithelium that are kind of missing. And that's one of the things that I notice a lot. And some of the treatments that we do for those can be similar and overlapping, but there's additional things that you may want to be doing to treat UDMB that you might not do for your traditional uh, dry patients, something like a, you know, no one to a flesh cut, something that's one of those hypotonic solutions to sort of pull that fluid out, pack the epithelium down better. And that's different than a traditional artificial tear that's working strictly as a palliative lubricant. So, you know, you might want to do some things differently uh, than, your, than your regular dry patients for those folks. All right. Got it. Cool. Got it. All right, well, I want to shift gears before your, your, your two cans and a string falls apart here completely. Um, no, it literally I, is. I, I'm honestly hanging out the window. <laughs> Don't All right, fall. So I have a quick question. I just want yeah. to talk to you about Neuralens really quickly. So sure. 
Uh, Neuralens yep. is, is in the exhibit all here. They're a sponsor of the conference. And I literally mm -hmm. do not understand the technology at all. You um, have to read the article I know, we have, I know. Adam. I, but, you know, it's brand new, and new, th new things are scary. So, um, but, you know, yeah, you're, the first really you know, you're the first person that we've spoken to about it. So I was just wondering if you could give okay. us a little bit of a background on it and your experience with it and try to explain to folks right. what it is and how it works. <laughs> sure, sure. I will, I will do my best to cover all that. Um, okay. I met with Maryland um, probably about two years ago at Vision Expo West. And I remember going to the meeting with them and sitting down and talking and quite frankly thinking, what? why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> because it really seemed sort of out of my wheelhouse of expertise. And I didn't devalue what they were telling me, but I thought, well, this, why is this, why am I being engaged about this? Because it's just not, you know, it's not where I spend most of my practice. And, you know, what they were telling me about was visual discomfort. And there was definitely some overlap to dry disease. And I found that compelling, but I, I just couldn't kind of fall in, uh, with both feet, so to speak. And I heard what they had to say and sort of took it in. And then last year I was at uh, OIS at SECO and, you know, they came up and talked to me again and we had a call after that OIS meeting and, and they were telling me about, you know, their study with headache and asthenopia, you know, overall just visual discomfort, some of how that overlaps with dry eye. And honestly, I think, you know, where they were headed with me was talking about the dry eye sort of overlap. And all I could think about was them talking about headache. And my son, uh, my middle son has had migraines since he was three years old. And we have tried everything, literally everything I could think of, you know, allergy drugs, uh, headache drugs, uh, headache drugs that were honestly used off label for him as a pediatric patient. We had that, you know, sort of avoid the black box warning and go for it anyway, just because his symptoms were so bad. And we had done vision therapy. We had had his eyes checked. We had done everything. And I just really had run out of options. And when they said that, it spoke to me. And I thought, well, what's one more thing? Let's try this. And he got his hearing lens uh, back in June, I think it is. He said one headache since then that was of significance. He said some minor things like sinus wow. headaches and that sort of thing, like we all do. But, you know, it's made an en enormous impact on his life. And it in turn has made an enormous impact on really our family's life because when he had a headache, everything kind of shut down. Sure. You know, you could be at a theme park, you could be wherever, and, you know, he gets a headache, everybody goes home. So uh, hmm. it's made a huge, huge impact for our family, but more importantly for him and, you know, to the technology and the specifics of it, you know, it's using micro prismatic deviations. So some of these, you know, Pre uh, deviations and how the eyes align are really so small that traditional technology may not really identify them. So being able to use the neural lens, you know, diagnostic device and then pairing it with lenses that are specifically designed for those micro deviations has been able to alleviate his symptoms. Now, does that everyone? Certainly not. But, you know, they have nice, robust data and studies that they've engaged that show, you know, improvement in folks like that. So, you know, it's been a personal story of mine and uh, a real success story. That's really interesting that it came to you in such a personal way and to it see did. that yeah. your son is doing so much better now. That's, that's fabulous. And that has to be just very gratifying. Forget the clinician in you, but just as a parent to see that your son is not exactly. suffering. Exactly. I mean, you know, when it comes to neural lens, I mean, I, as a clinician, I modestly understand things. When I say modestly, you know, I still think there's a lot that we all could learn about how this is helping people. But you're exactly right. This is, I'm seeing this from patient perspective largely, and it's been a, it's been a huge life changer. And quite frankly, Gretchen, I mean, I've kind of given up. I mean, I thought, well, what else are you going to do? You know, we've tried drugs, we've tried vision therapy, we've tried everything. And the folks at Neuralink, talking to them about Andrew's success, you know, they said uh, the, that neural lens can be paired with things like vision therapy. So it can maybe even take things a little bit further. So it's not adversarial to vision therapy. It like really can be adjunctive and they can work in collaboration with each other. They really give the patient the best possible outcome. That's really interesting. And that's great to hear that the company is positioning it as something that can work in conjunction with other types of therapy as well. That's, that's really interesting. Right. That's great. 
I'm glad your son's doing so much better. So, and I, and I guess my, my question is, so obviously it works with kids, so the test itself, not very complicated to do, and, uh, and a child can do it and follow instructions? No, it's, oh yeah, yeah, he is, uh, he's 14 years old, but he's acts like a 10-year-old about half the time, so he can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> He's not listening, we hope. Yeah. And, yeah, no, he knows, he knows, he knows what his mother thinks of him. So he's, he's a sweet kid, but he's he's not real patient. He's not real detail oriented, you know. And if he can sit there and do it, it's really no more complicated than an auto refractor would be in mm-hmm. a traditional practice. So it takes really not much more time than that, and it's pretty well easily explained. And you know, he the entirety of his exam didn't take very long, and he was done. And the lenses turned around pretty quickly, and. He's worn them ever since. Funny enough, he plays football. Now, don't get me wrong. He's not a great football player, but he plays. <laughs> and he's wrapping he's up eighth grade this year, and he didn't want to take them off to play football. Wow. And when he went in to go have his, when he went in to have his football picture taken, he has his neural lenses on. So, you know, he just refuses to take them off from morning to night. He always has them on. Wow. Well, that's a testimony right there because he's a 13-year-old boy, so obviously he's not detail-oriented. I mean, that's just 13-year-old boys. And the fact that he doesn't want to take them off. Exactly. I've worked in optometry for 20 years, and the odds of a 13-year-old boy keeping up with anything, any pair of glasses for as long as, you know, it's pretty low. I mean, we pretty pretty much just expect he might as well just go ahead and buy two pair. But... (laughs) You know he's uh, he's taken he's taken really good care of him. It's been it's been a big deal, really has. I, I still honestly can't get over it. To be honest, I just yeah. really can't get over it because I still we've lived with it for so long that it's right. almost hard to believe that we're we are where we are. How long has he had them? Since June, so getting about nine months or so. Excellent, and so. He started mm-hmm. the school year with them then. Did it? Have, did you notice a difference with school? Yeah, I mean, he's been doing as, as well as possible. I can't say that he's improved anything, but that's, that, again, goes back to 13-year-old boy. Right. But he's also <laughs> able to pay closer attention because he doesn't have a headache all the time. He is. Exactly. Oh, I mean, he'd come home from school. I mean, and for me as a parent, you know, I get the phone call. I'm in the middle of patient care. Come get him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's come to work with me and laid on a couch in the Aww. office. I mean, it's just so. This has been an ongoing ongoing deal uh, for a long time, and you know, nothing really would stop it. And to have something like this that's made a big difference has been it's been really just shocking, honestly. Well, it helps him developmentally too, I'm sure, but and it also has ripple effects to your family life too, because I know you have right. other kids, and as you said, if yep. if he wasn't feeling well, I mean, the whatever you're doing that day had to stop. So your family life has right. has changed too, I would assume. You're exactly right. I mean, like I said, if it's an amusement park or whatever, I mean, I remember driving. We were going uh, to see a, a special Christmas program, and we were driving from Memphis, Tennessee to Nashville. It's two hours. Better. We finally get to Nashville, and I mean, he would his headaches would be so severe he would vomit oh. from them. So we get to Nashville for this program, and he starts throwing up, and we all look at each other like, "Are you kidding me?" Oh. <laughs> so I mean, and then for him, you know. He didn't, he, nobody wants to be the one that wrecks your family's good time either. So I mean, right. it's just a mess. Every way, you, every way you cut it, you know, everyone feels bad about the whole thing. So it's, it's really nice to just go live life and not have to give a lot of thought to it. I bet. It's like my dry patients would love to go live life and not think about their eyes, right. you know, and right. not have that awareness. So yeah, it, you know, quality of life is a huge deal. I mean, we think about life-threatening and vision-threatening and all those, you know, end-of-line deals. But <clears throat> how you live your life on that line is really important, too. Wow. Absolutely. Well, well that's wow. really a, that is a, incredible. a great story. Thank you for sharing that. That's really a, a personal look, sure. and yeah. I appreciate it. Yep. And for everyone who wants to sort of okay. learn the behind-the-scenes technical details of how New Orleans works, if you go into their booth, they have a bunch of white papers there. Oh, cool. Um, and technical documentation, so you can really get into sort of the nitty-gritty of how it's done. So I... I'd say anyone who's here at CEY, feel free to go into their booth and take a look. 
or a shameless right. plug. The other thing you might, the other thing, to, yeah, I was going to say, I was, I'm going to shamelessly plug for Gretchen as well. Oh, thank you, Whitney. Uh, there, was an article, <laughs> there was an article by David Geffen. Absolutely. Yeah. That was published last month. I don't mm-hmm. know how much time. This is a great read. And David has a great understanding of the mechanics, the neural lens. Right. And Gretchen and I will be speaking to David tomorrow afternoon. Uh, he's going to, he even brought slides. So we're going to go through it a little wow. bit. So yeah, mul- full multimedia presentation. So we're going to learn <laughs> a lot tomorrow. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Whitney, for spending time with us. And I think it is high time that you had a fruity, frothy drink on the beach. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for your patience with my can of string. (laughs) All right. And by the way, it's a beautiful place, and it's far more technically advanced than I'm giving it credit for on this call. So I don't want to give the island a bad way to go. I don't know. Maybe CEWire 2020. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I think so. I think so. All right. Very Thanks, good. Whitney. Good Thanks, we'll Whitney. Talk to you later. Bye. Right, bye. Bye. All right. Let me... Wow, that's a really compelling story. When it, you have something that affects your family like that, and you're able to find a solution, and it works, especially with your kids. Yeah. It's when something's wrong with your kids, and it affects your family. It's hard. I'm. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Paul's asking us if we would like a beverage. Yes, uh, we are all good. Yeah, Depends no, on I, what kind he's offering. See, I, I'm, I'm almost tempted to like stick the New Orleans brochure under Meredith's pillow tonight. Oh, does she have headaches? She gets, yeah, and migraines, so yeah. So I get sinus headaches. So. And Whoa, Ooh, that, was, that was a headache. I don't know what that was. Um, oh, we have another call coming up, We don't do. We? In a couple of minutes, we're going to talk to Chris Rapawano. He's from my neck of the woods, and he had a talk earlier today with the ever-fabulous Clark Chang. Uh, that must have been a great talk, and I'm sorry that I wasn't able to listen to that, but um, I would love to hear more about what he's talking about with keratoconus, especially with cross-linking. That is a big new technology that's coming around, and I know that many ODs are interested in what's happening, and I don't know, perhaps he'll have the answer, and I think that's more of a, a state-by-state decision. I think that might be a scope thing. Right. It might depend on organized ophthalmology in mm-hmm. that state and how it's perceived, what type of procedure, but that is certainly something I think that optometry can get involved with. And also for me personally, I'm interested, how are technicians involved? Right. Because it's not the MD sitting there putting the riboflavin drops on right. the patient's eye, it's your tech who's handling that. So maybe Chris will have some answers for us. And his talk finished Let's see, his talk finished about half an hour ago. Oh, okay, so he should be ready and able. Quite I, timely. I, I couldn't actually get it together with Clark this time, which I was really bummed about. Clark oh. is always fun to talk uh, with. But yeah, so better, better luck next time maybe, or yeah. But that's interesting now that we'll have the MD perspective because Clark will give the OD perspective and now we get a bit of the MD flavor on this yep. as well. All right, so let me find Chris's number here. Ow. You have to move your mic, Adam. Yeah, I know. This is like... It's getting a little scratchy there. I'm moving it away from me. Sorry, everyone. Making everyone We're go. all hooked up here. Adam invested this year in wireless technology. Yes, we so when we wander around here, we can, if we keep our, our earbuds or earphones on, we can hear the entire conversation right. throughout the house. Unless, yes. of course, you drop your battery pack in the toilet, which is what I was afraid of earlier. Did, did you actually drop it in the... I did not. Oh, okay. I would have told you. That, I would expect him to do that, but not you. Well, I, it fell down my pants, though. It oh, came dear. loose and fell down my pants. So you never know. Okay. 306. Okay. Hello, it's Chris Apuano. Hey, Chris. It's Adam Farkas and Gretchen Bailey. How you doing? Hello. Good. How are you? Good, good. So how, how did your talk go? Um, I think it went very well. There weren't a huge number of questions, but um, there were some, and we answered them. Great. Yeah, people get shy sometimes. They don't really want to ask questions. They get kind of nervous about doing it. Uh, uh-huh. even, even, even with texting, right? Even when they don't actually have to speak to you. Even with yeah, text, right, they exactly. get nervous. It's hilarious. But um, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, good. So yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad it went well. So your, your talk was all about keratoconus, right, with uh, Clark Chang? Correct. Great. So I mean, a Yeah, a keratoconus and, and assorted uh, um, you know, ectatic conditions. But yeah, 99% was keratoconus. Great. So, um, you know, I guess it's, it's a, an increasingly important topic, at least in, in optometric circles, especially with cross-linking, you know, becoming, uh, right. you know, coming online and people are getting more interested in it again. So I was sort of wondering maybe... Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think... I think personally, that's the reason that it's become you know a much bigger and uh, more important topic for everybody to understand. Because you know, as I kind of finalized at the end of my talk, you know, before you know, it didn't really matter when you made the diagnosis. It didn't really matter if you really followed progression because there was nothing we could do. I mean, right. other than you know, contacts and surgery. Um, now, and then, but now, you know, to make the diagnosis early and to follow patients for progression is critically important. Yep. So I think it's a, it's a huge deal now where it wasn't, you know, five, ten years ago, whenever you want to say cross syncing became available in the U.S. Right. And so, you, as you said, you want to try to get people early. And so I guess what's the yeah. sort of the, the typical presentation that people should be on the lookout for? And again, we're talking about general practitioners here, right? That's really who attends CE Wire. Uh, and you want to get them, right. you know, plugged yeah, in as, people as, on the front line. Exactly. Exactly. And you want to get them plugged in as early as possible. So what should they be looking for to try to catch the keratoconus patient very early? Well, I mean, the first thing is you just have to be suspicious that when either someone's refraction is changing, you know, kind of more than average, you know, geez, every six months they're coming in for new glasses or something and it's changing more than average, um, then you should be suspicious. And two, if you can't correct them, you know, to a nice, clear, crisp 2020 and you can't find another reason for it, mm. because a lot of these patients, their corneas look pretty darn normal on that slit lamp exam, and it's only in topography where, you know, we see this irregularity and we say, aha, you know, we got you to 2025 and, I, you know, a year ago would have blown it off. But now, you know, we, we want to figure out why, because if you've got keratoconus, then there's something that we can potentially do to stop it from getting worse over the next, you know, five, 10 years or whatever. Right. Those are two things. It's just a history of kind of frequently changing glasses um, and not being able to get someone to 2020. Right, because I guess the question is, you know, when do they finally send send some send them to you? Right, when does the primary care guy look at it and say, uh, "This is above my pay grade"? How long do they follow? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, how long do you follow someone? Yeah, you know, before you make that diagnosis and then turf them out. Well, I think that you need to. It's 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 incumbent on the you know the practitioner, whether it's an ophthalmologist, optometrist, whoever, um, to kind of rule out keratoconus if you suspect it. Um, so, you know, if you say, well, the refraction's changing a bit more than average, but they're a clear crisp 2020 and, uh, and, you know, their father was a minus 10 or whatever, um, then, you know, I really don't suspect it. That's fine. But if you say, geez, you know, everything else looks pretty normal and, it, and it's just a funny story or not quite 2020, or maybe if I look with the retina scope, you know, it's a, not a perfect uh, reflex, then they should send them to somebody who can do topography. Um, if they've got topography themselves, great. Mm -hmm. They get topography, and ideally, they get you know a tomography like a Pentacam or an Orb scan or something because that'll give a little bit more information. And also, both those pieces of information allow us to track the keratoconus or track the, the the condition better. Right. So okay, well, I'll get my maps today, and maybe so funny looking, maybe not. But I'll see you back in four to six months. Right. So my dad's and then, got. You can get it again. My dad's got a question here. He's, he's waving at me wildly. So you can speak. What? Can can, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, Chris. You know, as a representative of the older practitioners that still might have a keratometer, one of yeah. the key ways to see if there was corneal distortion was that the mirrors were not clear with a keratometer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that Absolutely. still a useful yeah. instrument? Yes, absolutely. It's a very useful instrument. If you can't get them to overlap perfectly, then you've got a little bit of irregular astigmatism. And you know, unless you've got another reason for it, like a corneal scar or something, you need to suspect keratoconus. The other thing that I, you know, now I have a topographer in all my offices, but mm. um, before we had topography, and I'm in the generation where in my training and early practice, I didn't have a topographer. Uh, with the, the you know the BNL keratometer, you'd have the rings, have them looking uh, straight, and you'd have them look up just a little bit, and you could often see you could often see those mirrors separate. Mm. Everybody okay? 
Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Sure. Um, so you could also see those Myers separate a little bit, and that would just show you that there'd be inferior steepening. Right. That's kind of the poor man's um, way of looking at inferior steepening. If you suspect it, you see the Meyer is not perfect, have them look up just a little bit while you're looking at the keratometer, while you're looking through the, the eyepiece, and you can see those um, um, the, the circles separate. Right. Cool. And so, so let's move on a little bit, and now we're going to just talk about cross-linking for a second. So let's, let's say you, you've, you've made the diagnosis. Um, how do you know who a candidate is for cross-linking? Well, I mean, there are the FDA kind of approved indications, which is you know, people who are 14 to, I forget the exact number, something like 65 years old, um, with keratoconus, you've got a diagnosis of keratoconus, with progressive disease. Um, and there are a variety of, of ways to kind of suspect progression. But if you've got an increase in myopia over the past you know, year or an increase in K reading, especially K max over the past year, then those patients are candidates. Mm. Then you have to check corneal thickness. Um, and there's not an absolute number for corneal thickness pre-op, um, but there's an absolute number for corneal thickness before you actually apply the UV light, and that's 400 microns. So if you suspect that, you know, the, uh, if you think that the corneal epithelial thickness is, let's just make a number up of 50 microns, then ideally you'd like a patient whose corneal thickness is 450 microns or greater, because when you take off the 50 microns, when you remove the epithelium, you've got a 400 micron cornea that you can do the crossing. Right. In reality, uh, will often do patients down to about 400 microns kind of pre-op because when you take the epithelium off um, and then you put the riboflavin in, it actually thins it a little bit more, but then there's a thickening riboflavin that you can use after to bring the corneal thickness up to 400. Um, so one of the things that we don't want to do is you don't want to just follow patients, follow patients, follow patients and watch their thickness go from 450, 400, 350 because when you're down to right. 350, then, you know, you can't do at least the FDA-approved epi-off cross-linking. Mm. So yeah. the category, you know, and, and then that's the on-label. And then off-label, certainly I have done patients who are less than 14 years old where I've diagnosed keratoconus. I think it's progressive and their sickness is reasonable and talk to the patient, but especially the parents, to have them understand this is an off-label treatment, but you believe it's the thing to do. Um, I think those are good patients. And then lastly, there are patients where they've got keratoconus and their thickness, you know, may be kind of borderline, um, but you don't have documented progression. You mm. say, well, look, they've been, there's no documented progression, but you're suspicious that they're going to be pro progressive, especially because they're young. They're 15 or they're 20 years old. So it's a good chance they're going to progress over the next 5, 10 years. Let's do the cross-thinking now. So that's an off-label treatment because they don't have you know, a kind of a documented progression, but that's another patient that I would seriously consider. And the reason that I would do it before rather than waiting is if you wait another six months and then they, you know, the corneal thickness goes down to 350, and you say, oh, now I've got documented progression, but I can't do it anymore because you're too thin. Right. So it sounds like you're between a rock and a hard place there that you you want to make sure that you catch them before the thickness is dropping but it's, they might need to drop before you get the documented progression. You have to really keep an eye on it and get that sweet spot in order to, to give that patient the most benefit possible. That's correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. because if they're not progressing and, and, you, and you happen to know the next 20 years they're not going to progress, then you wouldn't do it because you know, the, the procedure is, is really indicates a stop progression. Right. Having said that, a few, maybe 10 or 20% of patients will actually improve their vision, which is good. I certainly don't tell people that's that's what's expected, but sometimes you get that as an added benefit. Icing on the cake. Right. <laughs> but how, <laughs> yeah, how, do you, right. how do you sort of explain it to patients, though, sort of the, pro, the pros and cons of doing this in, in a way that they can relate to and understand? Well, I mean, for the most of these patients understand that their vision is getting worse. And, of course, ideally they've been diagnosed before and you're kind of just following them along. And so they know that they've got this condition. They know it's causing thinning and irregularity. And they realize, hey, my vision's getting worse and worse. And if you tell them, well, you know, Mr. Jones, if it keeps getting worse and worse and worse, you're no longer going to be 
able to be fit with your contacts. It won't be comfortable anymore. Right. And then you're going to need you're going to need surgery, most likely a cornea transplant. Mm-hmm. And cornea transplant's a big deal, and blah 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 blah. And you go through that. Um, and then they say, well, I don't want a cornea transplant. And you say, well, we don't want to do one on you either, unless we really <laughs> have to. And the be- and the best way to stop progression is with this cross-linking procedure. There's no guarantee, blah, 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 this and that. Um, but, you know, it's been around for 15 years in Europe, 10 years around the world, you know, five years somewhat in the U.S., and, and now proved almost three years ago in the U.S. You know, good track record, does a good job. Um, and, uh, and and this is what we think we should do for you. How do you have that discussion? Most, most people when, understand. But when you say, you know, I think you need a cornea transplant, how does that go? I mean, when do you actually make that decision? When when do you decide? How far does do things have to go before you bring that up? <laughs> oh, no, I, I bring it up. That, you know, when I go, when I diagnose a patient with keratoconus, I go through the whole kind of spectrum of treatment, you mm-hmm. know, from nothing to glasses to contacts to intacts um, to basically cross sorry, to, to transplants at that point, DLK mm. and then PK. And then we also talk about um, cross-linking as, you know, kind of one of the intermediate steps. Um, but no, I talk about transplants, so they've heard about transplants from the very beginning. And they know they would like to avoid that, and here are the ways to do it. Right. And, and before I forget, the other thing that, you know, I drum into them like 10 times a visit is not to rub their eyes. Right. Oh, of course. And I'll also tell them, yeah. And I'll also tell them, look, if you have cross thinking and you keep rubbing your eyes, it'll progress. Cross, you know, the rubbing, eye rubbing is very likely to break through any any um, benefit we get from cross thinking. So you have to stop rubbing your eyes. Do you think the fact that you, you keep patients aware of all of their potential treatment options, depending upon how the disease progresses, do you think that fact helps alleviate patient trepidation for cross-linking because obviously this is, I don't want to say it's a stopgap, but obviously you would go for cross-linking if the patient is an appropriate candidate before you would go through, go down the road to a PK. Do you think that that makes patients yeah. a little more open to that? Yes, I, yes, absolutely. Because if they think, oh, you know, this is just going to stay the same and I'll just use where my contacts forever, <laughs> that's the other option. I don't need, you know, cross-linking and then they think they've got a reasonably good option where they have to understand that it's not necessarily true. That, you know, if they can get to a point where their contacts are no longer working and then it's a transplant or, or crappy vision. Right, and uh, Paul's come back here, he's got a, another question. Yes, uh, <laughs> speaking of rubbing your eyes, do you suggest that they wear some sort of mask at night while sleeping? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. You know, um, I have not done that for the most part, unless people tell me they rub their eyes at night. Having said that, I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea. Um, you know, there's there's certainly theories and there's you know perhaps some evidence out there that people who lay on one side and have their you know, right eye, let's say, mashing into the pillow all night long, that the right eye has worse keratoconus. Um, I don't I don't think that's a bad idea. I just it's that's a harder sell. Um, but um, but but that's probably not a bad idea at all. There you go, Paul. See, we, we just thought, here we go, <laughs> making history Yeah, no, I thought about that. And it, <laughs> if a patient tells me that they do it, I say, oh, you, you need to wear a shield right. um, at nighttime. But not as my routine. But routinely, I talk about eye rubbing, but I don't talk about um, shield at bedtime. But it's probably not a bad idea. That is, is, that what, is that what you did back in the 50s, Dad? What, no, just what reminded <laughs> me because the Bruder mask wants to become a sponsor. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I'm, I'm curious because, look, back in the old days, before you had any real treatments... Yeah, but basically, uh, eye rubbing was one of the symptoms yeah. for keratoconus. So right. they, 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 they said that's what yeah. caused it. We, we were ignorant in those <laughs> days. You know, what the hell did we know? <laughs> uh, so, Chris, I have a question for you about how you work with yeah. optometrists with cross-linking. <laughs> and I know that it's currently up in the air and remains to be seen what will happen with optometrists moving ahead with this treatment. What are your thoughts on that, and how do you work with ODs in uh, with your cross-linking patients? Um, I mean, basically, you know, the ODs generally will send them to me for either a diagnosis um, or for you know potential you know management, you know, management options where they say, "Oh, I, I'm afraid they're getting worse. You know, should should you do cross-linking?" And then I'll examine the patient, and hopefully, we'll have some old uh, topographies or tomography so I can compare 
Um, but if not, I'll start my baseline measurements. And if I'm convinced that it's getting worse, even with just my one measurement from that day, um, just from old manifesto fractures and things like that, sure. then we'll talk to the patient about proceeding with cross thinking at that time. Um, if it, I'm not convinced it's, get, it's progressing, then I'll tell the patients, well, you need to be followed. You know, kind of the next time would be kind of four to six months. And if you're, you know, if you're optometrist, you know, has the um, machinery and interest and capability of doing that, great. And then when it's progressing, they'll you know, send you back to me. Or if they don't, then I'll need to see you back in four to six months, but keep seeing your optometrist for your contacts and glasses and things like that. And then once they've been cross-linked, um, and I still follow them for stability kind of initially myself, and then once I'm pretty confident that it's stable, then they can go back to their optometrist for kind of stability monitoring, and then all their, they still need their contacts and glasses and everything else. Got it. Cool. All right. Well, I guess, Chris, thanks so much for this. This has been a, a very uh, informative session. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope uh, if people have additional questions, they come on to ODYR and maybe we can pass them on to you because I, I know your lecture has sure. been a hit and uh, I'm sure people have a million questions. You know, this, you're, you're, you're doing stuff that's pretty cutting edge and a lot of ODs are just not familiar with it yet. So I'm sure they have a million questions yeah. for you. I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Well, thanks again. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a great welcome. Day. Have, have great a good weekend. Saturday. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. It is Saturday, right? <laughs> I don't remember what day it is. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, we're getting a little punch drunk here doing all this stuff. But uh, yeah, so that was really good information. He, uh, he's, you know, one of the leaders in the field. So it was sort of, you know, nice to have somebody like that come onto the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's see. So we have a few minutes until... <laughs> I see this thing. I'm like, what is this thing in, in my eye? So let me just put it here. I, I was like flashing off of oh, this. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I'm like, what is, oh. It's my glass of water. <laughs> you could have just told me to move I it. I didn't. I was like, is that what I, I couldn't tell? Like, is that what I'm seeing? Oh, yeah. So anyway, we can leave I'm here. I, 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 I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Don't say you trust me. You're not because Paul. Then I, I trust you. Oh, don't throw your dad under the bus. <laughs> Sponsor time. Uh, oh, right. Thank you. So let me, uh, let me, let me punch it up here. Um, so as Paul reminded me, we have to let, remind people about the exhibit hall. So let me uh, pull this on up here. There we go. So I will urge all people at CE Wire to please, please, please visit the exhibit hall. Um, you know, the, we couldn't put on the conference without our sponsors. And at the exhibit hall, some of them put together some pretty deep discounts for you. So let me sort of run through what we've got going on here. Um, so first and foremost, I need to thank Marco because Marco is the sponsor of this live stream. So they've been doing it since the beginning. So thank you so much to Marco uh, for participating again this year. And Oculus, so again, Oculus is also one of the sponsors who's been with us for the, the duration. And their deal is $3,000 off any device in their booth. So run, <laughs> run to the booth. Um, you know, they, they definitely have some good deals going on that will expire at the end of the conference, so be aware of that. So Vision Web, makers of the uh, Uprise EHR. So again, this is a web-based EHR. No more mucking about with Windows and having computers crash. It's all web-based. You could even use Chromebooks if you feel like it. Um, and it's all managed centrally. So it's also one of the newer generations of EHR. I won't use jargon because Paul got nervous before, but it doesn't use older technology like Flash. It uses HTML5, so it's, uh, it's certainly on the cutting edge of EHR, so definitely go check it out. Um, so Zeiss is a sponsor of the conference as well. They're having 30% savings uh, on a bunch of uh, different devices as well as combo promotions if you buy multiple uh, units. Um, so definitely check out their booth. They have the details for you in there as well. So I certainly do not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I only know the high level stuff. The rest is like I have no idea, but they can tell you in the booth. Uh, EMS the same, same way. They have really great deals going on. So EMS is a division of Lombard. They have used uh, equipment, or should I say um, pre-owned. I guess used isn't a word that people like to use anymore. Pre-enjoyed. Pre-owned, pre-loved. <laughs> right, um, pre-loved pre equipment. So yeah, so go check it out. Uh, they they have a bunch of Zeiss equipment, um, and they're even throwing in an extra year warranty for a thousand bucks, which is fantastic. You can see these uh, lane packages as well. Um, 
So NeuroLens, uh, we just heard Whitney Hauser tell us all about her story, which was kind of amazing mm -hmm. about how this you know, can, can transform people's lives if they have, uh, in her case, it was her son with chronic headaches. Um, so definitely check out the tech. We're going to be talking to David Geffen tomorrow more about the technology because, again, above my pay grade, it's complicated stuff. It has to do with, with microprisms and they generate uh, lenses from it. But. But if you read the article David wrote for Optometry Times in our December issue, it was crystal will, clear. <laughs> then you will understand. We have some pictures yeah. there of, of what uh, what you're doing, and he describes the process. So if yeah. you have any questions, I highly recommend you go to our website and take a look at it. Yep. So we'll check that out. Uh, Lombard again, sponsor of uh, the conference. You can see they have a whole bunch of lane packages on and on and on, um, where you're getting some pretty deep discounts like. You can see savings of 12765 savings of up to $7,000, so really deep savings. And again, the equipment manufacturers do this because they don't want to have to carry equipment anywhere. It's a huge nightmare to actually transport the stuff to a trade show, set it up. and It's expensive. It can easily cost mid-five figures for one of these booths to set up, easily. Um, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars just to transport the equipment and set it up. So, so you have to sell, move a lot of product while you're at whatever trade show you do. You're exhibiting at. You do. Oh, of course, one of my pro tips is uh, if you want to buy stuff right off the show floor, wait till five minutes before it closes because they do not want to box that stuff up again. <laughs> you have to send back to wherever to the central location. They'd rather you take it away or you know send it to your office. So, so hang out and at the booths and do yep. some shopping and then keep everybody on tenter hooks and then dash in as everybody's trying to leave is what you're saying. It's like buying a car on December 31st. And you know, they're all swooping up. Yeah. <laughs> Got it, it. Or buy here because again you get the savings built in because they don't have to carry equipment here and our booth doesn't you know really cost as much as like a booth at the expo. <laughs> so for them their overhead is, is very low so they can easily you know pass the savings on to you. And you can see all the deals there. So ABB, largest uh, distributor of contact uh, lenses in the country, and in fact, the largest seller overall of contact lenses in the, in the country, as far as I understand. Uh, they sell more lenses than anybody, and they are a sponsor of the conference, so go check them out. They sell, they have a lab too, they do uh, RGPs, but again, if you're here listening to me, you might not be interested in RGPs because you're probably in Las Vegas right now. At GSLS. But you never know. You might yes. have someone who is very enthusiastic and is attending that meeting and also tuning in here. Or you could have people who just hate to go to Las Vegas and didn't want to go. That could be. So you never know. There you go. So Lance Leasing. So if you're buying stuff, you know, you need financing for your equipment. So Lance Leasing, um, so they offer financing. They, they're specialists actually in, in uh, this space. So they understand exactly what you're going through. Um, you know, you won't have to explain to them what an OCT is. <laughs> they get it. Um, and so they have two promotions going on where they'll pay your documentation fees and bundle packages if you buy more than one piece of equipment here. Uh, iCare Pro, so if you run a practice and you need marketing help, they're, they're the guys to go to, not just with building a website, but also helping your social media presence, helping you with SEO and so forth. So if you feel like outsourcing all this stuff because you really just don't want to deal, they're the people to do it. And I would recommend actually outsourcing this anyway because, God, as you know, Gretchen, what a hassle. Uh, social media <laughs> all day, every day. What a hassle. But um, very effective when done right. When done right, very effective. When not done right, you know, very ulcerogenic. <clears throat> I know from experience. Yes. Um, Pivotal. So uh, the, the latest buying group that has come on the scene, they're only about <coughs> a year old. Um, very young and aggressive and, you know, cutting great deals with a variety of vendors. Um, as well as they have educational materials online, it's pretty cool. Um, so you should definitely check them out. Um, they, uh, I did an interview with them. We're going to run that later when when my voice goes. Actually, I did it yesterday, so we can we can run that one, um, so people can hear all about them. So good company, very friendly. What I liked about them, you know, they they came on last year. Uh, you know, they they actually launched on OD Wire. We were the first place that they started advertising where they built their their audience. But what I loved about them was they were scared because they started growing quickly and they were smart enough to realize that you can't just grow quickly. Sometimes you have to put the brakes on and take it slow and, and build carefully. And figure it so, out. And figure it out so you don't have you know te these teething pains. Um, so I appreciated that about them. They were very thoughtful in the way they rolled out. Now they're, you know, they're getting 
uh, very big and uh, the deals are great. The education is really cool. So definitely check them out uh, in their booth. So we spoke with Leo Hadley earlier, uh, his vision equipment company. Um, so he's been with us since the beginning. 20% um, off his lowest prices on uh, Santinelli Edgers uh, and 10% off on, on any item that he has in stock right now. So again, he has uh, pre-loved equipment. Pre-loved. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he services everything and their techs do an amazing job. I mean, they can strip down an edger to its, literally to its bare components and then rebuild it to make it like new. Um, and his, he said that he's actually talked people through the process on the phone of repairing their edger, which... Uh, That's pretty intense. It is, it is pretty kind of amazing. So they, they, they service, uh, you know, everything that they sell and they're, they're really good at what they do. So check them out. Uh, Acuity Eye Care Group. So we had Ben Chudner on before talking all about private equity and optometry with a very open and frank discussion. I appreciated his interview. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, that Ben is pretty transparent like that. Ben will give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. And I think people appreciate that. Yeah, he was. Uh, he did a great job and really trying and really laid out the differences between the different groups. So his group is Acuity Eye Care Group. Um, which is one of these these private equity groups that that they buy practices up, um, and uh, if you haven't, you should listen to his lecture. And I haven't heard it yet either. But that's, you know, of, of all the sixty credits or whatever it is at CEYR, there are always a few that I hone in on that I really want to listen to after I escape from here, and <laughs> that's one of them um, because he's going over the entire landscape of what's going on with all the different groups in private equity um, in eye care. So I'm really curious to hear it. I totally agree. And of course, the one and only Optometry Times. Oh, so, I get to uh, promote my own publication. Yes, here. so this is the one thing that you can feel comfortable promoting. So, well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, Optometry Times. Yes, we are by practitioners for practitioners. We are very focused on the practical nuggets you need. So that's why our tagline is practical chairside advice, and we come to you. However you like to consume content, if it's print, we got you. If it's digital, we got you. Every piece of news we have is on social media, and we primarily put our news on Twitter. We're also on Facebook. We've got Instagram. We've got YouTube. We send you an email three times a week. And what Adam said earlier about I tell people to throw out our issues, I, I do. I want people to read them and then get rid of them because a lot of doctors stack up their journals because there are a lot of publications in this space and they're all great and everybody should read them but that's a lot of time so I've seen lots of doctors where their issues stack up I don't want you to do that read it when we send it to you hopefully you'll be able to apply that information to the yep. next patient in your chair and then get rid of it so yes it's the the Marie Kondo theory right does does optometry time spark joy sitting in your office. Well, it I does help, not after you read it. But so. it sparks joy in general. Maybe not if it's stacked up on your desk. I see. But if it, you turn out that you want to go read an article like that NeuroLens article from David Geffen. There you go. Uh, you can find it all on our website. So there you go, optometrytimes.com. Good deal. So we have another guest coming on, don't we? We do. We have Dr. Jen Lyerly. I'm really excited to talk with her. She recently joined our board. And she is partners with Daryl Glover for Defocus Media Podcasts. And she's in practice in North Carolina. She also is a blogger. And she's got a lot of experience with blogging. So she's a very interesting person to talk to. And she, her talk finished up a little while ago. Let me look at the list here. She finished up, what, just now? I guess so. I'm not doing my math correctly. Oh, did she? What time is it? Oh, so it's, three hours? Uh, so she's, we might want to give her a minute or yeah, two. Yeah, let's, let's give her a minute. I don't so her talk is want... finishing up right now. She was talking about aesthetics and ocular surface disease, and there's been a lot of talk in the industry about that over the last couple of years. And I think that's really interesting, and I'd love to hear what she has to say about it. Well, cool. So we'll, yeah, we'll give her a minute or two, though. I don't want to stress her out in case, you know, people are asking questions and stuff. What's going on, actually, out in the chat room? I haven't... Uh, not a lot. Not it's a lot. been a little quiet lately. Ben Chudner was on there talking with Steve about uh, selling the practices and what you can expect. Kathy Mistrota popped on and <laughs> she was having trouble. And Steve is, is looking to be your new tech geek. 
He was giving her advice. He suggested <laughs> that she try a new browser, and it worked. So Steve was. Thank you, Steve. Steve is now your IT troubleshooting support, <laughs> which is fabulous. Thank you, Steve. He got Kathy up and running. So it's been uh, it's been a little quiet in there. If you're hanging out on the live stream, say hello because it's nice to know that we're not talking out into the ether. Yeah. People, you know, they come in and out all day. And from what I've seen, so many people are attending the lectures this morning. I was shocked actually by, because typically, as you know, with CE Wire, you can come later and, and watch the, you know, the archives. And most states are okay with that. Um, some states are not. So I have a feeling you got a lot of people from New York in there this morning who were watching the lectures. So New York um, is not down with, uh, so, so this needs to be a live CE credit. Though. Right, so there are a few states, to, if you want to get live, live credits, you actually physically have to show up so you can interact with the speaker. Yeah. Steve is calling himself the new IT God. Now see, I was calling him tech geek, and I think Steve prefers the term <laughs> IT God. It does have a very different connotation. I, I think it might. One is sort of I, nerdy, one is not. So, all right, Steve, you're the IT God, I bow to you. <laughs> I will right. call you IT God. All right, well, let's, uh, let me see if we can get Dr. Lyerly here and go from there. Hello. Hey, Jen, it's Adam Farkas and Gretchen Bailey. How you doing? Hi, I'm great. How are you guys? Hi, Jen. How, Hi, was, how was your talk? It just finished up, right? Yes, we just wrapped. It was fantastic. Um, thank you guys for anyone who's listening that uh, joined this on it. But we had a lot of great discussion in the comments section, of the chat section, a lot of really great questions that were asked. So hopefully everyone's very inspired for Monday morning when they go in and their patients <laughs> ask them about their beauty product regimen. Fabulous. We love to hear about attendee engagement and interaction with the speakers because so, some people don't like to ask questions. Yeah, some people get very nervous and shy, so they don't ask questions. But I'm glad that people, you know, you know really piped up and, and interacted with you. That's fantastic. So, yeah, no, it was a really great feedback. So, so Jen, bef before I actually ask you any questions, I, I'd like to make a comment. Okay, uh -oh. I'd like to. I'd like, like a statement. I'd like to, uh, this is a statement. And my statement is this most men of which I'm one, know absolutely nothing about the topic that you spoke about this morning. I mean, like, less than nothing. When I walk into my bathroom and I, and I see, you know, some of the stuff that my wife has, I look at this and I'm like, I don't even know what this is. Like, I wouldn't even know what to ask around things like, like makeup and everything else. So I, I commend you for doing these kinds of lectures because there is a, a portion of the population, literally, who, we have no idea about you know anything to do with ocular aesthetics at all so well that's interesting because how does that apply i'm going to piggyback on your question yeah. adam well your statement yes <laughs> so jen have you had any experience with talking with male ods about this are male ods interested in learning more about aesthetics and eye care and are they proactive in talking with patients or is this more of a female od discussion I think that men are starting to get more aware of the fact that, hey, my patients need me. I definitely have had plenty of male colleagues tell me, hey, my female patient is asking me about mascaras, and right. I don't feel like I know anything about it. So that the patient's desire to get medical information from you about their beauty products is there. Um, but I, the big disservice that I think male and female ODs alike have done uh, primarily in the past has been to say, oh, we'll just stop using mascara right. or just stop using that product and your eyes will feel better. And the truth is that's how we lose a patient. That's a patient right. that right. say, well, they're not interested in actually helping me. They just don't want to hear about it. I'm either A, going to find another doctor that can help me or B, turn to an online resource and not bother asking you again because you've literally been no help. That's so a great that's, point. I think the philosophy in the past that we really have to overcome. And then, it, you know, speaking about men, men are big beauty uh, product purchasers, believe me or not. Uh, we've seen the numbers on men using, like, okay, think about besides makeup. Okay, we're going to throw that out. But beauty products also include lotions, face washes, you know, the, the things that men are putting on their skin every day. And when you look head-to-head -head at how much money is being spent on beauty products, Men spend about $135,000 in their lifetime on beauty products and beauty procedures. 
Botox or Brotox included. In Brotox? <laughs> Brotox? I love that. That is so funny. Okay, Adam, we need to talk about your beauty regimen. I know. I, so what is your face wash? What is your body wash, your shampoo? I'm suddenly feeling very obsolete in this whole discussion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Brotox. Brotox, I like that. I love that. <laughs> so that's great, Jen, that it sounds like your male colleagues are getting more interested in learning about that because I think you're absolutely right. Even if what your patient is asking you doesn't appeal to you personally or you have no idea what the patient is talking about, you're a healthcare professional. It's your job to figure it out. It right. is your job to be able to answer your patient's questions even if you don't wear mascara. Right. Or at least be able to, to point out some resources to get the person that help. We all aren't going to be experts on everything. Right. And we've been referring to our colleagues for a vision therapy specialty or a, a specialty um, for low vision, for example, when it's a little outside of our area of expertise. And ocular aesthetics is really no different, but there's a few fundamentals that I think as people kind of get more into the topics, they realize they already are knowledgeable and versed about, like BAK as a preservative, which... If you're prescribing glaucoma medications, you're talking about BAK preservatives and their potential side effects like chronic redness and chronic dry eye that your patients are going to experience. Well, those same preservatives are in many of our patients' makeup and mascara products. Their red eye drops, their lash growth serum. So these are things that aren't that far into what we've been talking to patients about already. Right. Well, I guess my, my question would be, you know, from a, I've never, I have never actually, now I'm thinking about it, I've never gone into a doctor's office before where on the intake form they started asking me about things like that. Um, and I've never actually gotten the conversation started either. So I'm kind of wondering, how do you, how do you get that conversation started with the patient? I think one of the big things that we've done wrong, right, is ignoring this whole facet of potential offenders that people are getting exposed to in their uh, daily lives. Mm -hmm. And we have all these patients, theoretically 30 million Americans based on study results that have chronic dry. Um, and we're ignoring the whole piece of why they might have chronic ocular surface disease and dry. So uh, I'm not going to say this idea is mine because it's a genius idea. I saw this from Dr. Laura Perriman and she said, tell your, your patients that you have ocular surface disease and, and signs when you're in the exam room to come into their next appointment and bring a bag of everything that they use in and around their eyes, every single product, wow. whether that's a face wash or a lotion, because yes, putting it on the intake form would be another great call out, but many times people will forget all the stuff that they're using around their eyes. Um, and right. so having them bring that bag in and you can go through the ingredient list on those products and point out the preservatives on there or the ingredients that are offenders can make such a big difference for the patient. Mm. That that's is a really a great, great idea. idea. It's kind of like asking patients to bring in their little grab bag of different types of rewetting drops. I bet you, right. Jen, you have patients coming in with shopping bags full of stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, you think about like, uh, when, I, when you tell patients, bring in all your old glasses and they bring in like 50 pair, you know, right. like, yes, these are big bags that are coming. But those are, the, each one of them might be a contributing risk factor, especially on these patients that you feel like, boy, I'm treating their dry eye and they aren't feeling any better, they aren't getting any better. Well, there might be 20 other things that they're doing to their eyes that's negating every good thing that you're helping them with. And you have no idea unless you have that conversation with the patient. Right. Exactly. Are patients receptive or do they think you're crazy? <laughs> no, our pa patients in today's day and age are actually really, really receptive to this idea because talking about beauty products is so prevalent in their day to day. With social media, with Instagram, with Facebook, with Twitter, they are bombarded with advice knowledge, if you will. Sometimes it's misinformation, not necessarily good information Absolutely. about beauty products. Um, and that you've seen this huge movement in organic beauty and talking about preservatives, talking about parabens and all these other risk factors. So people are primed now to understand that's a discussion that's going to take place. But I don't think they're really primed to think that it's happening in the medical setting. And that's what we as optometrists really need to own more. They can't right. be getting all their information about beauty products from 20 year old beauty bloggers and ex right. expect it to be good information. Right, right. So it really is the doctor's job to attempt to bridge the gap there and have that conversation. That's really good advice. Do you, do you sell retail products in your own office? 
So we do not retell. And this is actually a, a decision that I personally made not to retell uh, any products outside of we do a, a macular vitamin for uh, macular degeneration and a fish oil supplement because our patients were having a hard time with like fishy burp or things like that. Mm. So this is the only two products that I'm, I'm retailing for patient convenience. Um, and the reason why I've chosen to avoid retailing any sort of mascara, lash grow serum, face wash product, any of those things, is one, I think it sometimes interferes with my patient's um, understanding of where I'm coming from and making this recommendation. I had seen a, a survey recently published actually by Cooper Vision. It said that 76% of patients are would not be interested or would not buy a product that was sold in their doctor's office. It almost comes across sometimes as a conflict of interest to the patient. Huh. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's where any of us want it to be. We're, we're reselling this because we believe in it, but I don't want to confuse the message to my patients anyway. I'm making recommendations because I really want them to do this thing. And if they're going to be put off by the fact that I'm retailing it, well, I'd rather them just go and buy it online or at the store because right. I really want them to get it. Right. And that way you don't, the message isn't getting lost and the patient isn't perceiving you as here, buy this thing and buy it from me and buy it right now. Right. Um, and I think it's just something that we all need to consider. Some patients or some practices very successfully retail products, but if you're a practice that's retailing products and you feel like you've had some negativity or some pushback, these study results are pretty eye opening about the way patients perceive that. Right. That is really interesting. So I guess the, so I guess the big question though is if you're not selling the product in house, how do you really know what they're going to end up with? I mean, I guess that's it's I a, guess it's you a control don't know, issue. I guess but you that's don't know. patient education. That's where right. patient education patient comes into play. Patient education, right? Yep. I do. We do have a handout that we give to patients um, that lists great resources, online resources like pettyvore.com and ewr.com or ewg excuse me dot com that give them. Um, places where they can learn more about the products that they're using, and then also lists of preservatives and products that I would want them to avoid so that they're empowered to turn around the ingredient list of the product that they just picked up at the grocery store and read it. I think that is much better long-term patient education than saying, like, oh, use product X. What if the formula changes? What if it gets discontinued? I want to empower my patients to be informed and make the right decision um, and know that if they choose something, that and they didn't read the ingredient list okay well i my doctor warned me about that you know that's a really great point that you're empowering your patients as opposed to just buy what i say that's i really like that that that's that's great yep i like that can i just ask uh, again from the the standpoint of someone who's totally ignorant what's the biggest offenders in terms of cosmetic products and dry eye like what would you say is like your top two or three yeah um (laughs) Well, the, the number one offender that I think that have long-term devastating side effects is actually Accutane. Mm. Um, so isotretinoin or Accutane, many of our young patients will use it for a couple months, maybe a year. And it, it gets prescribed by dermatologists and things like that. It's like, oh, while you're on this, you're going to have dry eye. But there's a miscommunication on the fact that that dry eye is permanent. It's for the rest of your life mm. because it's causing structural changes to my bony glands that are going to perpetuate onwards. So I, I, it's a commonly prescribed medication that we really don't blink twice about and prescribing to our, you know, our kids. And then they have lasting long-term lifelong side effects from it. Right. Um, another one that's a really, really common offender are over the counter products um, like lash growth serums. So uh, basically false lashes, lash growth serums, lash perming, all of those, there's a whole industry around eyelashes right that now. That is huge and right now. all of them have some, some potential, yeah, some really big potential side effects that aren't getting talked about like they should be. Wait, what are these things? It's serums <laughs> to put on your eyelashes to make them grow and, and to make them fuller. Do they work? I haven't tried them, but well, some people work. say they do, but oh. at what cost? <laughs> huh. mm-hmm. So there, um, we know that the a common side effect of glaucoma medication, prostaglandin, prostaglandin and analog category, is thicker, fuller, right. longer lashes. Oh, and so we've seen right. that in our glaucoma patients for years and years and years. Well, 
you know, no big surprise. What looks like a side effect to some is a pro to others. <laughs> um, and so we saw Latisten kind of spin out from this, which right. is marketed specifically as a last growth serum. Um, but, of course, it's still a prostaglandin, so it has all the other prostaglandin side effects, too, like chronic bibomyeline dysfunction and chronic redness. Right. Now, from that kind of same chemical makeup is what's called isopropyl cloprostinate. It's the main ingredient in many of the over-the-counter last growth serums. Mm. So it functions, it acts like a prostaglandin analog. It's going to give last growth results, just like we know prostaglandin analogs do. But there'll be a certain percent of the population that's going to get chronic redness, eyelid swelling, uh, dry eye side effects from it. And it's not really listed on any packaging as a potential side effect risk. And if you don't know your patient is using a lash serum like that, then you won't be properly addressing the patient's clinical problem. Right, right. They could be coming in with chronic redness and irritation, and you're just chasing your tail because they're putting something on their eyes every single night that's causing them to have this reaction. Wow. Yeah. And you see, I wouldn't have even known what that stuff was. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. No bro talks for no, you. Yeah, That's I mean, I needed to turn into my lecture. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, no, seriously, I do because yeah, I, I know there. I, I don't. I don't think I'm unique, right? I mean, at least among. I mean, look at my father. Obviously, he wouldn't know anything. But even among Gen X people like me, I, I don't know. You know. But if you're a metrosexual, you would know. Yeah, I guess. Then you'd be into that and manscaping and all of that. That that is true. I don't know that it's a generational thing. I think it's more of a personality thing Mm. and what you want to do. I mean, I'm sure that there are some male ODs who are very up on that if they're very into, um, I don't want to call it beauty, but there's probably a better word for that. The thing is, though, I think everyone does need to actually be into it, though, and understand it because you're doing people a disservice. And that's that's what really worries me when I, so that's why, yes, I do have to sit through your lecture (laughs) because it it really Mm -hmm. is doing people a disservice if, if you, you know, just don't even know about this at all. Right. So. And if you aren't up on it as a clinician, then you can get some information from somebody like Jen and share that and Absolutely. at least offer your patients another resource to find it if yep. you aren't totally up on it yourself. Yep. Absolutely. So, Jen, the way you... I view it is, are you going to specialize? Are you treating ocular surgery? Do you consider yourself to be someone who's offering dry treatments? Well, ocular aesthetics is just a branch of that. It's an arm of treating ocular surface disease. And you you see it embraced among ophthalmologists and optometrists as a specialty and doctors that are practicing real, true ocular surface disease treatments. Right. And so, so Jen, before we let you go, I just want to know all about what's going on with you outside of outside of the world of dry eye. Talk just a little bit about your blog and stuff. So what, what's what's that all about? Yeah, so I, since 2011, I've been over at Idolatry Blog, and actually this whole passion project about aesthetics came around because I was having so many patients ask me questions about mascara and eyeliners, and I didn't know the answers, so I was self-researching, um, and, and that kind of got borne out through writing blog articles and then inspired kind of this bigger investigation with doing now lecturing on the topic. Um, so Idolatry Blog basically is a place that, I anything that comes up where I feel like, gosh, the public really needs to know more about this. I didn't know about it as a doctor like I should, so I'm researching a lot and I'm going to put the information out there. It's a patient resource, so it's a place that I hope everyone feels like, okay, you know what, I don't have time to write an article about this, but, oh, uh, Idolatry has an article about lash growth serums here. I'll refer my patients over to that. And so it's written for patients to understand and consume the information, but also links to studies. So they're getting real medical and scientific data. That's super cool. You know, cool. outside of blogging, um, I also podcast just like you. <laughs> so uh, I'm a co-host of the Deep Focus Media podcast. Yep. And we're always trying to get people who are exploring new and exciting niches and specialties within optometry. So we've talked to a lot of docs on the show that are really passionate about ocular surface disease, uh, Dr. Laura Perriman, Dr. Leslie O'Dell, for example. Um, and so we're going to, of course, be bringing more content on that. But one of the big things that we're excited about um, this year has been, a, especially there's such a shift in focus on myopia this year. Have you guys been feeling that? Yep, yep, especially with Essilor bringing out their uh, their task force and looking at it. And I say it's high time that all of this takes a bigger 
uh, not no pun intended, but focus on the <laughs> uh, on the optometry stage because right. myopia has been a concern for a while. And I think it's just like dry eye has come to the forefront now, myopia is as well. Yep. So I'm really excited about this year kind of bringing on a lot of guests to, talk, to basically normalize myopia management. It's a real thing that we all should be doing that the public as a whole needs to know about. Um, and, and for it to stop being this kind of more underground thing that maybe one in 20 people, one in 30 people has ever even heard about or considers a real science. So right. time to, to embrace and own myopia and what we can do to help slow it down. Very cool. Well, you know what? Uh, when the archive of this interview goes up, and it surely will, um, I'll put right underneath it the links to your blog so everyone can actually you know, quickly get over to it and bookmark it so they can have it when they want to point their patients to it. Thank you. That's so awesome. Excellent, Jen. Thank you so much for talking with us. I look forward to seeing you soon, and I'm glad that your talk went well. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Meredith is going to sign you up for bro talk. There you go. I, ha I have to say I, that as many times as possible because it, it amuses I, me. I, yeah. So, but th these are the kind of lectures that I'm glad that we have at CUI because I guarantee you that there is a huge segment of the population that has no idea. You know, I, I don't know if she discussed it during her talk. Oh wait, do you want me to turn your one? One of the main offenders with tear problems is, is the grease that's used to take off eye makeup. Oh, I don't know if you heard Paul. Paul was talking about eye makeup remover, that it usually has an oil component, and that can create a problem for the tear film, you're saying? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It'll break it up, and they'll coat the lens. If they, if they don't wear daily wear disposables, lenses will get, would get, get coated from it. I will be sure to report back, because I, will be, I used it last night, I used it tonight, and I wear continuous wear lenses, so if my lens oh, gets boy. coated, we'll know why. You got the answer. <laughs> Am I going to speak to Art Epstein? Uh, yes. Yeah, he changed so, his, he's, so, he's on at, at 11. Yeah, so at well, I might have to go greet our mystery guest. That's true, yes. Yeah, so we'll, so be we'll having, do a little swap. We'll be having visitors coming. So hang on, before you swap, maybe while you guys swap, I'm going to actually flip this on because I want to talk to people again about what's going on in our exhibit hall. So hang on one second. Sure. And all right, so let me, let me cut all of your mics because no one wants to hear you moving around. So. That's Gretchen. Okay. Okay. So y you guys can do your thing and I can talk. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, Art Epstein's with the competition, right? <laughs> I, so I. <laughs> so. Yeah, so we'll we'll have Art here in a, in about six minutes or so. I think he's standing by. So, uh, but in the meantime, um, let me uh, just quickly run through what's going on here at the exhibit hall. So, I always like to implore everyone to visit the exhibit hall. I do it over and over again, and I know I sound like a broken record, but we rely on the sponsors to keep the conference going. Without them, we'd be in real trouble. So, um, you know, if you very least, if you're interested in any equipment, please just stop by and take a look. Um, the deals that a lot of them are running are gigantic. Um, you can save thousands. So again, just quickly running through, Marco uh, is the sponsor of this live stream, and thanks to them, we couldn't really do it without them, and they've been there since the beginning. And in fact, I tell the story that Marco sort of inspired us to do the conference entirely because, you know, I was kicking around the idea of something like C Wire, um, and Marco the folks at Marco finally said, why don't you just do it? Give it a shot. Yeah, sure, we'll be behind it. And sure enough, they were. And so we, you know, we're incredibly grateful to Marco. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, so Oculus is here, and they are giving th uh, offering $3,000 off any, any device, uh, and that ends at the uh, end of the conference. So we've got to go for it. VisionWeb, makers of the Uprise EHR. Again, the latest generation EHR uh, that's out there. So take a look at that. Web-based, don't have to worry about Windows and... Windows nonsense because <laughs> it's all thin client and you can even use a Chromebook to access it um, and it's all managed centrally so Uprise much easier than the old client server based products. Uh, Zeiss, so Zeiss is here and they have deep deals on some of their equipment here up to 30% on Cirrus, Claris, Humphrey Field Analyzer and the IOL Master and combo promotions as well so go into their booth and take a look. 
EMS, as you know, they have uh, refurbished equipment in their division of Lombard now. You can see the deals they have running on Cirrus. Uh, an extra year warranty for only a thousand bucks. Also got these great lane packages going too, so check them out. Uh, NeuroLens, we heard Whitney Hauser tell a great story about her family and, and what NeuroLens has done for them. Um, so this is a, a, a device that um, can prescribe microprisms uh, and they make the lenses as well. Um, and so we're gonna have David Geffen on to talk a little more about it tomorrow, about the technology behind it, it's brand new. Um, you know, I only learned about it, I guess, last year, and so it's one of the newest products we have advertised on the site. Um, so, uh, again, Lombard's the sponsor, so they have um, deep deals as well. You can see the lane packages up on the screen. Um, you know, we interviewed them earlier. They service what they sell, and they have reps that come on out and train you on the equipment as well, which is great because some of the equipment is very high-tech. Uh, you can see... Uh, the kinds of different things they sell. They sell basically all different lines, um, so check them out as well. ABB, the largest distributor of contact lenses, and in fact the largest seller of contact lenses in the country altogether. Um, so they are here as well. You want to check out their booth. And remember, they do. Uh, they have a lab. They do gas perms as well. They're not just about soft lenses. Lance Leasing, so if you need to finance equipment, Lance uh, knows the industry, eye care industry inside and out. You want to explain to them what the piece of equipment is that you want to finance is, this is what they do. Um, so they're, you know, they, they know I care and uh, they have deals going here where they'll pay your documentation fees and they'll even lower your rate if you bundle more than one device. Um, I care Pro, so if you have a practice to market, let them handle it. You can have, you can outsource to them, they'll, they'll build your website, but also do SEO, handle your social media, do all the kinds of things that are just uh, so irritating to do on your own because they're so time consuming. Uh, and, and they do it well, uh, which is something that if you sort of do it yourself, you may not you know, get an optimal presence online. Pivotal, newest buying group that's out there. They're about a year old, very aggressive, deep deals with different uh, companies. Um, it's free to join, so feel free to sign up. There's absolutely no obligation. They also offer education through their portal. Um, very cool company, young, young, aggressive, um, and really in touch with their, the, the, their members, um, which is great. So check them out. Um, so Vision Equipment, we had Leo Hadley on the phone before. 20% off on all uh, Santinelli Edgers and 10% off anything they have in stock. Uh, so they've again been, they've been, Leo's been with us from the beginning. So, you know, we, we uh, have, Paul mentioned, we never had a complaint ever about uh, their service in the history of the time they've been an OD wire, which is now a very, very long time that Leo has been working with us. Uh, an Acuity Eye Care Group, um, so this is a private equity group, they buy practices. We had Ben Chudner on before, he's giving a lecture as well about private equity. Basically describing the different groups and how they're not all equal. So private equity isn't just some monolithic thing, you know, it's, it's uh, a variety of things. And you might just want to go check it out um, to learn more about what they are and the kind of practices that they acquire uh, and learn more about private equity in general. And finally, Optometry Times, we have Gretchen Bailey here with us. And she's been helping out today, doing the interviews. Um, so practical chairside advice. Um, as Gretchen says, this is a journal that's meant to read and to soak in and then toss. <laughs> so, um, so we thank Optometry Times for sponsoring the conference today. It's a great, it's a great rag. Great job, Gretchen. <laughs> um, I find it to be one of the most accessible of the journals, not only in its size, but just, you know, in the bite-sized bits of information. You don't feel like you have to spend an afternoon. So, you know, I think everyone should, should definitely check it out. And certainly it's low effort to check out, right? You don't feel like it's a huge commitment. So go for it. And by the way, if, if you see their booth at a trade show, definitely take a copy or two. That's what they're there for. So, and say hi to Gretchen if you see her there because she gets stuck there sometimes too. I do. I do. <laughs> and the price is right. Yes, and the price is right. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, get this show on the road here with... Uh, Am I live now? Uh, no, you are not. Maybe. Hold on. Possibly. Let's kill you. And... Let me get Dad live here. Okay, now you're live. Okay. You're here. Hallelujah. Why is there a straw in my field of view? Oh. <laughs> Oops. Whoops. 
It's empty. Whoops, it's empty. Throw and that, it out. And that's like the in, insult to injury. <laughs> Not only is he putting this up on a <laughs> like it's empty. <laughs> All right. And um, so let's get going here. Uh, who's up next? Is it Art? Art Epstein. And to show you... If he makes it because he <laughs> was going to catch no, no, a plane. He's, he's, he's ready. He's here. He's here? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me... Uh, to show you how prepared I am for this... Okay. Yeah. I don't even know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> well, we always find something. Uh. By the way, you saw up on the screen before I ordered a pizza, so if that... I saw. Yeah. So I'm on door duty. Yes. Our mystery guest, too, should be hopefully arriving. I hope he comes. I keep my eyes peeled. Doors open. Am I? You're not lying. <laughs> Whoa. That's, that's, quite a, that's quite a phone. I'm going to try that wow. again. I'm going to try, try that again. That was disturbing. <laughs> okay, hold on. Skype has been acting very strange today. There we go. Speaking of strange, it just failed. Number unavailable. That's not the right number? Yeah, here it is here from him. You mistyped it. Great. As usual. <laughs> Gotta be at least once. 885-2020. <laughs> mistyped. Now everybody knows Art's cell phone number. Yep, call him. Prank him. Often, in the middle of the night. Hey, Art, how's it going? Good. It's good. It's good. It's good. How's Las Vegas? Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, I can't wait to be leaving. So, uh, <laughs> not to quote the movie, but it's, uh, you know, there comes a point where Las Vegas is interesting, uh, then it becomes more interesting, then it becomes fascinating if you're, uh, you know, a, a social people observer and then it becomes disgusting and then it becomes <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes curious um, as to why people behave the way they do uh, in Las Vegas and then uh, it becomes uh, when the heck am I getting home and can I get out earlier so <laughs> now, now wait a second you were just there right so you were at C am, you were you were at C before before this though you were at CES last month right so you were just out there yeah. Yep, they're actually erecting a monument to me. In fact, uh, <laughs> I, came, I came here to participate in a in a roundtable on, on Wednesday, which was unexpected until about a week ago. And uh, and then I realized I was going to be here for the shot show, uh, which is of you know some interest to me. And then I realized I was going to be here for the porno show, which I had absolutely no, no interest in at all. None whatsoever. Um, and then I was going to be here for the concrete show, which I would probably uh, you know, uh, consider using if I ever moved back to New York uh, and needed new shoes. So yeah. anyway, oh. there's a flooring show too. There's a flooring show if you're into. Oh my God! So not dancing. Yeah. So Las Vegas is still still very much alive. Very oh active. my gosh. So so how's everything going here at Seawire? I guess you did a thing on dry eye, I would assume, right? So making the complex simple, a comprehensive approach. So. And actually, the, the title says it all, uh, although I can't say it, I can't pronounce those words, but uh, the title says it all. Uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, my editorial this, uh, this morning was, uh, you know, stop the madness. Uh, we have, you know, too many people with, you know, too many uh, discordant voices, uh, confusing, and I think um, making this seem like a bridge too far for the average clinician to 
uh, embrace. And the problem is optometry is changing, you know, as is our visual and other environments. And uh, optometry needs to embrace uh, dry eye and uh, ocular surface disease, uh, if, if not for patient uh, benefit, certainly for survival of the profession. You know, things are becoming increasingly difficult in the more traditional uh, aspects of optometric practice. And uh, I was having a, a nice conversation with uh, Paul Karpaki, you know, we've been friends for years, and we're talking about how, you know, just there's so many uh, programs and uh, other um, outlets, uh, you know, for significant amounts of money where people, you know, ostensibly get trained to be dry eye experts. Uh, and you look at some of the, you know, materials that we have, you know, dues too, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, piece of work, you know, with some of the brightest minds in the dry eye world. Uh, but you know, I think it, it becomes almost insurmountable to the average clinician who, who, you know, wants a simple thing. You know, Paul, I'm sure you've had uh, over the years, many people come up to you and at the end of a lecture and say, well, just break it down. Just give me the cookbook. Uh, right. You know, and, uh, and that's what we need. We need, but we need a cookbook from people who, who have figured it out. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, everyone is offering, uh, you know, their 18 course uh, dinner actually has figured it out. Well, you so know, anyway. yeah, well, in this competition, you know, we have all the commercials to the public about not only are there dry eyes, but then they got dry mouth, and now the podiatrists well, have dry feet. So <laughs> where, where does it end with all this dryness? <laughs> well, you know, there, there was a big outbreak in, in, uh, in colleges of hoof, hoof and mouth disease, which, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with. We, di we didn't have hoof and mouth disease in the Bronx. We had the hoof in your mouth disease. <laughs> <Yeah>. you <know. laughs> well, we, yeah, you know, we didn't I, have hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> I, I, w I went to, our, to a mystery guest who was going to be here shortly, I hope, for an eye exam. And, of course, you know, you hit a certain age and you have dry eyes. I said, yeah, I got dry yeah. eyes. I know I have dry eyes because when I put my swim goggles on, for an hour it feels good when I'm swimming. And, and you look so good in them. And, and he gave me, he said, look, you know, you can try all these very complicated procedures. He said, but here's what I suggest you try. And you want to simplify it? I hate to destroy everybody. He said, I take a teaspoon of olive oil every morning you no, know, first thing in the morning, have a teaspoon of olive oil and see if it works. And, and, a, a and, month, where, and, and it works. <laughs> where, do you, where, where do you put it? <laughs> you take it, you drink it. The exclude no, <laughs> a, a new meaning well, for Mediterranean well, you, 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 diet. Yeah. <laughs> it's a drink, stuff. No, it, 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 actually, you're being facetious, but you know, no, it works. It. The, dream, the, the dream study showed that olive oil and uh, a, um, a re-esterified uh, triglyceride-based omega-3, which is, the, you know, to me, the best form of it, uh, with a two-to-one EPA to DHA ratio, were statistically equivalent in ameliorating the symptoms and, and, and to some extent, the signs of dry eye, even though the headline said, you know, that, you know, that, that omega-3s don't work. But what the paper actually showed is that even olive oil has some benefits. So, yeah, no, it makes, it makes perfect sense. And we, we also confuse, you know, dry eye. Dry eye is an ancient term uh, that bears little uh, clinical value uh, in the context of our understanding today. It's not that I tell patients all the time, it's not that you don't make enough tears, it's that your tears aren't working properly. And we need to uh, address that, understand how tears work and go back to the underlying cause of the problem fix the cause. And uh, I've had you know, phenomenal success in my own practice uh, with that, you know, to the point where I've taken patients with really severe dry eye uh, and, uh, you know, had life changing success for them, which is, which is gratifying. Uh, kind of, kind of like where, where we're at. Hey, so I, I have a question, you know, Paul, you know, you and I are both proud uh, Bronxites. You sure. Know, and I think well, a lot of people know that we come from the Bronx, but you know, lately I I prepared for our our conversation by watching a a, a videotape of uh, of our new congresswoman from the Bronx, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, uh, and I've decided that I'm going to change my own personal history and deny I'm going to become a denier that I ever grew up in the Bronx. Uh, Art, so. Art, I, I, think, I think you're going to have a hard time escaping your past because just by looking at you, you can tell. <laughs> you know who's from there. <laughs> that's, my, that's my Bronx accent. Yeah. Give me away. Um, but, but, 
but I, and and I do I do subscribe to the concept that becoming a billionaire is immoral, especially saying that in Las Vegas makes makes good sense. Uh, but oddly, uh, you know, I think most of us do aspire to that that level of immorality. Anyway, enough enough politics for this uh, for this, for this show. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, so you know, it's it's funny. Um, we we had another we have another dry eye lecture going on before you, and it was an interesting thing. Uh, she was talking about cosmetics and dry eye, and I guess mm -hmm. from from a, a perspective of, of a guy who doesn't know anything about cosmetics, to me this was interesting. Um, I wonder how many other people out there are like me, where you don't even know what questions to ask. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's true, and, and even worse, um, many of our male colleagues don't care because we yeah. we don't know. You know, it's like we go, wow, who'd put that on my face? Uh, I assume that was Laura Perriman, right? No, this and, was Jen, uh, Jen Lyerly. Oh, Jen Meyer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm actually very, I, I'm very impressed that our ignorance has been uh, has been exposed uh, <laughs> to our own benefit. You know, sadly, and yep. uh, we've been forced to learn that. Uh, you know, as typical, we are our own worst enemies. And, and I think I agree with you. We're oblivious to uh, the impact of makeup. We kind of just you know look past it and you know just expect people to have makeup and don't realize that. Uh, it causes uh, significant issues for dry eye patients. So yeah, and, and a number of people are speaking uh, are are speaking about it. And then, well, we should. I, I, it's kind of embarrassing. We really should have been aware of that contribution to uh, to the problem, but we weren't. Yep. So that's all good. Yeah, uh, that is all good. So uh, it's busy. So I think I'm on tomorrow, right? I think my my course is on tomorrow. Uh, let me pull the Friday. schedule here. Yeah, I think you might be right. Let me. Yeah, and, and actually, I decided to. Uh, I won't. I won't bore you with the details. But my my lovely wife, I invited her to join me in in Las Vegas, and she said, uh, you know, what are you doing? I said, I got a couple of things, and she said, well, why don't you come home? Because you're you know you're traveling so much, you know, for the next couple of literally months. She said, you know, why don't you come home? Uh, you know, we can plan a trip that we're taking and so on. And I said, gee, that's a great idea. So I'm actually going to be home a day earlier. So and hence the change in schedule. Excellent. Yeah. So yep. Tomorrow, tomorrow night it looks like, or tomorrow I guess afternoon for us, right? So yeah, two o'clock. So. Well, I, I actually gave a variation of it uh, here at the GSLS and uh, rave review. Hopefully, it'll have rave reviews on the uh, on CE Wire. Uh, and I, a, a I, wonderful program. I looked at your slides. Actually, I hate to tell you this. I actually changed one of your slides, but I won't tell you which. <laughs> uh, uh oh. I hope. I, I hope, I hope it was I hope it was the one that uh, that uh, had the old picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> Replace it with Brad Pitt. No, it was uh, um, the uh, you you put in a, a movie of a, a non Newtonian fluid, um, uh, and it was linked to yeah. to your local computer. So I had to replace it with another one that I found on YouTube. So I hope you find it amusing oh. and satisfactory. <laughs> oh, okay. no, no, I'm sure. You know, I have a great respect for you. You're you're surely purely absolutely brilliant. You're the progeny of uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world. So, so I, there you go. I expect yeah. it to be better than, better than the miserable copy that I ripped from YouTube uh, myself. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and I think it's an interesting concept. You know, we, we take tears for granted. You know, our experiences, you know, as children, as, you know, we, we stub our toe or skin our knee or get yelled at and we start crying. And, you know, we grow up, we become adults, you know, we become professionals and uh, we talk to patients about tears and, you know, so, oh, yeah, you have a dry eye, you're not making enough tears. And, you know, we, in, in our mind, we see those tears coursing down our cheeks. And, uh, and then reach over and hand the patient a bottle of wet. And uh, not only are the tears that are causing the patient's problem, not those tears that run down our cheeks, they're part of a brilliant emergency eye wash system that we have built in. Uh, but all the bottles of wet in the world don't help. Yep. Don't do very much. Sorry, uh, the companies that make bottles of wet. So. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, all right, Art, so we're definitely, yeah. we're, we'll let you go. We got to actually get back to the conference. But, th but thanks for, you know, taking the time and... Uh, you know, I, ho I hope your I, I hope your talk goes great tomorrow, and uh, it's a two hour long talk, isn't it? I didn't I just realized yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah, so I hope yeah. everyone you know shows up and attends and you know finds it nice. I, I think people are are aching to to try to get that algorithm together. This is my observation anyway, because people they they're really tired of just sort of poking around in the dark. So you know, hopefully, yeah. hopefully yeah, I, I agree. And and this is this really it's it's the core of it is a simple system uh, that anyone can apply. You know, I, I I started out you know using you know here's a bottle of wet and ended up 
trying and rejecting tons of things, finding things that actually worked for me, uh, and just refined and refined and refined. Of course, you know, it, I, I've gone well beyond that. I deal with a lot of really complex patients, but the core of it works for pretty much everyone who can start a dry eye practice very simply. So hopefully everyone will find it useful. Thanks for uh, giving me a platform to share it with everyone, and congratulations on an amazing uh, CE Wire this year. Just phenomenal. Before you go, though, uh, before you go, there's one... <laughs> What you, should, you may want to think about an editorial about the uses uh -oh. of, well, you're in Arizona, you're not in Colorado, about the, use, the uses of medical marijuana. Oh, boy. I began a topic, and I thought for sure it would get some action. But absolutely only one optometrist was, had the guts to say what it did for his life. It just, just changed his life. But no one, and one other person put a very cursory comment. And I would love to see more ODs start becoming experts on the medical use of marijuana because patients will ask them as, as healthcare practitioners. But most of, so far, no one seems to care, <laughs> except yeah, if they yeah, get cured yeah, by it. Well, that's because they're all using non-medical marijuana. Right. That's going to take away your will to care. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, you know in, in all seriousness, you know, it, it is a, it is a, an important subject. I, I think one of the issues, the real uh, significant issues is in Arizona, a med medical marijuana is approved. Unfortunately, we didn't pass a, a recreational law because of, uh, you know, I think the cartels buying enough TV time to convince people that their children would be harmed by legalizing and regulating something that is completely uh, you know, illegal and unregulated. But uh, at any rate, uh, the state uh, it would fall under a narcotics uh, segment that we would not be able to prescribe. And that's a whole other issue uh, that many ODs live in states where uh, theoretically they should be able to prescribe medical marijuana, but may not be able to because of you know, the same state uh, laws and, and, and rigidity and restrictions that have held us back for years. But I think that's something we're going to have to deal with. And I agree with you, Paul. Uh, I use CBD oil. I, you know, a lot of my patients do. I recommend it. I think medical marijuana does have a, a valuable place, but I think, uh, like everything else in optometry, we have to be patient. But, but yeah, uh, optometrists maybe, have to know about it, or else they're going to be locked out mm -hmm. well, if, yeah, of legislation. Well, I, I, I exported, you know, many, many years ago when I was in college. You know, I started my, my studies, and uh, so I can, I can, I can speak to, uh, you know, its its ability to improve your musicality and dance moves. But, uh, <laughs> but I can, uh, and of course, not not that I ever inhaled. So, uh, and I am uh, considered run, running for law, running for office, just in case you're curious. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Art. Well, on, on that note, uh, we will let you go. But thanks, you know, thanks for being here again, and, and thanks for your lecture. And uh, and I guess we will catch up with you on the road. Have a good flight. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. All righty. All right. So it looks like we've reached the end of the road for a while. Um, and yes, our mystery guests will be arriving. And so what I have here is a movie for people. Should, should they want to watch? Um, this was a lecture that we had with Paul Chouse. It's the, scare, the single scariest lecture we have ever had on OD Wire or CE Wire. And it's all about diabetes. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and the incidence of diabetes and how it will ruin your life. And uh, I think it's, it's a, a fascinating film though. And I think everyone should probably watch it if they haven't seen it yet. It's a really good lecture. So I think while we take a break here, I'm going to put that up. Uh, and uh, when we come back, we will hopefully have the mystery guest. Sound good? All right. So let me get this going. And uh, hopefully this won't be too loud for us. And... Americans, Americans that have, that have diabetes, diabetes uh, and, and, and it's, accounting it's accounting for a lot of health care expenditures, expenditures in the U.S. In the US. Of, of total health care dollars spent, spent diabetes, diabetes accounts for one in five. five. For Medicare, for Medicare recipients, it's one in three dollars spent, spent on diabetes. On diabetes. $322 billion were spent when, when this slide was made, made which was 2016, on both pre-diabetes pre and diabetes. diabetes. A new report, a new report came, came out last, last month in the journal Diabetes, diabetes Care, said, said that caring, caring for, diabetes for diabetes alone in 2017 cost
cost the U.S. economy $327 billion. So that's, so that's essentially, essentially two, two Hurricane Katrinas, Katrinas every year uh, accounted for by expenditures on diabetes. And the majority of that is going for medical care. And there's also about $78 billion in lost productivity. In addition, in addition though, to these, to these uh, you know, 30, million 30 million people, people that, have that have diabetes, there's about, there's about 86, 86 million, million that have, that have a, disease a disease called pre-diabetes. pre-diabetes. The, majority the majority of these folks, these folks will go on and develop, develop diabetes, diabetes if something, if something isn't, isn't done to intervene. intervene. So it's really, so it's really a, public a public health catastrophe. catastrophe. And, in and in the U.S., we're actually, actually doing better than, better than a lot of other parts of the world, which I'll talk about in a moment. So these are 2017 diabetes statistics from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They say 30 3.3 million, million, million Americans had diabetes, had diabetes but, about but about 7 million, million of, those of those folks were undiagnosed. undiagnosed. In addition, in addition there's, there's, they say 84, 84 million, million people have pre-diabetes. pre-diabetes. Most, people Most people think it's think above 100 million, million now if you talk, if you talk to, to kind of epidemiological experts, experts in diabetes. diabetes. But, nonetheless, but nonetheless, you know, if you, you, know, if you pull, pull these two groups together, together we're, talking we're talking a significant, significant number of number Americans. 1.4 million, million Americans, Americans right, right now are legally, are legally blind, blind from an ocular, ocular complication, complication of diabetes. diabetes. And, it's and it's typically diabetic, diabetic macular edema or proliferative, or proliferative diabetic, diabetic retinopathy. retinopathy. About 8, 8 million, million total, total Americans, Americans have, have some, some degree, degree of diabetic, of diabetic retinopathy. retinopathy. Worldwide, Worldwide a billion, a billion people, people are, expected are expected to have, to have diabetes, diabetes by the year 2050. 2050. Right, now, right it's now it's about, about 600, 600 million. million. So that's so really an astounding, an astounding number. number. The fastest, the fastest rates, rates of diabetes, of diabetes uh, prevalence, prevalence are, are, growing are growing in, in uh, Asia, Asia and sub-Saharan and Africa. Africa. And probably, and probably because, because they've imported, imported uh, not only not our goods, 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 but also, but also our Western uh, uh, lifestyle, which includes a diet that is too high in calories, too high in carbohydrates, loss of physical activity, physical activity more sedentary, sedentary lifestyles, lifestyles, all things, all things that, increase that increase the risk of developing, developing especially, especially type, type 2 diabetes. Two diabetes. So we know so that we know diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy specifically, specifically that rates, rates are higher, higher in, certain in certain populations, populations including people of color, color African Americans, Americans Latino, Latino and Native, Native Americans, Americans and people, and from, people the from the Pacific Island Asia, Asia, uh, groups, groups are much are more likely, more likely to, develop to develop diabetes. diabetes. Macular, macular edema, as it turns out, diabetic macular, macular edema, edema is the biggest cause of vision loss in diabetes, much more common than its proliferative disease, but often these two entities go hand in hand. We know, we based, know on based on large, large well done, well done uh, studies, studies looking at how, at you, how prevent, you prevent uh, diabetic, uh, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy and, and severe, severe vision loss, vision loss that, if that if patients can, can improve, improve their, their metabolic, metabolic control, control, including, including blood, sugar, blood sugar, blood pressure, and to a lesser extent, extent blood, lipids, blood lipids, that that, that will that lower, lower the risk, the risk of, of developing diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy and, and for retinopathy getting worse and causing vision loss. Probably the most important risk factor is disease duration. How long you've had diabetes determines whether or not or not, you're, you're more, more or less or likely, likely to have to diabetic, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, uh, most, most experts, experts say, that say that everybody eventually, eventually gets, gets diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy if they, if they have, have diabetes. diabetes. It's not, it's a, not matter a matter of, of, of if, if, but, but when, when it will happen. happen. And we really, and we really you know, we have you know, new uh, ways, of ways of looking at the retina now that show us that a lot of people that heretofore wouldn't have been diagnosed as having diabetic retinopathy actually have retinopathy here and now today. And we'll talk more about that as we to the, cases. to the cases. It's important, it's important to realize there's, there's really, really no level, no level of, of average, average blood, blood glucose, glucose that is that hemoglobin, is hemoglobin A1C, A1C that is, that is totally, totally protective, protective against diabetic, against diabetic retinopathy. retinopathy. We all need we to all educate, need our, educate patients our patients about prevention, about prevention but, but there is there no is level no below which retinopathy, which retinopathy does, does not occur. occur. So that's an important, so that's important point. point. That's why these folks need to be followed up on a regular basis. So, so DR, DR and DME, and DME in the U.S., the US about, 8 about 8 million people, which is 27%, 27% of people with, people with diabetes in the United, in the United States, States, have some have degree some of diabetic, diabetic retinopathy. retinopathy. About, about 6 million, million are already, already diagnosed, 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 but that means, but that means 2, million 2 million are not, are not yet, yet diagnosed. So there's a so large, there's a large pool, of pool of patients out there, out there walking around, around have, not have not been identified as having diabetic retinopathy. And when they're not identified, they're less likely to go in for routine care, less likely to have early intervention than to prevent vision loss. Specifically around Around diabetic, around diabetic macular, macular edema, edema, a little more, a little than, more than 2 million, million have, some have some degree of macular, macular edema, and, and 800,000 800, are, are not yet diagnosed. Yet diagnosed. And, and even those even diagnosed, those diagnosed fair a fair number are, are not receiving not treatment. treatment. So this is so really, this is really an, an area where optometrists can step, can step up, to, up the plate to the plate and help our and help patients our with DME get referred in for appropriate treatment in a more timely fashion. 
This is this an is international, international study, study from Yao, from Yao that, said that said that worldwide, worldwide about 10%, 10 of, all of all diabetes patients, patients, patients have sight threatening diabetic, diabetic retinopathy. So that's, so that's defined, defined as either proliferative diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy or, or center involved, involved diabetic, diabetic macular, macular, macular edema. That is that the center of the macula is thickened and patients are at imminent risk of losing vision. So that's worldwide. It's about 10% in the U.S. You know, there's not really hard data on this, but if you look at the Numbers, the numbers, it's somewhere, it's somewhere between, between five, five and six percent. So a little so better than the United States, States overall. The problem, the problem really of diabetes, diabetes, I think, is worse than I've already alluded to. Alluded to. Because, if, because you if you look at uh, uh, NHANES data, data, that's the that's National the Health and Health Nutrition, Nutrition Examination, 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 Examination Survey, survey that, that uh, diabetes, diabetes prevalence, prevalence in, adults, in adults over age 18, 18 was somewhere was between 12 and 12 14 percent. percent. And that's, and that's six, years six years ago in 2012. 2012. At the same at the time, they found out that about 38 percent of all U.S. adults have pre-diabetes. This this. Uh, uh, condition, condition where blood, where glucose, blood glucose levels are elevated, elevated but, they but they haven't they haven't quite quite crossed, crossed the quantitative threshold for being labeled as having diabetes. diabetes. But if you add, if you these, add two these two groups together, groups those with those pre-diabetes and those with those diabetes, with diabetes it, turns it turns out that's, out that's more than fifty percent of all U.S. US adults. adults. So that's pretty, so that's pretty scary. scary. And when you get and to older ages, above age sixty-five, the numbers go up. It's about eighty-three percent of people over sixty-five have diabetes or pre-diabetes. So you can't say you have. You had a patient today with today with diabetes, 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 diabetes. diabetes. If you look if to you your look left, to your look to your right, right. There's probably, there's probably someone, someone if it's not you, not you that either has either diabetes, diabetes or pre, or pre diabetes. diabetes. It's something, it's something we're going to be seeing a lot a lot more of. of. So 84, so 84 plus million Americans, million Americans have pre-diabetes. Pre and the interesting, interesting thing to know, thing to know is, that is that upwards of 10% of these patients, patients have, have ophthalmoscopic signs, signs of diabetic retinopathy. So I kind of so asked this, this rhetorical question. question. They've, they've got microaneurysms, hemorrhages, hemorrhages heart eggs, heart eggs, and they've got and they've pre-diabetes. Got pre-diabetes. Do they have, do they have pre-diabetic pre retinopathy? Obviously not. They've got diabetic retinopathy that hasn't been diagnosed yet. And there's a number of reasons for that, which include we're not necessarily doing the most doing accurate, the most accurate or, or a high yield, high yield test for test diagnosing, diagnosing diabetes, diabetes early, early on. on. And that's why and that's about why one in five newly, newly diagnosed, diagnosed type 2 type patients, patients already have some, have some degree of diabetic, diabetic retinopathy. retinopathy. And that's and using the old standards, standards looking, looking with a Volk lens, lens, looking you know, with a binocular, with a binocular indirect, indirect ophthalmoscope. Not even, not even using the great technology we're going to be talking about today, which will yield a much higher number of patients that already have some degree of retinopathy. It's important, it's important to know, to know, you know one of the one things about early about diagnosis, diagnosis is, first, is, first of all, we're not doing a good doing job, a good job of it. Because we're looking because only, only at blood sugar, blood sugar and, and specifically fasting, fasting blood, sugar. blood sugar. That's what the that's average, average primary, primary care physician, care physician does. does. And it's a great and test, a great test if, somebody, if somebody definitively has diabetes, has diabetes for a while, for a while but it doesn't but it pick up on the disease early. We know by the time the average person with type 2 diabetes gets diagnosed that more than half of their Beta cells, beta cells in the pancreas, in the pancreas to, produce to produce insulin are not, are not working, working anymore. anymore. They're being They're burned, burned out, essentially. out essentially. The pancreas, the pancreas goes, goes into overdrive, and so the beta cells, beta cells die, die out. out. And, and that the, that the mean, duration mean duration of diabetes, diabetes at diagnosis, diagnosis is about 6.2 years. years. And that's based, and that's based both on the prevalence, on the prevalence of, retinopathy of retinopathy and the amount, and the amount of beta cell destruction at the time of diagnosis. The point, the point here really, here is, really that is that if you detect, if you detect any, any lesions, lesions that are consistent, that are consistent with, diabetic with diabetic retinopathy, we as, we, as eye, care eye care providers, providers can help, can help uh, uh, yield an earlier, earlier diagnosis, diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes. And, that, and that hopefully will lead to earlier, earlier intervention, intervention, intervention and better and outcomes, outcomes long, term. long term. Because remember, because diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy doesn't occur in isolation. In isolation. It goes hand in hand with dramatically increased risk of cardiovascular disease and renal disease and neurological dysfunction as a result of Diabetes. diabetes. One in ten, One patients, in ten patients gets diagnosed, gets diagnosed with, type with type 2 diabetes, diabetes for, the for the first time in the emergency, in the emergency room, room after they've after had, had a, heart attack. a heart attack. And that's pretty, and that's sad. pretty sad. So I've talked so to, a, I've lot talked to a lot of patients that say, that say you, know, you know, I just found out I have diabetes, diabetes, diabetes in the hospital. In the hospital. I, had I had a heart attack and they told me my blood sugar was crazy high. Well, you know, a lot of these patients have been living with the condition for years. It hasn't been diagnosed early on. That's the problem. 
So these so are kind of classic lesions, right, that we've, right that we've all been trained, been trained, trained uh, and, uh, and retrained and re-trained to, detect to detect in our patients. In our patients. And we can and see, you know, obvious, you know, obvious, you know, you know uh, hard uh, exudates on the upper, on the left, upper left, and left, somebody with proliferative retinopathy on the upper right, right, and then, right, and then more, severe more severe exudates on the lower right, and then, and then of course, of course with optical coherence tomography, especially SCOCT, we have the ability to detect exquisitely small amounts of macular edema now. And these tools are really wonderful. But I want us to know the diabetic retinopathy is not, is not just, just, just this, stuff. this stuff. Diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy also, includes also includes things like, things like the, following. the following. So here's a so patient, here's a patient you, know, if you, you know, if you look at the patient, you know, with typical, typical examination, examination techniques, techniques with a fundus, fundus uh, lens, uh, lens or a direct or a direct or even, or even a conventional retinal camera, camera, there's very, there's very little retinopathy in the central, in the central 45, 45 degrees. degrees. If you go if you outside, outside the central 45 degrees, though, though, we see a whole lot of action going on. And this is what the new research is saying, is that people that have a lot of peripheral retinopathy are dramatically more likely to develop severe sight-threatening diagnosis. Diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy and may and need may intervention, need intervention earlier, earlier, on earlier on than they would have otherwise. otherwise. If you don't, if you don't look, look at the peripheral retina, retina, you're not going to see, see this stuff. stuff. So that's, so one, that's example one example of where, of where you know, excellent, you know, excellent technology, technology can help us do, help a, better us do a better job. You can throw, you can throw a, BIO a BIO on, but I, I venture to say a lot of us, of us when we're looking at our diabetic patients, we're not looking as sensitively at the peripheral retina. We're spending more time on where we think the action is, which is the posterior pole. And granted, that's really important. That's where vision occurs. But what you're seeing in the periphery is a harbinger of what is going to happen in the posterior pole in the future. So it's really important to look. Here's another, Here's another example, example of a new technology, of a new technology we're, going we're going to be talking about today, about today that, that shows a patient, a patient that has very that has little very diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy on clinical, clinical exam. Maybe, maybe you know, a couple you know, of micro-aneurysms, but, but the patient's best corrected, corrected vision, vision is down. Is There's, down. No, There's cataract. no cataract. This is a young this is patient. A young patient. Uh, our uh, colleague, Jay, Jay Haney, Haney uh, shared this with me. And so why does this patient ever reduce vision? You wouldn't really know unless you did this particular test, which is an OCT and geography test. And it shows this patient has Enlargement, enlargement of the foveal vascular, vascular zone, zone and dramatic, and dramatic capillary, capillary dropout. dropout. There's, There's nothing that really that can really be done, can be for, done this for this patient in terms of clinical, clinical intervention, intervention right now. Right now. Uh, uh, we can try, we can try to try prevent progression of the disease, of the disease but there's nothing that's going to restore this patient's vision. vision. So, OCTA, so OCTA is an exquisite, is an exquisite way, to way to let us see these kinds of manifestations of diabetes. And the estimate is based on fluorescein and geography. Somewhere between 8 and 10 percent of all people with diabetic retinopathy also have foveal Ischemia. Ischemia. So, so it's, it's really, it's really the ugly, ugly stepsister, stepsister of diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy that we don't spend we don't as much spend as talk, talk, time talking about, talking especially, about especially in optometry, in optometry because, we're because we're not typically doing fluorescein in geography. geography. So now we're so going to have Dr. Leck uh, present uh, uh, some interesting, interesting eye-opening eye information about the economics of diabetes, diabetes care. care. Aaron? Aaron? Well, Paul, well, thank, Paul you so thank you so much for, for, for that introduction, for that introduction and, and, uh, and uh, giving us giving such, a, a, such a, a, wealth a wealth of information. Of information. You, are, you are always are such, always a, such uh, a, a, a spout of information, of information, information for me, and I know for and April, April, April uh, when, when I look to an expert on diabetes in this, in this field, field, in, 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 particular, in particular in eye care, but care but especially as it pertains to how we affect many other specialties and integrate with the larger health community, you are definitely probably the best and um, and uh, most sought after sought after resource. Resource. So thank so you again, thank you for, again that. for that. Uh, to, get uh, to get down to, to some brass tacks here, tacks here, I guess we're going to speak a little, speak a little bit more about some of the elements around, around the economics, the economics of diabetics. Of diabetics. And, and, and this isn't and this to, say to say just directly diabetes, diabetes and its and economics in our practice, but maybe, but maybe the way in which that drop in the pond, so to speak, the ripple effects across our practices and what those may look like. But I want to start off with, I think, the first acknowledgement that is that when we add technology, to the, to care, the of the care of the diabetic, diabetic patient, patient that the equation, the equation changes. changes. No longer, no longer does, one does one plus one, one equal two. two. It might it might four, it might four, equal three, 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 but it equals, but it equals some, some other number that's, number that's larger, larger than itself. Than itself. So, so, uh, the so the first thing that, thing that I want to make sure we sure leave the audience, the audience today, with today is that investing in technology and continuing to have a plan and pathway in your practice to invest in technology is only going to benefit patients who have diabetes and are in your practice as well 
well as well as the wealth of wealth patients, of patients that are in your that practices, practices that don't that have don't these have conditions. conditions. So, so keep that keep in that mind, in as, mind we as we go forward. forward. Now, as we now, invested, as we invested from, a from a practice standpoint, standpoint on, our on our side, what I wanted to share with you was what some of those metrics look like. Because because it's easy to get esoteric and talk about something like one plus one equals one three, and now we're in a theoretical discussion. But when we really look at things, what happens across the practice? So for us, we manage a lot of cataract patients, and typically out there in the industry. Industry, you'll see, you'll see in cataract, in cataract conversion, conversion rate, 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 rates rate, somewhere in the somewhere neighborhood, in the neighborhood of, maybe of maybe 25 five, um, to 30 um, percent. Percent. Uh, premium, uh, premium IOLs, IOLs premium, and premium procedures, procedures is, a, is, a, is, a, is a typical number that you'll, that find, you'll in find in a practice, practice that is doing really, doing really well, well at converting. converting. We've, we've found, found that with the implementation, with the implementation of technology, technology mind you, mind a lot of these patients with diabetes are early cataract patients, that number sits at 130 percent across our patient base. Those types of numbers don't happen because because you just kind you of just kind throw of caution, throw caution to the wind to the and wind tell somebody, and somebody they have they a cataract, have cataract and it's now time now to go get that procedure done. But, done. but you, need the, you need the technology to demonstrate, to demonstrate the patient so that, so that they, they understand, understand what their options, what their options, options are. are. In addition, in addition to that, to we, that found we found that the engagement, the engagement with our, di- with our di- patients, patients with diabetes, diabetes in practice, in practice has, has really increased, increased our, our total our medical revenues, revenues, revenues to the tune to of, the of about $300, $300 per average, average medical revenue, revenue on a, on a, on a patient, patient per year. Per year. That's, not That's not saying that, saying that we're, doing we're doing only $300, $300 dollars dollars I, in collections on a patient with diabetes per year, but we're seeing these increases across the entire spectrum by introducing and then implementing and utilizing. Medical, medical technologies. technologies. We're also We're seeing also with, seeing patients, with patients in, in, in terms, of terms of care and active care of, care of diabetes, diabetes about two and a half, two and a half average, average number of visits per year that we're seeing patients, in. patients in. And, that and that number translates, translates well, right? If we're right, looking, if we're at, looking at, a at a number like number like hundred dollars per average, average medical revenue on patient, patient and a two point five number in terms of return visits, these numbers start to make a little bit more sense. But what happens to the patients when it comes to things like recall? There's all sorts of systems out there. For, there, recall for recall and, and ways, ways to get, ways really, to get really, really good at this. this. You, know, you know, what we've what found, we've is, found that is that when patients are engaged, engaged in their health care, they, they show up. And in our, and in our case, case, in our practice, it's about, it's about 80% of those patients, of those patients return, return yearly for their diabetic, for their diabetic, diabetic eye exam. exam. I would challenge, I would challenge you find to find a recall, recall system that's out there in the industry that is able to provide that sort of return. Patients, patients here, here because of the because engagement, of the engagement with, the with the technology, they see, they see and understand, understand their condition, condition better and better, and they are and coming, they are coming back, back and they're taking, and they're taking uh, our, recommendations. our recommendations. And where else, and where does, else that does that spill over into? into? Well, the well, biggest rate right, right now in, in, in uh, our field, our field, field least, in optometry, optometry and eye care is dry eye, eye, dry eye dry disease. Fifty-four percent of patients suffer from dry eye. We know we that know that's, that's a, a, a well-founded well fact. fact. <clears throat> if you're looking, if you're to, looking grow, to grow a set, a set of patients, patients like, that like that in your practice, your practice why wouldn't, wouldn't you continue to engage more deeply? Invest, invest in the technology, in the technology of, capturing of capturing the imagination of these patients, patients and, then and then engage them, them in other in ways where they where have they demonstrated, demonstrated needs. needs. Now, now, out there, out the other, the other piece, piece that I, I think, I, I at think least we find in our practice, our practice is how do you, how do you balance, balance managed care, 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 vision, vision care, care plans versus, versus medical? medical? If you look, if you at, look any, at any, any of the, any of the um, discussions, discussions uh, across uh, across OD wire, OD wire in, in particular, in particular uh, this, uh, topic this topic is, is uh, it could, could, could probably weave, weave its way into way just about any threat. And and I think I think that's something to really consider because because the vision plan patient is one of those patients that crosses. Over, over from a diabetes, from a diabetes standpoint. standpoint. But the vision plan, plan patient is a patient, patient that routinely, that routinely within within practice, practice uh, can be, uh, can be uh, uh, the, the, at, least the, at least the way in which the, the vision plans will have us believe is that they, they bring patients into our practice. What well, we, well, we see when we engage well, we a patient, patient with diabetes, with diabetes then on a two-to-one two ratio, ratio out, out for, for the patients, the patients into, our into our practice, additional, additional patients. patients. These aren't just these patients, aren't just patients who, who struggle with diabetes, with diabetes but these are patients, these are patients of all walks, all walks of, life. of life. And so I think, and so it's, I think important it's important to understand that we engage in caring for patients, for patients who need this, this care, care, that they refer, they refer patients, patients to us, they return more often. More often. And, finally, and finally, what does that mean for us? For us? Well, the big well, number across our practice is about $150,000 a year is the increase in revenue per full-time equivalent doctor that we've seen by deeply Engaging, engaging in technology, in technology employing, employing these tools, tools and, working and working with patients, with patients uh, uh, much more much closely, closely to, help to help them understand their care, and their care and implement, and implement uh, new technologies, technologies in that, in that, those spheres. spheres. 
So that's the economic diabetes, hopefully from a boots on the ground level. And in our practice, that's a four-doctor group practice that is stationed in the middle of California, where most people would tell you that you can't do much medical care. I think that those numbers show something very different. So let's talk, so let's then, talk about, then about the technology. The technology. What does it, what does it bring in technology? What does it, what does it, what does it industry, industry leading technology, technology look like, and, and why should why you should consider you it? Consider it? I, I, in terms, in of, terms of industry leading technology, technology, one of the, one of the first pieces, pieces that's always, that's always on, my on my mind, and I'm sure and I'm April, April is on yours, 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 what is kind of kind investment, investment is taking is place, place in keeping us ahead of the curve? And you see an image here in front of you in which we've got an angioplex image. So the angiography has been taken and overlaid on a black and white, white image, image of the fundus, of the fundus behind, us. behind us. You can see, you can see uh, in uh, images, in images like, this, like this where, where uh, first, uh, off, first off, for most, for of, most of us coming out of school, school now, now, we may have we seen, seen these things, things. But those, but of, those us, of us, uh, like uh, myself, like myself April, and April, Paul, Paul, who graduated, who graduated quite a few quite years, a few years earlier, earlier, none of this stuff, this stuff existed, existed before. before. So how do we tackle this? Well, the images don't have to just be ahead of the curve, but they have to be something that's easy to use. This exam, this exam uh, uh, image that uh, I've got in front of us, April, this, April, is, the this is the first time, first time I think, that this, this has really been really put, out, put there out there nationally. That's a, that's uh, a 14, 14 by 14 by millimeter, millimeter a montage, montage uh, of a series of 8 by 8, eight scans. scans. So, so what, what happens, happens in this particular, in this particular image, image, this image this coming, coming out in 11.1 on, on, on the series of geography, is a series of images are taken. The technician doesn't have to direct them. It's machine guided, basically, to grab these. They're montaged, and what you just saw there was the black and white. And white with the overlay with the depth, depth image associated. associated. What do you think, of, do you that think of that image, April? It's amazing. It's amazing. How would you, how would you use something like this just, just for a moment, for a moment in, in practice? practice. What, what, what could you could see? You see how, how could you see a patient you see engaging, engaging, with engaging with this? You know, I you think, know, I think it, like you it, said, like before, said before, for a patient to come into our office and see something like this, it will completely change their entire thought process of why they come to the eye doctor. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible. They, uh, they, uh, they will know, they will the, know difference the difference in a practice, in a practice when, they when they can see what's, see what's happening, happening in their own eye. Hopefully, Hopefully it will change, it will change behaviors, behaviors for them as well. As well. So they'll be so they'll more be compliant, compliant and we'll see, and we'll see better, outcomes better outcomes and better vision, and better vision long term. Long -term. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. hundred percent. The second image here, here um, similar, similar type, type stuff. Again, you've, you've got, got a montage. montage. Here you've got, here you've got uh, a number of six, six, six by six, six images, images, a six millimeter by six millimeter, six millimeter, millimeter images, images that have been stitched, stitched, stitched together. together. And then again, and then that, again same that same overlay, overlay with, the, with the depth, the depth imaging, imaging, and being able to being know at what level we're looking at things. It's just pretty phenomenal in terms of the technologies that are that are coming down the pipe and really right around the corner. Well, how about, well, the, how stuff about the stuff that exists today? today? So, in, so practice in practice today for April, April, for myself, for myself Paul, for Paul, one of the things, of the things that we that really, really need is the ability to detect. To detect. And, and this, and this, for all of all of you, the, the, the detect, detect uh, ability, uh, ability to detect, detect early, early what's, what's happening, happening around diabetic, diabetic changes. changes. Gone, are, Gone the are the days in which in we try to take a photograph alone. We need resolution. We need the ability to tackle issues associated with blood flow. And so on this particular image, you can see a contrast of an image without um, um, clinical, clinical diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy and, and the and one that's a non-diabetic non patient. patient. Both of Both these, when you, when you look at the image in the retina, the retina uh, on a traditional, on a traditional photo, photo or maybe with a 90 90 lens, lens, you're not going to see, see a whole lot going, going on. on. But as you but can see with angioplex, you've got areas of vascular zone dropout. You've got small microaneurysms. Those are critical factors. How do they show up, though, when we get into a traditional CT? So here we have a non-diabetic patient. In this particular case, if you look at the side-by-side comparisons of the same eye, or the right or the eye, right and the eye, left eye, and the left eye, I should say. I should say. Uh, uh, these are these are normal normal OCTs. OCTs. Anybody, Anybody uh, who could uh, dial into this, into this and, and spend and some spend time just just going through the tomogram slices, slices and spending, spending time time, spending time reviewing, reviewing this, wouldn't see, wouldn't see too, too much going, much going on, on that, that, that looks that wrong or off. As a matter of fact, when it compares to the normative databases, it seems like this person's as healthy as could be. But when we look a little bit deeper and we've got something like this, like the angiography, as we did in the preceding slide slides, here we see on a Three by three, three, by three segment, segment of the of fovea, the fovea the, 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 there's a lot there's of a lot disruption, disruption of fovea fovea vascular vascular shown. Shown. and so there's, so there's a circle that's on, on this particular, particular slide that we're looking at that, that, that is that drawing is our drawing attention. attention. And, in and in that particular, particular area, area, when we, when we zoom, in zoom in just, just a little, a little bit, more, bit more, we see we broken see areas, areas of the fovea vascular, vascular, vascular zone. zone. We see some early microaneurysms, and we know that those microaneurysms, the detection of those microaneurysms, are the earliest signs in the body of any sort of change 
genes associated with diabetes. So that would so include nephropathy, nephropathy, diabetic retinopathy, and the like. Now we have the ability with an imaging device that captures this for three seconds to see that level of detail and engage a patient. A patient who, in the past, five years ago, three, three, four years ago, even I might have, I might have done a traditional CT on the with an adapter lens and a urine great shape. Here we have a microaneurysm. I think that's that's the important piece to to keep in mind as we go through this is that when we look with the new technologies, we need to be able to have a technology that differentiates from what our traditional training and, and things are. And I think the other question that this brings up for me, and, and April, I'm not sure uh, you know where you fall on this, but the other question it brings up is if I can do this on a patient that doesn't have any clinical signs, and this patient reports that maybe they're a diabetic, but they're well controlled, uh, what does that argue for the general population? I mean, for me, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Does this become the gold standard? Does this replace, you know, yeah. right now we dilate every patient. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a tough question. I think it makes us all know that we really don't have enough right now without technology to be able to do a fabulous job for our patients. And really, that's what I'm in the game to do. I want to do the best job I can. Yeah, so bigger discussion, but... Um, Definitely gives us some food for thought. Uh, the second case, another healthy patient with diabetes. You can see on the OCT report that's here, again, normative findings across the entire piece, uh, compares really well. The EDTRS uh, map uh, doesn't show any thickness changes that are going on. And then when we dive a little bit deeper into this and we look at a six by six angioplex that was taken, you can see in the entire map there on the left and the map of the deep retinal plexus that there are changes. There are physical changes in the capillaries. Um, you see a bunch of capillary dropout, possibly some early microaneurysms. And this is on a low resolution six by six OCT. So you're not looking at a three by three millimeter segment um, where maybe there's a little bit more data concentrated over a smaller area, but we can clearly see it. And when we look in that deep retinal plexus, there is just a bunch of loss uh, around the capillaries. And again, those kind of microaneurysms and things that are existing. These things uh, are, are um, they give me a lot of concern. When I look at this and know that I missed this in the past, um, the first thing I think that oftentimes comes up with patients in, in conversation is, they go, well, why didn't we see this last time? And, uh, and my, my, my response to them has to be, uh, we didn't have the ability to do it. And, uh, and we couldn't see or we couldn't operate in this mode before. They said, so what's your, what are you doing as we go forward? Well, we're continuing to invest in technology and these technologies that we have now give us a lot more information. So the patients are engaged, they understand, they understand that change is coming, but how does that sit with the rest of our colleagues out there and all of you who are listening and, and participating in this? Um, I would urge you to really consider, does your technology uh, allow you to stay ahead of the curve and, and really challenge um, you know, in, in what you do. So another piece of technology that has changed uh, today is ultra wide field. And in the past, we've all gotten used to an ultra wide field uh, sort of modality that provides us with a, a decent view of the periphery, maybe isn't super patient friendly in the way in which the uh, exam is taken, but we all know that if technology is worth it, we invest in it, even if it's not the most conducive from a, a patient perspective. So what are new technologies in terms of ultra wide field though that they're out now? And, and I would argue that there are two, probably three the main pieces about ultra wide field that I really look for. One, patient comfort. And, and I think that that's a big one. We're in a very uh, high touch environment with our patients. Our patients have a lot of choice in the marketplace, trying to be aware of and sensitive to their choice and the way in which we conduct our evaluations or exams you know, becomes an important piece. The second, and I think the very critical pieces for us in the exam room though, uh, really focus a little bit more around resolution and uh, really around true color. Is it, what, what does it look like what we really know it should look like? And so with that, I just wanna reintroduce for those of you who have already heard this um, about the Claris, but um, for those of you who haven't who are, and don't know about Claris, I wanna introduce to you Claris, which I think is a phenomenal piece of technology that allows us to get an ultra wide field image through a set, a two stitched um, montage. Um, the views are, are amazing. And, and let me just demonstrate those to you here on the screen because I could, 
go into a bunch of words, but you can see here on the screen what a traditional fundus image looks like when we're looking with a 90 diopter lens or a direct ophthalmoscope, and now what we have with wide field. And that, that image that you're looking at there is not a staged image. Now, we'll, as we'll dive into here in a few moments, you'll see that uh, images across patients with disease and problems associated with diabetes and a host of other conditions uh, also get an equally clear image that goes from the posterior pole all the way out to the periphery. True color, as I referenced just a few moments ago, is another really important factor, especially when we're going to be evaluating change in the nerve over time and pallor, things like that. Uh, we all know that getting a good photograph in, in traditional photography uh, in, in eye care can be a little bit challenging at times. And some of the players out there uh, struggle with true color because they're not actually using the full spectrum uh, in their their lighting sources, so they might be using a scanning laser technology or a single source light emitting diode. Here you've got a, a red, green, blue spectrum, and that's why in the Claris that you see on the left-hand side of your screen, you see actually a true color. It looks like that when you look through a 90 diopter lens as well as when you're getting the image from the Claris. When it comes to the photography and, and being able to capture an image, this is a single image of a Claris. Uh, and on this particular image, you'll notice that there are findings associated with diabetes in this particular eye. But what's really cool is that was a single shot. And when we dial it in and dial it in a little bit more, I'll just flip back to that for a moment. When we dial it all the way in, you can see that the resolution here in the posterior pole is quite significant. And we could even blow that up a little bit more and look at some of the, my, uh, some of the vasculature and changes that we're seeing here with this diabetic patient. In this particular case uh, where we've got a side-by-side -side comparison, this is the same eye. It's just taken with two wide field devices, the Claris and a, and a kind of a, a traditional or previous market leader in wide field. You'll see that we've got, we wanna see a little bit more of what's going on at the posterior pole. And April, this is, you and I know this already just from practice and what we've seen, but you can see that that image is beautiful there on the left-hand side. It is uh, an image that we would love to have taken with a traditional fundus camera, but this was taken with an ultra wide field and um, being able to dive into that level of detail, you can contrast it with the image that's on the right and there's just no difference there. April, what does that mean to you in practice? You know, I think that we need to be able to uh, look at a picture and know that it's a true picture. We need to be able to look at detail and then be able to follow patients over time. And it's very difficult to do that without a clear image. Sure. Just another uh, image getting out into the periphery. I, I think that, again, staying on, on course with not just the true image, but being able to get great resolution out into the periphery. So you can go from that posterior pole and then extending this out into the periphery. We see that resolution is consistent all the way across the set of retinal images that we just took. So those are some really great cases, Aaron. So uh, a little bit more about you know the value of uh, predominantly peripheral diabetic retinopathy lesions. There was a study published a couple of years ago and some follow-up now from the Joslin Diabetes Center showing that people that have predominantly peripheral diabetic retinopathy, so more lesions outside of the central 45 degrees than within the central 45 degrees, those folks are about three times more likely to develop a significant worsening of their diabetic retinopathy and almost five times more likely to develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And in fact, the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network, which is this consortium of a bunch of retinal specialty practices, trying to pool all their data together to get quicker results in terms of new treatments for diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema. The newest protocol, which is AA, is looking at this exact question. Does evaluating the peripheral retina help us to predict which patients are going to go on and develop significant diabetic retinopathy and require earlier intervention and more frequent follow-up? So that's that trial is ongoing right now, protocol AA. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of the Claris specifically, in addition to giving us spectacularly high quality ultra wide field and wide field retinal images, is the ability to use fundus autofluorescence to detect 
diabetic retinopathy lesions that might not be caught otherwise. So this was an interesting study showing that FAF shows significantly more microaneurysms than does standard color photography or even black on white color photography. So FAF highlights these lesions. It's exquisitely sensitive at picking up on uh, blood vessel abnormalities and in, for that matter, retinal hemorrhages. And so it's something that I'm using now more and more frequently when I'm screening patients for diabetic retinopathy. Looking at the FAF image allows me to see uh, more of what's going on in that patient's fundus. So now we're going to switch back to Aaron and April, who are going to go over some very interesting cases with respect to uh, OCT uh, use and OCTA in uh, several different conditions. So I want to dive into one final um, you know, case here before I pass it off, uh, April, a little bit more to get into even more nuts and bolts on what this looks into practice. Uh, this, unfortunately, is a case in which I don't have an ultra wide field image for. And the reason that I don't have an ultra wide field image in this particular case is because this patient passed away before the technology existed for us. Now, even OCT angiography, this patient um, wasn't able to sit for uh, because that technology wasn't available for us. He was, this was a 38 year old male that I saw in my practice, 2020 contact lens wear with absolutely no significant health problems. Maybe he was a little bit carrying a little bit of, ex, you know, a few extra pounds, but didn't have any other challenges. And what you're seeing is two macular OCTs. So at the time, we were taking macular OCTs on every single patient that we saw. And we started to pick up some early and subtle changes in this particular patient. And what this caused us to do was dive a little bit deeper. And when we dove deeper and sent this individual in for a set of labs, just to kind of give you some context, he had an A1C of uh, north of 13. And his, the rest of his labs, as you could imagine, were completely out of whack of, as well. He had two young little girls and his wife. As we tested a little bit further, looking at both eyes and, and using the technology that we had at the time, he went on to develop papilledema. The papilledema uh, got, we ended up able, being able to get it under control as we can, got his diabetes under control. And um, <clears throat> eventually, though, he succumbed to his disease. And I was uh, let his his wife came into the practice uh, one day just to let us know, but she didn't just let us know that that she had that we had, had lost him um, to the to the disease, but she was letting us know because she was so appreciative of the extra years of life that she ended up having. And Paul stated this a little bit earlier, but with regards to patients, that 10% of the patients with diabetes present for the first time in their condition to the ER with myocardial infarction. I think that's something really to keep in mind. In this particular case, while we weren't able to see this individual uh, through on the condition, him spending those few extra years with his, those two daughters and with his wife um, was a really, really important piece. And I think it's a, it's a sombering a note of the role that we can play and do play in our patients' lives uh, on a daily basis. And so with that, and, and not to leave us on a downer at all, but with that, I wanna, I wanna pass this over to April because putting this together in practice on a day in, day out basis becomes just the most imperative piece for me and what we can do for our patients. So April, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Aaron. You know, it's interesting, as he said, the the, one thing that I think we all agree on, and if you've ever heard me speak before, I'll tell you, and I've, I've said it before, we get paid to solve our patients' problems. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we make them see, we make, we do a lot of things, we, we save people's lives, we change their lives. But what they come in expecting from us is that we are going to solve the problems and some of them that they don't even know exist. And so if we look at how do we put this together in practice? We've heard a lot of things about how this is important and the difference it can make to our practice. But what I do in my office is anyone who comes into the office who's getting a comprehensive eye health evaluation, that for me includes an OCT screening, their visual field screening, and then wide field photos. If they're paying cash, it's part of that entire process. It's not an extra charge. If it's an insurance, uh, patient if they're coming in with any type of insurance plan and we still want to do it as a screening which means it's done before the doctor sees the patient and so there will be an extra charge for those patients 
And then I think the last thing, as you see on the slide, all results are reviewed with concern or celebration. And so what does that mean? That means when a patient comes in, they have these images done, we don't just take them and then I look at them in the back room and then we move on with the exam. I'll go in and we'll open up the images and forum. We show the patients exactly what we've done that day and how amazing it is that everything's okay. And then what we're gonna do next year to be able to compare over time. And that's the nice thing about having multiple technologies and having forum because you can bring all of it together in one concise photo, an image, one, one screen, to be able to demonstrate to your patient all of the things that you found that day, and, and not only be able to show them all the results, but be able to talk through it so they know the importance and what makes us different. So let's talk about a patient that actually came into the office and how this all took place. So this patient actually came in with his wife. She is a patient of mine. He had never seen me before. And she brought him in to see me because he'd been having difficulty with his vision. So let's look at the, the stats here. He's a 46-year-old black male, decreased vision in his right eye for a few days, he says. And he describes it to me as a darkness over his vision. He says he has diabetes. He knows he does. It was diagnosed about a year ago. He has no idea what any of his numbers are and uh, admits that he's not at all compliant with anything a doctor has told him in the past. His last eye exam was 10 years ago and he wears no glasses. So again, he came in to see me because his wife said she comes in to see me. She's had multiple issues herself, but she brings him in. She's sitting in the exam room with him and it was actually so, so wonderful when, when you have the ability to change people's lives like this. She says, you know, Dr. Jasper, I brought him in to see you. You're not on our insurance plan. We don't care. We just want to see you because we know that you can figure this out and figure it out quick. And, you know, it sounds silly to think that people put time ahead of sometimes their health, but I don't think we put time ahead of our health. What we do is we want to have the best of all worlds. Everybody has a job. They have to go back to work. And to be able to know that they're going to go to a practice where a doctor has technology that they'll be able to use to determine what the problem is and figure it out quickly and come up with a solution, that's worth gold. So now let's look at what the numbers are. So his vision, best corrected vision in his right eye was 2070 and left eye 2025. His pressures are 44 and 43. And you can imagine I double and triple checked and his cup to disc ratio you see as well. So he came in with blurred vision this is what we end up finding and that's not uncommon but what i love about having the technology that we have in our practice is that here's a diabetic patient coming in thinking diabetes is his problem and in the slides we've seen before this many times diabetes is in this case look at what the pictures show so here you can see the macula right eye left eye and as you look at this image we can see that even though this patient came in thinking maybe it was one thing, and I don't know that he had any idea what was going on, we can see what he ends up having is central serous retinopathy. And if we look at the next image, what you're gonna see is the macula next to the nerve. So now we know he comes in with blurred vision. That's his biggest concern. He's not really too worried about the fact that he's got pressures of 44 and 43. He doesn't know what that means to him. He just says, Dr. Jasper fixed my vision. So here's what we have for his images. The challenge now I have is that we're not on his insurance plan. As we all know, he's gonna need a little more care than just his visit today. And so now I have the images to be able to show him and say, this is what's going on. And this is what we really need to be thinking about as far as what to do next. But I think that as we look back and we talked about true images and we talk about, it, are we getting a real picture? It can be very challenging when we don't have the right technology because we don't have an ability to put together all of the facts and again, be able to solve our patient's problems in the best way. What we ended up doing with this patient is uh, I was able to get on the phone and get him in to see a, a doctor that day who was able to, who was on his insurance I reassured them they were not happy about having to go see someone else, but I explained to them, this is a long-term process. I would love to have you keep coming in to see me, but if you would go to see this doctor this time, let them help us get started on the right path, 
and let's order the tests we need to order under your insurance and then we'll get you back in to see us. April, I got a question for you. On on a case like that, and you, we've seen these images and, and can definitely understand even from your presentation here on how you would relate it to the patient, what what percentage, maybe that's not even a percentage, but give us a rough guess, how many of those patients stick with you even after you've had that had, had to refer them in and get them care because of their insurance? It may seem hard to believe, but I will tell you right now, that number is close to 80%. Because what people are finding now is that their deductibles are high, their co-pays are high, and they don't find that even in some of the practices they go to that are on their insurance, they don't see the technology that we have. And so if you go back to what matters to patients, what matters to them is they go to a doctor who is good, and that would be, I think, most of us, if not all of us, on this today. And anybody who's watching, I believe we all have skills. The challenge though is, do we have the technology to be able to make us really amazing at our job? And I can't bear it when a patient comes in and I can't figure out for them what's going on. I think that's a problem we probably all have, Erin. I want to fix it. I want to know what it is right now. And I'm as impatient about it as I think they are. Definitely, definitely. So how do you put it together? Um, you know. We, we spoke and you referenced a little bit about forum and uh, just to reiterate for a moment there too, the things that we were both, I think, uh, talking about just prior to even getting on and, and doing this today. Uh, here, you've got the, the true image that we talked about. We want that resolution. We wanna make sure that we've got the best and the latest in the standard of care, but that now is transitioning, right? We're in a data-driven world. Talk to us a little bit about what Forum has meant to your practice and why you use Forum. And by the way, that's what we're looking at now for those of you who are wondering, where do I get a piece of technology like this? This is a view inside a Forum of an angioplex, so an angiogram that's been overlaid on a retinal image and giving you change over time. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that, April. You know, I uh, jumped into the whole world of forum early on and I found that it was one of those things where as an image management software, uh, a lot of people don't understand the value and uh, don't even look into it because they don't see that they can bill a code to an insurance plan for a purchase like that. The problem is without it, you have no good way to be able to bring all of these images together. And at the beginning, it was just a matter of, a viewing software. What it's really turned into though, Forum has become so much bigger than that because it allows us to look for change over time. It allows you to, as Aaron said, and he'll show you here on this image, bring all these pictures together, all of the data that you're collecting and be able to then dive into it and look at the data in a deeper way right there on the screen in front of the patient in real time and be able to then take images from three months ago, two weeks ago, last year, bring them together and software within Forum that actually shows you change over time. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's also critical to keep in mind is that we've got a set of very, uh, the screen that we're looking at here, very high resolution uh, angiograms that have been taken and they're run, uh, the images are being montaged or overlaid against a, a, a set of retinal images that were taken on the same device. But if you wanna really take this stuff and unlock it, uh, I think that's where you start to be able to mix and match. And so if you've got a device that's able to take a high resolution retinal image, and you can overlay something like we're looking at here where we've got enhanced depth imaging of the, <clears throat> of the capillary plexus that's surrounding the optic nerve. But let's say we took this even a little bit further, which is available internationally and going through some uh, clearance with the FDA right now here in the US. If you had the ability in this particular image, April, to take and know that what the change over time in the capillary perfusion was. Uh, so now you're looking at a superior nerve finding and you think maybe there's some glaucoma there. Uh, what does that capillary change over time look like or any other condition for that matter? Uh, in diabetes, it's going to be mission critical that we're watching the capillaries. These types of uh, new changes, I think, are, are really exciting. And if you don't build it on the bedrock of, of a great retinal imaging uh, platform that can take a true color uh, set of images that is able to give you high resolution and that resolution now is able to be delivered in, in such a fashion so that you can take your angiogram and, and lay these two on top of each other, uh, then, then you've invested in unfortunately some maybe 
good technology, but not necessarily the right technology to tell the entire uh, story for, for patients and to, to kind of prove the point. Um, in forum in particular, and, and I want to just jump on one more thing that you said there, April, forum is, is a data management system. It's not just grabbing a couple of thumbnails. It's what's happening inside the data. And even on this picture here, you see this little orange spot right in the middle of the angiogram. That is actually a measured foveal vascular zone. You want to know what that size looks like over time. Uh, we've seen plenty of other and, and we've talked, we're talking here about, diabe about diabetes, but uh, we've seen plenty of studies more, more recently around cognitive function and nerve fiber layer thickness. And when we start to need data like that to counsel our patients and to drive them in the right places uh, for their care and their, their well-being, it's really important that our software tools and technologies are there to support us and can put it all together. April, any closing thoughts? Any more, any, what, what would you leave our colleagues with if you could leave them with one more piece? You know, I think that all it takes is for us as individuals to be the patient one time in our life and see how disjointed sometimes other offices are, not even in eye care, but overall. But all it takes is one time and it makes you appreciate so much the fact that you can go into a practice like ours, be able to go in with an issue, in mind something that's bothering you some something that needs to be resolved and know with peace of mind that you have you're at the right place because you have the technology in the building the doctor there knows how to bring all of the data together to be able to solve your problems today and maybe i can't fix it maybe as the doctor i wasn't able to fix the problem at that moment in time but in the case I showed you, that patient was able to leave having an exact knowledge, exact understanding of what was going on. And I can tell you the other thing that really does make a difference, like Aaron made reference to, when you can explain to a patient and show them the data and you know break it down to them in a simple way, you can take a non-compliant diabetic patient and turn them around. You can totally change their life because now they've seen not to be funny, but they've seen with their own eyes exactly how this disease is going to impact them and is already. So it's it's a life-changing experience as a doctor to have technology and to have the tools in my hands to be able to change my patients' lives. You know, April, I, I love something that you just highlighted there uh, with regards to you've got this long view. You've got a, a long-term relationship view with your patient and you're investing in the technology in your practice because you care for these people over time and it, it, it sounds to me and I know from knowing you over the years that you do intend to care for them for many years to come and and that's unique about us as eye care providers in particular I think optometry and, and the, the role that we take the effort that we make in, in that regard uh, so with that I want to pass this back over to Paul and uh, have him give us a few of, of his pearls associated with helping patients with diabetes manage and conquer uh, this condition so that they can live amazingly healthy lifestyles and, and we can take what we've done in the exam room as we've engaged patients, as they've seen their images, as we've taken the data, as we've invested in technologies that create for us platforms by which we are seen as the leading expert or at least as the quarterback in, in that role play with patients in this condition. Um, I'll hand it to Paul and let him leave us with a few of his amazing pearls uh, here today. So thank you so much uh, for this time to address you. April, it was great presenting with you as well. Paul, why don't you take it from here? So a really awesome presentation by uh, both of my colleagues. You know, how can we use uh, this technology to help us address the diabetes epidemic? So what it allows us, I think, in broad scope is earlier detection of undiagnosed diabetes in this, you know, eight plus percent uh, number of patients that have diabetes but have not been identified as having diabetic retinopathy, uh, that have prediabetes, uh, and we can detect it earlier with this technology. It allows us earlier detection of diabetic retinopathy lesions uh, through looking at the uh, ultra-wide field images, looking at perfusion of the uh, foveal avascular zone. It allows earlier intervention, and I think it's really important that we as primary care 
providers. As optometrists, that's what most of us are, that we have to remember prevention is better than cure. So if we can prevent people from getting diabetic retinopathy by talking with them about improved metabolic control or helping them delay the diagnosis of diabetes by taking a walk 30 minutes a day, which has been shown to cut the risk of developing type 2 diabetes in high-risk patients by about 60%. So that, these are great things we can do. But if we can prevent diabetes in the first place, that's really kind of one of the things I try to focus on in my practice, where I have thousands of patients now that have pre-diabetes, and they want to know, how do I go about not developing eye disease? And I tell them the main way is by not getting diabetes in the first place. We can have a big impact on our patients by talking to them about prevention. With that, I'll bid you adieu. It's been a real honor speaking, uh, presenting today with Aaron and April, and we're gonna be hanging around after this presentation to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks very much. Americans that have diabetes, uh, and it's accounting for a lot of healthcare expenditures in the U.S. Of total healthcare dollars spent, diabetes accounts for one in five. For Medicare recipients, it's one in three dollars spent on diabetes. Three hundred twenty-two billion dollars were spent when this slide was made, which was 2016, on both pre-diabetes and diabetes. A new report came out last month in the journal Diabetes Care said that caring for diabetes alone in 2017 cost the US economy $327 billion. So that's essentially two Hurricane Katrinas every year 
uh, accounted for by expenditures on diabetes. And the majority of that is going for uh, medical care. And there's also, uh, you know, about 70, $80 billion in lost productivity. In addition, though, to these, uh, you know, 30 million people that have diabetes, there's about 86 million that have a disease called prediabetes. The majority of these folks will go on and develop diabetes if something isn't done to intervene. So it's really a public health catastrophe. And in the US, we're actually doing better than a lot of other parts of the world, which I'll talk about in a moment. So these are 2017 diabetes statistics from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, they say 30.3 million Americans had diabetes, but about 7 million of those folks were undiagnosed. In addition, there's, they say 84 million people have prediabetes. Most people think it's above 100 million now if you talk to kind of epidemiological experts in diabetes. But nonetheless, you know, if you pool these two groups together, we're talking a significant number of Americans. 1.4 million Americans right now are legally blind from an ocular complication of diabetes. And it's typically diabetic macular edema or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. About 8 million total Americans have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. Worldwide, a billion people are expected to have diabetes by the year 2050. Right now, it's at about 600 million. So that's really an astounding number. The fastest rates of diabetes uh, prevalence are, are growing in uh, Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, and probably because they've imported uh, not only our goods, but also our Western uh, lifestyle, which includes a diet that is too high in calories, too high in carbohydrates, uh, loss of uh, physical activity, more sedentary lifestyles, all things that increase the risk of developing, especially type 2 diabetes. So we know that diabetic retinopathy specifically, that rates are higher in certain populations, including people of color, African Americans, Latino and Native Americans, and people from the Pacific Island uh, groups are much more likely to develop diabetes. Macular edema, as it turns out, diabetic macular edema is the biggest cause of vision loss in diabetes, much more common than is proliferative disease, but often these two entities go hand in hand. We know based on large, well done uh, studies looking at how do you prevent uh, diabetic retinopathy and severe vision loss, that if patients can improve their metabolic control, including blood sugar, blood pressure, and to a lesser extent, blood lipids, that that will lower the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy and for retinopathy getting worse and causing vision loss. The, probably the most important risk factor is disease duration. How long you've had diabetes determines whether or not you're more or less likely to have diabetic retinopathy. Uh, most experts say that everybody eventually gets diabetic retinopathy if they have diabetes. It's not a matter of, of if, but when it will happen. And we really, you know, we have new uh, ways of looking at the retina now that show us that a lot of people that heretofore wouldn't have been diagnosed as having diabetic retinopathy actually have retinopathy here and now today. And we'll talk more about that as we move through the cases. It's important to realize there's really no level of average blood glucose that is hemoglobin A1C that is totally protective against diabetic retinopathy. We all need to educate our patients about prevention, but there is no level below which retinopathy does not occur. So that's an important point. That's why these folks need to be followed up on a regular basis. So DR and DME in the US, there's about 8 million people, which is 27% of people with diabetes in the United States have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. About 6 million are already diagnosed, but that means 2 million are not yet diagnosed. So there's a large pool of patients out there walking around, have not been identified as having diabetic retinopathy. And when they're not identified, they're less likely to go in for routine care, less likely to have early intervention that prevents vision loss. Specifically around diabetic macular edema, a little more than 2 million have some degree of macular edema, and 800,000 are not yet diagnosed. And even those diagnosed, a fair number are not receiving treatment. So this is really an area where optometrists can step up to the plate and help our patients with DME get referred in for appropriate treatment in a more timely fashion. 
This is an international study from Yao that said that worldwide, about 10% of all diabetes patients have site-threatening diabetic retinopathy. So that's defined as either proliferative diabetic retinopathy or center-involved diabetic macular edema. That is, the center of the macula is thickened and patients are at imminent risk of losing vision. So that's worldwide. It's about 10%. In the U.S., you know, there's not really hard data on this, but if you look at the numbers, it's somewhere between 5 and 6%, so a little better in the United States overall. The problem really of diabetes, I think, is worse than I've already alluded to, because if you look at uh, NHANES data, that's the National Health and Nutrition Examination, Examination Survey, that uh, diabetes prevalence in adults over age 18 was somewhere between 12 and 14 percent, and that's six years ago in 2012. At the same time, they found out that about 38 percent of all U.S. adults have prediabetes. This a condition where blood glucose levels are elevated, but they haven't quite crossed the quantitative threshold for being labeled as having diabetes. But if you add these two groups together, those with prediabetes and those with diabetes, it turns out that's more than 50% of all U.S. adults. So that's pretty scary. And when you get to older ages, above age 65, the numbers go up. It's about 83% of people over 65 have diabetes or prediabetes. So you can't say you haven't seen a patient today with either diabetes or prediabetes. If you look to your left or look to your right, there's probably someone, if it's not you, that either has diabetes or prediabetes. It's something we're going to be seeing a lot more of. So 84 plus million Americans have prediabetes. An interesting thing to know is that upwards of 10% of these patients have ophthalmoscopic signs of diabetic retinopathy. So I kind of asked this rhetorical question. If they've got microaneurysms, hemorrhages, heart exudates, and they've got prediabetes, do they have prediabetic retinopathy? Obviously not. They've got diabetic retinopathy that hasn't been diagnosed yet. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, which include we're not necessarily doing the most accurate or uh, high yield tests for diagnosing diabetes early on. And that's why about one in five newly diagnosed type two patients already have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. And that's using the old standards, looking with a Volk lens, looking you know, with a binocular indirect ophthalmoscope, not even using the great technologies we're gonna be talking about today, which will yield a, a much higher number of patients that already have some degree of retinopathy. It's important to know, you know, one of the things about early diagnosis is, first of all, we're not doing a good job of it because we're looking only at blood sugar and specifically fasting blood sugar. That's what the average primary care physician does. And it's a great test if somebody definitively has diabetes for a while, but it doesn't pick up on the disease early. We know by the time the average person with type 2 diabetes gets diagnosed that more than half of their beta cells in the pancreas to produce insulin are not working anymore. They're being burned out essentially. The pancreas goes into overdrive and so the beta cells die out. And that the mean duration of diabetes at diagnosis is about 6.2 years. And that's based both on the prevalence of retinopathy and the amount of beta cell destruction at the time of diagnosis. The point here really is that if you detect any lesions that are consistent with diabetic retinopathy, we as eye care providers can help uh, yield an earlier diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And that hopefully will lead to earlier intervention and better outcomes long term. Because remember, diabetic retinopathy doesn't occur in isolation. It goes hand in hand with dramatically increased risk of cardiovascular disease and renal disease and neurological uh, dysfunction as a result of diabetes. One in 10 patients gets diagnosed with type 2 diabetes for the first time in the emergency room after they've had a heart attack. And that's pretty sad. So I've talked to a lot of patients that say, you know, I just found out I have diabetes in the hospital. I had a heart attack and they told me my blood sugar was crazy high. Well, you know, a lot of these patients have been living with the condition for years. It hasn't been diagnosed uh, early on. That's the problem. So these are kind of classic lesions, right, that we've all been trained uh, and retrained to detect in our patients. And we can see, you know, obvious, you know, 
uh, hard exudates on the upper left and somebody with proliferative retinopathy on the upper right and then more severe exudates on the lower right. And then, of course, with optical coherence tomography, especially SDOCT, uh, we have the ability to detect exquisitely small amounts of macular edema now. And these tools are really wonderful. But I want us to know that diabetic retinopathy is not just this stuff. Diabetic retinopathy also includes things like the following. So here's a patient, you know, if you look at the patient, you know, with typical examination techniques with a fundus uh, lens or a direct ophthalmoscope or even a conventional retinal camera, there's very little retinopathy in the central 45 degrees. If you go outside the central 45 degrees, though, we see a whole lot of action going on. And this is what the new research is saying is that people that have a lot of peripheral retinopathy are dramatically more likely to develop severe sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy and may need intervention earlier on than they would have otherwise. If you don't look at the peripheral retina, you're not going to see this stuff. So that's one example of where you know, excellent technology can help us do a better job. You can throw a BIO on, but I would venture to say a lot of us, when we're looking at our diabetic patients, we're not looking uh, as sensitively at the peripheral retina. We're spending more time on where we think the action is, which is the posterior pole. And granted, that's really important. That's where vision occurs. But what you're seeing in the periphery is a harbinger of what is going to happen in the, in the posterior pole in the future. So it's really important to look. Here's another example of a new technology we're going to be talking about today that shows a patient that has very little diabetic retinopathy on clinical exam, maybe you know a couple of microaneurysms, but the patient's best corrected vision is down. There's no cataract. This is a young patient. Uh, our colleague Jay Haney uh, shared this with me. And so why does this patient have reduced vision? You wouldn't really know unless you did this particular test, which is an OCT and geography test. And it shows this patient has enlargement of the foveal avascular zone and dramatic capillary dropout. There's nothing that really can be done for this patient in terms of clinical intervention right now. Uh, we can try to prevent progression of the disease, but there's nothing that's going to restore this patient's vision. So OCTA is an exquisite way to let us see these kinds of manifestations of diabetes. And the estimate is based on fluorescein angiography, somewhere between 8 and 10% of all people with diabetic retinopathy also have foveal ischemia. So it's really the ugly stepsister of diabetic retinopathy that we don't spend as much talk, time talking about, especially in optometry, because we're not typically doing fluorescein angiography. So now we're going to have Dr. Leck uh, present uh, some interesting eye-opening information about the economics of diabetes care. Aaron? Well, Paul, thank you so much for, for that introduction and, uh, and giving us such a, a, a wealth of information. You are, are always such a, a, a spout of information, at least for me. And I know for April, uh, when I look to an expert on diabetes in this field, and in particular in eye care, but especially as it pertains to how we affect many other specialties and integrate uh, with the larger healthcare community, uh, you are, are definitely the probably the, the best and, um, and most sought after resource. So thank you again for that. Uh, to get down to some brass tacks here, I guess we're going to speak a little bit more about some of the elements around the economics of diabetics. And, and this isn't to say just directly diabetes and its economics in our practice, but maybe the way in which uh, that drop in the pond, so to speak, the ripple effects across our practices and what those may look like. But I want to start off with, I think, the first acknowledgement, and that is that when we add technology to the care of the diabetic patient, that the equation changes. No longer does one plus one equal two. It might equal four, it might equal three, but it equals some other number that's larger than itself. So uh, the first thing that I want to make sure we leave the audience with today is that investing in technology and continuing to have a plan and pathway in your practices to invest in technology is only going to benefit patients who have diabetes and are in your practices, as well as the wealth of patients that are in your practices that don't have these conditions. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, as we invested from a practice standpoint on our side, what I wanted to share with you was what some of those metrics look like. Because 
it's easy to get esoteric and talk about something like one plus one equals three, and now we're in a theoretical discussion, but when we really look at things, what happens across a practice? So for us, we manage a lot of cataract patients, and typically out there in the industry, you'll see in cataract conversion rate, rates somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 25 um, to 30 percent uh, premium IOLs and premium procedures is a, is, a, is a typical number that you'll find in a practice that is doing really well at converting. We found that with the implementation of technology, and remind you, a lot of these patients with diabetes are early cataract patients, that number sits at 130 percent across our patient base. Those types of numbers don't happen because you just kind of throw caution to the wind and tell somebody they have a cataract and it's now time to go get that procedure done. But you need the technology to demonstrate things to patients so that they understand what their options are. In addition to that, we found that the engagement with our di patients with diabetes in practice has really increased our, our total medical revenues to the tune of about $300 per average medical revenue on a, on a patient per year. That's not saying that we're doing only $300 uh, in collections on a patient with diabetes per year, but we're seeing these increases uh, across the entire spectrum by in introducing and then implementing and utilizing medical technologies. We're also seeing with patients in, in terms of the care and active care of diabetes, about two and a half average number of visits per year that we're seeing these patients in. And that number translates well, right? If we're looking at a number like $300 per average medical revenue on patient and a 2.5 number in terms of return visits, these numbers start to make a little bit more sense. But what happens to the, the patients when it comes to things like recall? There's all sorts of systems out there for recall and ways to get really good at this. You know, what we've found is that when patients are engaged in their healthcare, they show up. And in our case, in our practice, it's about 80% of those patients return yearly for their diabetic eye exam. I would challenge you to find a recall system that's out there in industry that is able to provide that sort of return patients here because of the engagement with the technology they see and understand their condition better and they are coming back and they're taking uh, our recommendations and where else does that spill over into well the biggest rave right now in in uh, our field at least in optometry and eye care is dry eye and dry eye disease 54 percent of these patients suffer from dry eye we know that that's a a, a well-founded fact <clears throat> if you're looking to grow a set of patients like that in your practice why wouldn't you continue to engage more deeply, invest in the technology of capturing the imagination of these patients, and then engage them in other ways where they have demonstrated needs? Now, out there, the other piece that I, I think at least we find in our practice is how do you balance managed care and vision care plans versus medical? If you look at any, any of the um, discussions uh, across OD wire in, in particular, uh, this topic is it could could probably weave its way into just about any threat and and I think that's unique it's something to really consider because <clears throat> the vision plan patient is one of those patients that uh, crosses over from a diabetes standpoint but the vision plan patient is a patient that routinely within practice uh, can be uh, the, the at least the the way in which the vision plans will have us believe is that they bring patients into our practice what we see when we engage a patient with diabetes then on a two to one ratio they out refer the patients into our practice additional patients these aren't just patients who struggle with diabetes but these are patients of all walks of life and so I think it's important to understand that when we engage in caring for patients who need this care, that they refer patients into us, they return more often. And finally, what does that mean for us? Well, the big number across our practice has been that about $150,000 a year is the increase in revenue per full-time equivalent doctor that we've seen by deeply engaging in technology, employing these tools, and working with patients uh, much more closely to help them understand their care and implement uh, new technologies in that those spheres. So that's the economics of diabetes, hopefully from a, a boots on the ground level. And in, in our practice, that's a four doctor uh, group practice that uh, is stationed in the middle of California where most people would tell you that you can't do much medical care. Um, I think that those numbers show something very different. 
So let's talk then about uh, the technology and what does it mean to bring in technology? What does industry-leading technology look like and, and why should you consider it? Uh, <clears throat> in terms of industry-leading technology, one of the first pieces that's always on my mind, and I'm sure April is on yours, is what kind of investment is taking place in keeping us ahead of the curve? And you see an image here in front of you in which we've got an angioplex image. So the angiography that's been taken and it's overlaid on a black and white image of the fundus behind us. You can see um, in images like this where uh, first off, for most of us coming out of school now, we may have seen these things, but those of us uh, like myself and April and Paul who graduated quite a few years earlier, none of this stuff existed before. So how do we how do we tackle this? Well, the, the images don't have to just be ahead of the curve, but they have to be something that's easy to use. This exam, uh, image that I've got in front of us, April, this is the first time I think that this has really been put out there nationally. That's a uh, 14 by 14 millimeter uh, montage uh, of a series of eight by eight scans. So what happens in this particular image, this is coming out in 11.1 on the series with angiography, is a series of images are taken. The technician doesn't have to, doesn't have to direct them. It's machine guided basically to grab these. They're montaged and then what you just saw there was the black and white with the overlay depth imaging associated. What do you think of that image, April? It's amazing. How would you use something like this just for a moment um, in practice? What what could you see? How, how could you see a patient engaging with this? You know, I think, it, like you said before, for a patient to come into our office and see something like this, it will completely change their entire thought process of why they come to the eye doctor. I mean, it's incredible. They uh, They will know the difference in a practice when they can see what's happening in their own eye. Hopefully it will change behaviors for them as well. So they'll be more compliant and we'll see better outcomes and better vision long-term. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. This second image here, um, similar type stuff. Again, you've got a montage. Here you've got a, a number of six, six by six images. So six millimeter by six millimeter images that have been stitched together. And then again, that same overlay with the, the depth imaging and being able to know at what level we're looking at things. It's just pretty phenomenal in terms of the technologies that are coming down the pipe and really right around the corner. <clears throat> but how about the stuff that exists today? So in practice today for April, for myself, for Paul, one of the things that we really need is the ability to detect, and, and this I think for all of you, the, the detect uh, ability to detect early what's happening around diabetic changes. Gone are the days in which we try to take a photograph alone. We need resolution, we need the ability to uh, tackle issues associated with blood flow. And so on this particular image, you can see a contrast of an image without um, clinical diabetic retinopathy and one that's a non-diabetic patient. Both of these, when you would look at the image in the retina uh, on a traditional photo or maybe with a 90D lens, you're not gonna see a whole lot going on. But as you can see with angioplex, you've got areas of foveal and vascular zone dropout, you've got small microaneurysms, those are critical factors. How do, they do, how do they show up though when we get into a traditional OCT? So here we have a known diabetic patient. In this particular case, if you look at the side-by-side -side comparisons of the, the same eye, or the right eye and the left eye, I should say, uh, these are normal OCTs. Anybody uh, who could dial into this and, and spend some time just going through the tomogram slices and spending time reviewing this wouldn't see too much going on that, that looks wrong or off. As a matter of fact, when it compares to the normative databases, it seems like this person's as healthy as could be. But when we look a little bit deeper and we've got something like OCT angiography as we did in the preceding slides, here we see on a three by three segment of the foveal that there's a lot of disruption at the foveal vascular zone. And so there's a circle that's on this particular slide that we're looking at that is drawing our attention. And in that particular area, when we zoom in just a little bit more, we see broken areas of the foveal vascular zone, we see some early microaneurysms, and we know that those microaneurysms and the detection of those microaneurysms are the earliest sign in the body of any sort of changes associated with diabetes. So that would include nephropathy, diabetic retinopathy, and the like. Now we have the ability with an imaging device that captures this in three seconds to see that level of detail and engage a patient. A patient who in the past, five years ago, 
three, four years ago, even I might have done a traditional OCT on, looked with the 90 adapter lens, said, hey, you're in great shape. Here we have a microaneurysm. And I think that's the important piece to, to keep in mind as we go through this is that when we look with the new technologies, we need to be able to have a technology that differentiates from what our traditional training and, and things are. And I think the other question that this brings up for me, and, and April, I'm not sure uh, you know, where you fall on this, but the other question it brings up is if I can do this on a patient that doesn't have any clinical signs, and this patient reports that maybe they're a diabetic, but they're well controlled, uh, what does that argue for the general population? I mean, for me, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Does this become the gold standard? Does this replace, you know, right now we dilate every patient. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a tough question. I think it makes us all know that we really don't have enough right now without technology to be able to do a fabulous job for our patients. And really, that's what I'm in the game to do. I want to do the best job I can. Yeah, so bigger discussion, but... Um, definitely gives us some food for thought. Uh, the second case, another healthy patient with diabetes. You can see on the OCT report that's here, again, normative findings across the entire piece, uh, compares really well. The EDTRS uh, map uh, doesn't show any thickness changes that are going on. And then when we dive a little bit deeper into this and we look at a six by six angioplex that was taken, you can see in the entire map there on the left and the map of the deep retinal plexus that there are changes. There are physical changes in the capillaries. Um, you see a bunch of capillary dropout, possibly some early microaneurysms. And this is on a low resolution six by six OCT. So you're not looking at a three by three millimeter segment um, where maybe there's a little bit more data concentrated over a smaller area, but we can clearly see it. And when we look in that deep retinal plexus, there is just a bunch of loss uh, around the capillaries. And again, those kind of microaneurysms and things that are existing, these things uh, are, are um, they give me a lot of concern. When I look at this and know that I missed this in the past, um, the first thing I think that oftentimes comes up with patients in, in conversation is, they go, well, why didn't we see this last time? And, uh, and my, my, my response to them has to be, uh, we didn't have the ability to do it. And, uh, and we couldn't see or we couldn't operate in this mode before. They said, so what's your, what are you doing as we go forward? Well, we're continuing to invest in technology and these technologies that we have now give us a lot more information. So the patients are engaged, they understand, they understand that change is coming, but how does that sit with the rest of our colleagues out there and all of you who are listening and, and participating in this? Um, I would urge you to really consider, does your technology uh, allow you to stay ahead of the curve and, and really challenge um, you know, in, in what you do? So another piece of technology that has changed uh, today is ultra wide field. And in the past, we've all gotten used to an ultra wide field uh, sort of modality that provides us with a, a decent view of the periphery, maybe isn't super patient friendly in the way in which the uh, exam is taken. But we all know that if technology is worth it, we invest in it, even if it's not the most conducive from a, a patient perspective. So what are new technologies in terms of ultra wide field though that they're out now? And, and I would argue that there are two, probably three the main pieces about ultra wide field that I really look for. One, patient comfort. And, and I think that that's a big one. We're in a very uh, high touch environment with our patients. Our patients have a lot of choice in the marketplace, trying to be aware of and sensitive to their choice and the way in which we conduct our evaluations or exams you know, becomes an important piece. The second, and I think the very critical pieces for us in the exam room though, uh, really focus a little bit more around resolution and uh, really around true color. Is it, what, what does it look like what we really know it should look like? And so with that, I just wanna uh, reintroduce for those of you who have already heard this um, about the Claris, but um, for those of you who haven't who are and don't know about Claris, I wanna introduce to you Claris, which I think is a phenomenal piece of technology that allows us to get an ultra wide field image through a set, a two stitched um, montage. Um, the views are, are amazing. And, and let me just demonstrate those to you here on the screen because I could, go into a bunch of words, but you can see here on the screen what a traditional fundus image looks like when we're looking with a 90 diopter lens or a direct ophthalmoscope, and now what we have with wide field. And that, that image that you're looking at there is not a staged image. 
uh, we'll, as we'll dive into here in a few moments, you'll see that uh, images across patients with disease and problems associated with diabetes and a host of other conditions uh, also get an equally clear image that goes from the posterior pole all the way out to the periphery. True color, as I referenced just a few moments ago, is another really important factor, especially when we're going to be evaluating change in the nerve over time and pallor, things like that. Uh, we all know that getting a good photograph in, in traditional photography uh, in, in eye care can be a little bit challenging at times, and some of the players out there uh, struggle with true color because they're not actually using the full spectrum uh, in their their lighting sources. So they might be using a scanning laser technology or a single source light emitting diode. Here you've got a, a red, green, blue spectrum. And that's why in the Claris that you see on the left hand side of your screen, you see actually a true color. It looks like that when you look through a 90 diopter lens as well as when you're getting the image from the Claris. When it comes to the photography and, and being able to capture an image, this is a single image of a Claris. Uh, and on this particular image, you'll notice that there are findings associated with diabetes in this particular eye. But what's really cool is that was a single shot. And when we dial it in and dial it in a little bit more, I'll just flip back to that for a moment. When we dial it all the way in, you can see that the resolution here in the posterior pole is quite significant. And we could even blow that up a little bit more and look at some of the, my, uh, some of the vasculature and changes that we're seeing here with this diabetic patient. In this particular case uh, where we've got a side-by-side -side comparison, this is the same eye. It's just taken with two wide field devices, the Claris and a, and a kind of a, a traditional or previous market leader in wide field. You'll see that we've got, we want to see a little bit more of what's going on at the posterior pole. And April, this is, you and I know this already just from practice and what we've seen, but you can see that that image is beautiful there on the left-hand side. It is uh, an image that we would love to have taken with a traditional fundus camera, but this was taken with an ultra wide field and um, being able to dive into that level of detail, you can contrast it with the image that's on the right and there's just no difference there. April, what does that mean to you in practice? You know, I think that we need to be able to uh, look at a picture and know that it's a true picture. We need to be able to look at detail and then be able to follow patients over time. And it's very difficult to do that without a clear image. Sure. Just another uh, image getting out into the periphery. I, I think that, again, staying on, on course with not just the true image, but being able to get great resolution out into the periphery. So you can go from that posterior pole and then extending this out into the periphery. We see that resolution is consistent all the way across the set of retinal images that we just took. So those are some really great cases, Aaron. So uh, a little bit more about, you know, the value of uh, predominantly peripheral diabetic retinopathy lesions. There was a study published a couple of years ago and some follow-up now from the Joslin Diabetes Center showing that people that have predominantly peripheral diabetic retinopathy, so more lesions outside of the central 45 degrees than within the central 45 degrees, those folks are about three times more likely to develop a significant worsening of their diabetic retinopathy and almost five times more likely to develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And in fact, the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network, which is this consortium of a bunch of retinal specialty practices, trying to pool all their data together to get quicker results in terms of new treatments for diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema. The newest protocol, which is AA, is looking at this exact question. Does evaluating the peripheral retina help us to predict which patients are going to go on and develop significant diabetic retinopathy and require earlier intervention and more frequent follow-up. So that's that trial is ongoing right now, protocol AA. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of the Claris specifically, in addition to giving us spectacularly high quality ultra wide field and wide field retinal images, is the ability to use fundus autofluorescence to detect diabetic retinopathy lesions that might not be caught otherwise. So this was an interesting study showing that FAF shows significantly more microaneurysms than does standard color photography or even 
black on white color photography. So FAF highlights these lesions. It's exquisitely sensitive at picking up on uh, blood vessel abnormalities and in, for that matter, retinal hemorrhages. And so it's something that I'm using now more and more frequently when I'm screening patients for diabetic retinopathy. Looking at the FAF image allows me to see uh, more of what's going on in that patient's fundus. So now we're gonna switch back to Aaron and April who are gonna go over some very interesting cases with respect to uh, OCT uh, use and OCTA in uh, several different conditions. So I wanna dive into one final um, you know, case here before I pass it off, uh, April, a little bit more to get into even more nuts and bolts on what this looks into practice. Uh, this unfortunately is a case in which I don't have an ultra wide field image for. And the reason that I don't have an ultra wide field image in this particular case is because this patient passed away before the technology existed for us. Now, even OCT angiography, this patient um, wasn't able to sit for uh, because that technology wasn't available for us. He was, this was a 38 year old male that I saw in my practice, 2020 contact lens wear with absolutely no significant health problems. Maybe he was a little bit carrying a little bit of ex, you know, a few extra pounds, but didn't have any other challenges. And what you're seeing is two macular OCTs. So at the time, we were taking macular OCTs on every single patient that we saw. And we started to pick up some early and subtle changes in this particular patient. And what this caused us to do was dive a little bit deeper. And when we dove deeper and sent this individual in for a set of labs, just to kind of give you some context, he had an A1C of uh, north of 13. And his, the rest of his labs, as you could imagine, were completely out of whack as well. He had two young little girls and his wife. As we tested a little bit further, looking at both eyes and, and using the technology that we had at the time, he went on to develop papilledema. The papilledema, uh, got, we ended up able, being able to get it under control as we can, got his diabetes under control. And um, <clears throat> eventually, though, he succumbed to his disease. And I was uh, let his his wife came into the practice uh, one day just to let us know, but she didn't just let us know that that she had that we had, had lost him um, to the to the disease, but she was letting us know because she was so appreciative of the extra years of life that she ended up having. And Paul stated this a little bit earlier, but with regards to patients, that 10% of the patients with diabetes present for the first time in their condition to the ER with myocardial infarction. I think that's something really to keep in mind. In this particular case, while we weren't able to see this individual uh, through on the condition, him spending those few extra years with his, those two daughters and with his wife um, was a really, really important piece. And I think it's a, it's a sombering a note of the role that we can play and do play in our patients' lives uh, on a daily basis. And so with that, and, and not to leave us on a downer at all, but with that, I want to I want to pass this over to April because putting this together in practice on a day-in, day-out basis becomes just the most imperative piece for me and what we can do for our patients. So April, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Aaron. You know, it's interesting, as he said, the the one thing that I think we all agree on, and if you've ever heard me speak before, I'll tell you, and I've, I've said it before, we get paid to solve our patients' problems. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we make them see, we make, we do a lot of things, we, we save people's lives, we change their lives, but what they come in expecting from us is that we are going to solve the problems, and some of them that they don't even know exist. And so if we look at how do we put this together in practice? We've heard a lot of things about how this is important and the difference it can make to our practice. But what I do in my office is anyone who comes into the office who's getting a comprehensive eye health evaluation, that for me includes an OCT screening, their visual field screening, and then wide field photos. If they're paying cash, it's part of that entire process. It's not an extra charge. If it's an insurance, uh, patient, if they're coming in with any type of insurance plan, and we still want to do it as a screening, which means it's done before the doctor sees the patient, and so there will be an extra charge for those patients. And then I think the last thing, as you see on the slide, all results are reviewed with concern or celebration. And so what does that mean? That means when a patient comes in, they have these images done, 
we don't just take them and then I look at them in the back room and then we move on with the exam. I'll go in and we'll open up the images and forum. We show the patients exactly what we've done that day and how amazing it is that everything's okay. And then what we're gonna do next year to be able to compare over time. And that's the nice thing about having multiple technologies and having forum because you can bring all of it together in one concise photo, an image, one, one screen, to be able to demonstrate to your patient all of the things that you found that day. And, and not only be able to show them all the results, but be able to talk through it so they know the importance and what makes us different. So let's talk about a patient that actually came into the office and how this all took place. So this patient actually came in with his wife. She is a patient of mine. He had never seen me before. And she brought him in to see me because he'd been having difficulty with his vision. So let's look at the, the stats here. He's a 46-year-old black male, decreased vision in his right eye for a few days, he says. And he describes it to me as a darkness over his vision. He says he has diabetes. He knows he does. It was diagnosed about a year ago. He has no idea what any of his numbers are and uh, admits that he's not at all compliant with anything a doctor has told him in the past. His last eye exam was 10 years ago and he wears no glasses. So again, he came in to see me because his wife said she comes in to see me. She's had multiple issues herself. But she brings him in, she's sitting in the exam room with him, and it was actually so, so wonderful when, when you have the ability to change people's lives like this. She says, you know, Dr. Jasper, I brought him in to see you. You're not on our insurance plan. We don't care. We just want to see you because we know that you can figure this out and figure it out quick. And, you know, it sounds silly to think that people put time ahead of sometimes their health. But I don't think we put time ahead of our health. What we do is we want to have the best of all worlds. Everybody has a job. They have to go back to work. And to be able to know that they're going to go to a practice where a doctor has technology that they'll be able to use to determine what the problem is and figure it out quickly and come up with a solution, that's worth gold. So now let's look at what the numbers are. So his vision, best corrected vision in his right eye was 2070 and left eye 2025. His pressures are 44 and 43, and you can imagine I double and triple checked, and his cup to disc ratio you see as well. So he came in with blurred vision. This is what we end up finding, and that's not uncommon, but what I love about having the technology that we have in our practice is that here's a diabetic patient coming in thinking diabetes is his problem, and in the slides we've seen before this, many times diabetes is, in this case, look at what the pictures show. So here you can see the macula, right eye, left eye. And as you look at this image, we can see that even though this patient came in thinking maybe it was one thing, and I don't know that he had any idea what was going on, we can see what he ends up having is central serous retinopathy. And if we look at the next image, what you're gonna see is the macula next to the nerve. So now we know he comes in with blurred vision. That's his biggest concern. He's not really too worried about the fact that he's got pressures of 44 and 43. He doesn't know what that means to him. He just says, Dr. Jasper, fix my vision. Okay. So here's what we have right. for his images. The and challenge we're back. now I have is and that we're not on his insurance plan. Off. As we all know, he's no. gonna need a little more care than just his visit today. Better and so worse. now I have the it images to be able yeah, to know, show him and say, signal. this is what's okay, going on. Okay. Yeah, and and this is what we really need to oh, be need thinking about he as far as he doesn't, what he doesn't to need do headphones. Charlie needs no headphones. But and I think that as we look sure back and we talk about true images and we talk about are we getting a real picture, it can be very challenging when we don't have the right technology because we don't have an ability to put together all of the facts and again be able to solve our patients' problems in the best way. What we ended up doing with this patient is uh, okay, so you I was able to get on the phone and get him in to see a, a, a doctor a, a that day um, who was no, able to, who was on his insurance. Were off and they were I reassured them the, they were so not just, happy about he, having he to go see someone else, I but I explained told. to them this is a long-term <laughs> process. I would love to have you keep coming in to see me, but if you would go to see this doctor this time. Hey! Oh, there we go. I'm I'm cut off here, but that's okay. Okay, we can move over. And is that me making those rustling noises? There's plenty of room Okay, and is that me? No. Okay, good. 
Are we on? We are on. Hello, everyone. We are back. You can see here the mystery guest has arrived. He does not have an infographic, but this is the one and only Dr. Charlie McBride. How's it going, Charlie? It's good. Thanks for uh, the invite. So, um, yeah, so so Charlie actually is my OD, and he lives, you know, right up the road in Beaverton. He decided to make the trek down here uh, to see what it's all about. So what do you, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, it's cool. cool. It's vast. It's huge. All <laughs> this loft is awesome, isn't it? <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's kind of funny. You know, we were we were just upstairs. You know, as the little movie was running here, we were just talking about a bunch of different stuff. And uh, Charlie's got a very long history uh, in eye care and in contact lenses specifically. His his family's been doing this for how many years? You what? A third generation OD? Third? Yeah, my I t practiced with my dad, and it was his his father's practice before him, and wow. the practice started in 1948. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was telling Gretchen, my grandfather was the head of the contact lens department at Pacific University in the 50s. Wow. And you have a cousin who's also an optometrist. I do, yeah. Unrelated practices, but um, yeah. That's a lot of McBride optometry in this area. <laughs> it is. Were you allowed to not become an optometrist? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, definitely. In fact, I was pushed away from it. Really? Yeah, I decided as a young child this is what I was going to do, and my mom was worried, well, he's just being influenced by his, uh, you know, his heritage too much. So she tried to make sure that um, I had other opportunities. So what prompted you to continue down that path? Yeah, I idolized my dad. Mm. Um, did you you liked what he did? Did you work in his office when you were young? Yeah, as a child, I was the contact lens boiler, you know, to disinfect them. Oh wow! Now we're getting in the wayback machine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I used to have to measure the gas perms, you know, measure base curve and power and diameter and label them and file them. And, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's so funny. And you practice in the McBride building in, in downtown Beaverton. How long have you guys been in that location? Is it Since the mid 80s. Okay, so not not all the way back. You but always, that's still a long time. It's still a long time. time. But, and before that, were you guys always in Beaverton? Or? Oh yeah, uh, just two blocks down <laughs> on the same street. And before that, a block over. Right. And yeah, always the same neighborhood. So you have a child yourself. Mm -hmm. Will you be in son? Son, four son. and a half. Will you be encouraging your son to go into optometry? No, you can put me in the camp. That's not going to encourage their children. It's just uh, too much uncertainty for me right now. Interesting, interesting. I like that. Yeah. Well, we were talking earlier that you are going to have a new associate come to your practice, and you're having some changes in your practice, and you're trying to figure it all out. Yeah, so my dad retired in... 1999, December of 1999, he decided to, t to take a month off and he just never came back. So that was <laughs> the retirement. And so I've been a solo practitioner since then. And, um, you know, half a dozen years ago, I had a, uh, a young woman who graduated from Oregon State University. Um, what was her major? I should know. I think biology with a minor in Spanish. And, um, you know, she applied essentially as a receptionist, and she was going to take off a, a year or two before applying to medical school. And, you know, after she was there a few weeks, you could tell this is a really talented individual. And so I made her, promoted her. Um, uh, in fact, I made a position for her. I, I didn't previously have a clinical assistant, but hmm. from then on I did. And treated her uh, very much like an intern. Um, uh, and she, you know, I, I, I tried to talk her out of it more than once. <laughs> she... Um, she decided to apply to optometry school, and she graduates this uh, this coming spring. So that's really uh, exciting. Time Here we go. Now, did she do one of her rotations in your office? She did not. But I, as I said, I treated her like an intern, so she got to know everything. Um, you know, I knew. She, in fact, we got our our OCT, the Heidelberg Spectralis, mm -hmm. while she was there. So she got to train on that, and and she's ended up training. Um, you know, a number of folks at Pacific University that, uh, you know, and how, she, how that instrument works. She definitely had the it factor. You know, I'm a patient in Charlie's practice, and one thing that was obvious, she, she was that she, it's almost like she ran the place. That's the feeling I got when I was there. Mm -hmm. You know, she could tell that she would take charge and do stuff, and I guess when you find a person like that, you don't really want to let them go. Well, it was a smart move on your part, too, because you now have an associate coming in who is fully trained 
in how your office works. She knows what you like to do. It's the patients be, know who she yep. is right. already, and so there's not going to be any reluctance to, uh, yep. you know, to see her instead of me. In fact, I fear they're probably going to choose her over me. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. That is a very good problem yeah. to have. So she'll be plug and play. That's yeah. a I, really great way to do it. I think so. And we also, you know, we. Um, our, our EHR is is Uprise from from Vision Web, right? And she was there when we converted from old paper charts to um, to to EHR. So she knows your EHR. She already. knows the EHR already. She's an expert at She's it. She's going to walk in that first day, and you can take a long lunch, take the afternoon <laughs> off. <Right. laughs> and she knows all the staff, and she 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 holds their respect. And um, I'm excited. I'm excited to take a vacation. It's been a long time. <laughs> Do you have a vacation planned? I don't. <laughs> the world is, is my oyster and my wife's oyster and my four and a half year old's oyster. That'll be exciting. Yeah. That'll so, be really exciting. So, you know, one thing that you obviously you post a lot on ODY and everyone knows you, there's the, the um, what do they even refer to it as, the McBride hiring practice, right? You had a, the secret strategy for hiring staff. Oh, secret strategy. And, and, and you, oh, you tried yeah. to share it with us. Has anyone actually listened to you? Because, you know, based on my experience in your office, you do seem to get really good people, which is hard, especially in this, this area. How do you do it? So, I, you know, first you have to find some venue to advertise on. And, you know, I oftentimes use Craigslist. Most recently I use Indeed. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are other potential venues, but pretty much you, you, have, you put out a feeler and um, you know, tell people a little bit about who you are, not too much, and, and you essentially give them a, a little minor chore, some little instruction. And for example, you know, you know, this is our, a little bit of our practice, this is what we're looking for, um, please... Wear pants to the interview? Well, please, <laughs> please you know, write a paragraph about right. you know, who you are, where you're from, and what makes you tick. Well, first of all, you get half of them that say, well, what makes me tick is when somebody is too noisy when they're having a conversation. They don't even know what that means. Right. Well, you throw those out. Or some don't even follow instructions. Well, that, that's right. They don't even write the paragraph. They just you know, send a resume. So you just get to weed out all the riffraff, and you end up with you know, 20. Um, you know, people that respond properly, and, and half of those are no good. So then you have 10 decent ones, and then you start, you give them another little chore. Now send us your resume, and then you get to do that. And now, you know, anybody just, just whittle it down, and um, it's worked well. So your colleagues will, I'm going to say it, they will bitch that it is time <laughs> consuming, yep. and nobody has time for that. I have an open position. I want somebody in there. I don't have time uh, to go through round after round. I don't have time to look at some paragraph. Why should I do that? Yeah, but a bad staff member, that's time consuming. That's painful. That's expensive. Way better to spend the, the time on the front end than, than on the back. And I mentioned recently, I was on OD Wire that one of the biggest mistakes I've made as, as an employer is not firing people fast enough. Mm -hmm. You know, once you know, it's hard to do, it sucks, but once you know, do it. Don't, don't put it off. What? No, we're <laughs> we, agreeing. We ever, we're, we're t that, that man out there, I'm so sorry, your services are no longer needed. <laughs> We're just talking about firing people. I know that's something you love doing. So oh, we're absolutely. talking to Paul off camera yeah. here. <laughs> God, you, you you enjoy firing people, Paul? I, I, I no, I enjoy telling my office manager to fire them. Oh, <laughs> so if you didn't yeah. hear that, he enjoys telling his office manager to fire people, which is not really the same thing. No, no not no. in the least. All right, you have to get your glass of wine, so. Adam and I don't look like the Oh, I don't care if they think I'm Oh, yes, it's absolutely. Um, so the question I had for you, so a couple of years ago, so Charlie had a great optician, a great uh, guy. Oh, yeah. And, and I remember he retired, and you were freaking out about it. How did, how's it gone since? So that was, uh, that was rough. I ended up hiring a 30-year-old... Um, you know, I, he had some opticianry experience, but he, he worked in a geology lab. A geology <laughs> lab? Yeah. A, a, one of the brightest people I have, um, I have ever come into contact with. I mean, he was a true genius. You know, semi-autistic and um, not the best dresser. Oh, boy. Um, but, you know, he knew every... But he was in the lab, well, did you say? He was in a geology lab. Oh, a geology lab. But, but okay. I hired him, uh, right. you know, as an optician, and he just, frankly, I mean, 
really, really bright guy. Um, actually fun to work with, but, but not so good with patients, not well received, mm -hmm. and flaky. He was calling in sick, you know, at least one day a week, and you know, in a, in a small practice of just you a, can't have that. a handful of staff members, you can't have that. And so I, I let him go, and I had seen the writing on the wall, so I had hired somebody else to train under him, and, um, and I had to let her go too. And, and then I hired a, basically my ad said, you know, very high pay for an optician. Right. And then so I, I paid through the nose for a, a very experienced optician, which So that's just the other question, experience versus train yourself. Sometimes you have to untrain them. Right. Because you know, I used to be a staffer, so I know what that's like. I know how ODs think or yeah, but, don't. But in my case, I was so busy. You know, I am so busy. I don't have time to train somebody. And frankly, I'm not very good at that any, anymore. I do much less opticianry than I did when I first, mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. got out. So not your wheelhouse. It's no law. I mean, uh, you know, I can still. Well, you can do it, but it's not where you best spend your time. No, definitely not. So you think for opticians, at least, it's better to hire experienced and uh, pay? I think it's harder to find a good optician these days than it is a good optometrist. Hmm. Wow. You know, we, so we don't, we don't any longer have an opticianry school in Oregon. We used to at Portland Community College. Right. And, and I forget what year that closed, but it was about, it was a give or take, you know, at late 90s. Uh, mid to late 90s, and, and ever since then, I mean, it is tough to find a good optician. But you were in a, living in the land of Shangri-La for a long time. Most ODs don't have an optician program near them, so that's been their lot in life their entire career. And so maybe with opticians, it's a little, maybe that's a little different from being a tech because for hiring experience, but a lot of docs complain that their opticians are taking out such a big chunk of their labor costs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's a question of whether that's worth it. Some might say yes, some might say no. You would definitely say yes. It's worth it. Yeah. Speaking of optical, I had a question. And you know, Charlie, you're, you don't like to get into controversy, but I do. <laughs> and Strap you know, yourself in, Charlie. So strap yourself in, because I was talking to Gretchen about this this morning. You know, it's, it's 5 in the morning. I'm cranky because I'm awake and getting ready to come here. And I told Gretchen, I'm like, I'm going to talk about something controversial today. So have at I it. I like it. So I posted on ODWire, Wire, there was a, an article in the LA Times very recently um, where the, the columnist was doing an expose on it was the cost of, of eyewear. And I was met with some criticism. <laughs> <laughs> on the site, you know, saying that, oh, you oh know, he just you, doesn't know the industry. He doesn't know the industry, and oh, why are you worried about this? And, you know, and I just made a point. I'm like, well, you know, this, you know, a high end phone costs about the same as a high end pair of, of glasses, but you can, you know, to a patient, which has more value, right? Which looks like it's more valuable. So uh, people didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, what do you think about that? You've been around long enough to know. Did you read the article first Did of you all? read it? I did. Yeah. Yep. What did you think? And I read some of the responses. Um, you know, I can, see, I can see the author's point for sure. Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think as optometrists, we put too much emphasis on, um, you know, on the actual piece of, uh, the actual pair of, on the actual good rather than the service that's required to produce the good, the service that's required to, to, um, to manage the good, you know, afterwards. Um, you, know, uh, you know, a pair of glasses, who cares if it's not well adjusted, if it's, if it's so uncomfortable it can't be worn? Right. Well, that's worth something, but as optometrists historically, we don't charge to, for, for adjustments, and, and we should. And, and maybe in its place, we sh should charge less for the actual pair of glasses and more for that, that important part. Um, for your skill and expertise. For your skill and expertise, yes, right. absolutely. So to me, devil's advocate, 1995 called. That was the same argument way back then when doctors were getting more involved with medical optometry and we're going to have less emphasis on selling product we're going to have more emphasis on professional services. And here we are, 2019, I got the year right, and we're ha having the same conversation. Yep. Why? Ask Adam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why, why is that, you know? I mean, it's, there, there's a perception of value that I think is missing, that, that, that it's not being communicated properly. I mean, why is Warby Parker, why do they exist? Why have they done so well? 
you know? I think the reason they've done so well is we as a society have shown that we place a much greater value on convenience. Weren't you just talking to me this morning about Amazon right now or what is it called where you pay extra and they'll show up in 10 minutes with whatever you order? That is true. That's convenience. You want convenience. If you want the batteries for our wireless packs, you want them right now. Right. Patients want everything right now. I don't want to drive across town. I don't want to wait in line. I don't want to get in traffic. I want to be able to do it in my bunny slippers like all of you watching us right now. And so I think that patients are willing to pay for that. And I also think that on the whole, optometrists have done a really piss poor job of educating the public, consumers, about what happens. Nobody knows what an optometrist does. All they know is, well, you're not the one who does surgery. You know, and to be fair, optometrists are performing a lot more medical care and charging for their pro pro professional services. But the patients know that? Uh, that's a good question. Do know. you narrate your exam? Okay, Mrs. Smith, what I'm doing right now, I'm putting you in this machine and I'm going to be able to look um, and I'm going to check the fit of your contact lenses and now I'm taking a look to see at how you're... <laughs> no, do you don't. think that would better educate your patients? I think that would be the most obnoxious thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it might be, but there are some people who advocate, maybe not narrating to the nth degree and you don't want to overwhelm them with medical jargon, but as you're performing an action, okay, now I am doing this. And I'm doing this because, not because I've got 10 minutes to kill, but here's why I want to look into the back of your eye. Here's what I can find. This is why it's important and why you, Mrs. Smith, need to do this every year, especially because you're diabetic. You have to consider, mine is an old practice, and I sort of lope along from one patient to another And I'm not giving you a hard time. Five minutes. I'm playing you know. devil's advocate. Well, but I have plenty of time to, you know, to talk and chit-chat. We do talk through issues, you know optic nerves and, 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 and glaucoma, and what is glaucoma and macular di disease and... Do they know um, you can treat that? My patients do. Is it because you told them? Or because you just do it? I'm just because I do it, yeah. The conversation doesn't even have to occur. It's just everybody sort of knows. We've been doing it so long. Well, do you have patients who say, well, I have glaucoma, I need to go see an ophthalmologist, or I need to go see doctor, insert whoever? Yeah, not anymore. When I mm. first practiced, that, yes, absolutely. But 20 years on, um, it's very rare. Occasionally, you know, it happens still. Right, but, right. But almost never. It, That's it's, good. It's, it's an exception. It's great. That's good. So it seems like your patients have a very good concept of what you do and why you do it. I don't know if that's across the board. So if you combine the lack of knowledge, awareness, and understanding of what optometry does, what with this driving need for convenience, that's why we have Warby Parker. Well, I think, I think like the, the, the other part that people ignore, I have the Warby Parker website up, up here right now. These things look every bit the $800 glasses until you actually, you know, get them. Get them. <laughs> and then it maybe falls apart a little bit, but to someone who's looking at this online, and to be fair, they aren't that bad. Oh, no, they're not, they're not terrible. It's not like you got them at a gas station, right? I mean, they are not that bad. <laughs> like you can with your but cosmetic the, contact lenses. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, yeah, so for, for many people, you know, they're, they're good enough, right? Um, and I think that's, that's also part of the problem, right? Yeah, as an aside, compared to all the other Internet vendors of eyeglasses, I find Warby Parker's to be the least accurate in terms of prescription quality. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think... Um, Adam and I were, we were ranting about this as we got coffee at 6.30 this morning or whatever time it was. And I said, I think doctors need to be aware that this information is out there because you might have a patient who comes in and says, well, that, that's if you're lucky enough to have a patient say this. Most would just walk mm -hmm. and say, well, Dr. McBride, I read this article that says that these glasses don't need to be that expensive. And Consumer Reports had something a year or two ago talking about the cost of eyeglasses. So I don't know that patients are educated. So my analogy was my phone happens to be a six, but if you have a 10, obviously if you go buy a 10 right now, that's going to cost more than a six. Right. So if you buy the latest, like, there you go. That's a 10. There you go. See? Yes. So your phone was more expensive than mine. <laughs> and especially <laughs> now. I mean, and when we bought them at the same time, if you had a six, but if you're buying a phone right now, that's the latest technology. This isn't. So if a patient is purchasing a frame that requires a licensing fee, like Armani or 
Disney or Kate Spade, that costs money. Or if your patient is getting the latest lens technology, if you get the latest Verilux Pal, that's going to cost more than getting right. the technology from two years ago. So all of these technologies go in, and I think that's an analogy that patients would understand. That an iPhone 10 right now will cost more off the shelf than a brand new iPhone 6. So that's the other thing. I mean, patients certainly can get something that is less expensive, but how many people are coming and saying that? They're not. They're going to Warby Parker, or they're right. going to Costco, or Target, or whatever they perceive is less than Dr. McBride's office. And you frequently don't get the opportunity to educate them like that because they're out the door. Comment. Yes. You can pass it on. But what if you could, just, by magic now, start getting an iPhone from China for 50 bucks that just, uh, just does about the same thing that your fancy iPhone does? A lot of people will do and, it. And like getting a pair of glasses from Walgreens that you can get for reading. Unless you and perceive... What would be the perception of value then? It depends. Is it going to work just about as well? So I don't know if people could hear, but Paul is suggesting what if patients could, or consumers can get an iPhone from China for 50 bucks, and it would look just like mine or Charlie's, right. but it would cost less. So I think people would try it, and pretty soon if they perceive the value was not great, if it didn't work, they would rather pay $800 for a phone that works than 50 bucks for a phone that doesn't. <laughs> Case in point. Case in point. So um, I think that's, that's a valid question, and I think frequently people who are doing it every day just really don't think about it, and know. patients just walk. Nobody wants to sit there and argue and say, I can't afford that. There's a lot of pride involved. So should there be an economy section in every optometric office? I think a lot of practices have that. A lot of practices do have frames that are not as expensive, but how do you train your optician? Are you going to say, here's your regulation army frame or here's your Armani frame or here's your Kate Spade frame or here's your Oliver Peoples frame or you know whatever. You obviously as a business owner want your staff to try to, for, as a business owner you want your staff to get the highest ticket possible but as a practitioner you want your patients to have the best thing possible to help their vision. I mean you don't care what frame somebody has but if you want somebody to have AR coding you want them to have AR coding. There's clinical reasons for that. Or I'm quote, just blabbing. You can jump yeah, in here no, anytime. No, no. <laughs> quote, quote Moonstruck when the plumber was selling the fixtures and said, do you want brass? Do um, you want that quality of brass or do you just want the same type of old steel that you had before? So you have to be able to sell, upsell, but make some sense out of it. Well, you also don't want to upsell so much that you alienate patients and a good person in your optical knows the difference. It's a very it's like being a server at a restaurant. You don't want to alienate people. I just very much dislike even the term upsell. Right. You know, you because you are people. a healthcare provider. Well, yeah, absolutely. You're a doctor. And you provide them what they, you know, well, you know it's fine to share options, but that our job isn't to sell. But, but then again, you don't want someone from a geology lab coming and trying to, you know, help patients out with this figuring out what they need, right? I mean, you need someone who's got a really and good touch. Good interpersonal skills. Yeah. a hell of a lot better in that $10 glass <laughs> than in that $2 glass. Wait, do I have the $2 glass? You got the 2 and that's the 10 Okay, I'm going to change the subject. So, <laughs> was, was there um, an OCTA lecture um, on OD Wire this year? There is supposed to be. Um, let me pull up the schedule. So I had two patients this week that I got to diagnose um, with exudative AMD, a conversion from the dry form to the wet form based on Yikes. OCTA technology. Mm. Wow, that's it's, exciting. It's, that sounds like an article, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, you know, so we just, we've had our OCTA. Well, we have five, yeah, five minutes. Yeah, so uh, Jerry Sherman was giving a talk on it today. Oh, so, excellent. Yeah. He knows the stuff. So we've only had ours for, um, I think it's been two months. The Heidelberg, Heidelberg Spectralis was pretty slow um, mm. with acquiring FDA approval. Um, but they finally got it, and so we have it. And um, it's nice. The acquisi acquisition speed is very slow, mm. which is kind of a bummer. Way slower than I've heard than, than Zeiss or the, um, any of the other units. Um, but the quality is outstanding. 
But essentially, you've got three different layers of capillaries in, in, the, um, in the retinal tissue. And, and then below in the, in the outer retina, you have a non-vascular zone. And that's the area you look at for um, conversion, for, for, for choroidal neovascularization. So normally, you pull up that layer, and it's you know, sort of black. And um, so I had two patients where you can actually see, it looks sort of like a C-fan frond. I mean, mm. it looks like new vascularization, and it's marvelous. That's crazy. I wonder if over time that's gonna become just a standard feature in OCT and everyone's gonna want it and the old units are gonna be thrown to the scrap heap. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect so. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's gonna be that fast though. It's, it's, it's um, at least with the spectralis, the acquisition speed is so slow. I mean, we How slow is slow? Um, I would estimate off the cuff about 60 seconds per eye. Oh, wow. Yeah, slow. So we're talking about the file size is about a gigabyte. Oh, boy. Whoa. Right. And so we're going to fill up our hard drive pretty fast. So, wow. Um, <laughs> right. So in essence, any tests we do that turn out normally, we are deleting them and just making a chart note. Wow. You don't need to keep it for baseline? Um... Can you save the file down? Turn so, it into a lower res image? So I don't think there is as much advantage uh, to a baseline OCTA as, you know, to a baseline OCT, you know, where you're actually comparing over time. Got it. Um, you know, if it's normal, it's normal. And if it's right. abnormal, it's not. Wow. So our friends at Zeiss, who I know you're listening because I know you, you have a booth here and I'm sure many of you are listening. If you could just tell me how long it takes to acquire one of those, I'd be really curious. Mm, yeah, I'm uh, cause, sure. Because I've only seen faster. the static images in the lectures before. I've never actually seen how, how it's acquired. Yeah, it's... On your next visit, you will. Yes. <laughs> that is true. If you, if you want to put me through the torture. Charlie's put me through all of his machines in the office, so... You're a guinea pig. I am a guinea pig. I've been, I've oh, been you'll, trying. You'll definitely see that the next time you're in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's an amazing technology. Yep. It seems really cool. We've had some content on that, and we've had a lot of interest. People are very interested in OCTA, and it can give you a lot of great information. <laughs> oh, well, we have a comment here. Paul, you are correct, according to Craig Thomas. Pay, uh, consumers will buy that $50 phone from China in two seconds. Yeah. Hey, Craig. <laughs> We're going to be talking to him we're later. Be, yeah, we're talking oh, right to him later. So, yeah, so we so can. Uh, that'll be. Well, we have to call Craig oh, Steinberg now. Is it time? Yes, it is time. Yes. Oh, gosh. You want okay. to talk to Craig Steinberg? Oh, with us? yes. Jeez, I went to the, uh, the driving range just this morning, and I always think about Craig when I'm at the driving range. Really? In a good oh. way or a bad way? Meaning, is, is he better than you, or are you better than him? Oh, no. I am. <laughs> He's. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm a troll under the bridge compared yeah. to Craig. So if you want to so. talk to him, if you take those headphones right there attached to that pack and just turn it on, um, turn the pack on, that, that was Paul's, so you can listen to the conversation. And I actually have to find the phone number, don't I? Here we go. I can tell you. It's right there. Okay. I won't yeah. You won't say it, Craig. 555-1212. <laughs> yeah. Paul doesn't know that was a faux pas, but uh, let's see. Oh, I guess I need to put my headphones back in. Yep. Got it? 818, what is it? Okay, I got it. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Is it all, all tangled up? You're all tangled up, okay. Got it? Alrighty, got it. Yeah, so all you have to do is turn that pack on. And there's a volume knob on it, so. Yeah, so the, there we go. Okay. Oh, yikes. There's a shooting in Louisiana. Oof, wonderful. Okay. Ready? Here we go. What a treat to be here. What a treat for you to be here. Gretchen met me at the door and gave me a hug. Hey, whoa. Hey, Craig, how's it going? Hey, Craig, it's Gretchen Good. and Adam, and we've got it's our mystery guest here. <laughs> you have a mystery guest? Yes. Were you, were you watching our live stream? No, actually, I was watching a golf tournament, and I just turned on your live stream like three or four seconds ago. Oh. Do you see who it is? Somebody's saying hello to you. It's Charlie McBride. Oh, Charlie. Hey, Craig. Oh, let me flip it on. Where is that, Charlie 
Last time I talked to you, you were getting married. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Am I doing that? Yes, that is you. That is totally you. <laughs> Sorry. Adam is having mic problems. Did I do that? Says Urkel. So, Craig, I wanted to uh, say that uh, we've got a lot of talk going on with VSP audits, and I know that you've um, you have a talk here that's talking about it. Is that correct? That's correct. And when is your talk? I should be looking at the schedule. Sorry, I'm falling down on the job. Let's see. Yeah. So from uh, it's at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Oh, okay. It's tomorrow. So you haven't had your talk yet. Excellent. I think oh. you're going to have a lot of interest because the article you wrote for Optometry Times got a lot of engagement and a lot of people interested. Did it really? Because I, I hadn't heard anything. I think I've I've gotten like one or two emails from people, but that's about it. Maybe everybody's just too busy being shell shocked. I don't know. Mm. Well, maybe if they get a phone call, you'll get one in return if they find that they're getting an audit. But I think people were very interested because things were changing and I think people weren't aware that a law in California can have a rippling effect out to all ODs right. uh, in, in the country. And it's important information to share. Yeah, I, I am certain people didn't have that knowledge because when the law started to be discussed and I learned about it and I contacted the AOA and, and some others, they had no idea. They, they were thinking, what am I talking about? Why would they care? And uh, I had to in, let them know that, that our contracts, that all of us that are VSP providers sign, says that California law applies. Hmm. And mo as you said, yeah, most people aren't aware of that. Would you say that is the most important thing that VSP doctors need to be aware of? Or if that's not it, what do you think it would be? No, I don't think that's the most important thing they need to be aware of. The most important thing that VSP doctors need to be aware of are the rules. Mm. Um, irrespective of what the law may be, the law is after the fact. That's, that comes into play after you've been audited and found to have violated the rules. Uh, what, what I find is a, a common thread among doctors that have a bad audit result is that they didn't even know they were breaking the rules. Um, and, you know, the rules are there in the provider manual. None of us want to look at it. It's like 500 pages long. Um, but that's the problem. So is, is that why doctors aren't aware of the rules? Because it's 500 pages long? It's, it's nobody wants to read it and understand it, even though it's important? Well, you know, I think it's a combination of things, Gretchen. When I went into practice many years ago now, uh, you know, the VSP manual was a booklet that, that came to us each year. They'd give us this three-ring binder with all the rules. And it was really simple to just kind of flip through it and maybe take a yellow highlighter and note a couple of things that were important. If I had a practice that did a lot of, uh, let's say, visually necessary contacts, I might be sure I go to that section and read through so I know what the rules are on that. Um, but now it's only online. And so it's not in front of you. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind, uh, and, and I doubt if many doctors even know how to find it. Is it not sent to doctors as a link? No, it is. No, not that I'm aware of. It's a good I question. So. Um, you know, it's there. It's, BSP's not hiding it or anything. But don't but you I think don't BSP recall. should provide it to their doctors? At I, least I think even it would with be an good... email to say, here's a link, go here to download it? Well, if, if I had my choice, I would, and I was um, in VSP's shoes, I would not only do that, but each year I would also include a bullet list of the important changes, because that's one of the problems is they update the manual regularly throughout the year, and they do it by um, usually in red letters putting the word new in the table of contents section where they've made a change, but they don't tell you what the change is. Hmm. So, okay, so maybe I'm misunderstanding something here. So how often, all right, that one was me, sorry. How often <laughs> does a doctor need to re-up with VSP? And I would think that that's almost a contract between the doctor and the company. So I'm unclear how the company could update the rules throughout the year because if you signed on, you know, December 31st, then these are the rules that are in effect for the year. So 
are, are they able to change the rules throughout the year like that? They, they are. The, the only restriction they really have legally is something called the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. They can't uh, make an unfair change. And, and don't get me wrong, some of the rule changes they make are in our favor. Um, they're updating the manual as they go. They're adding new products, new services, uh, and things like that. But I would like to see them do a better job of letting doctors know, maybe at the beginning of each year, uh, what's changed for 2019. Do you know why they don't do that? No, I, I don't. Okay. Do you have a guess? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I, I don't think they're trying to trick doctors, but um, I also don't think they're going out of their way to help doctors on that point either. It may be one of those things that no one has ever said to them, maybe you ought to do this. I don't know. Right, maybe it it's never occurred to them. a great question for VSP. Yeah. Got it. So, so it, if doctors aren't sent these rules and they are not that easy to find so first of all most doctors aren't seeing them and those who do see them do you think people even bother to read them well i, I think most of us probably don't i don't i don't think most of us read our provider contracts um, very often mm. um, they often go back many years and and we never see them again you know and it's not just vsp we obviously have rules we have to comply with for Medicare and, sure. and for Medicaid and, you know, everyone, IMED, and they all have differences in the rules. Uh, and, you know, doctors want to be doctors. They don't really feel like spending all their time reading manuals. Right. Right. I've got, I'm curious, Charlie, have you ever been audited by VSP? So, I think twice, but it was the little standard audit send in 10 charts, and, uh, and I failed one of them, actually. You got to pick the charts? Um, no, I think they picked them. Okay. You know, send in the, you know, these 10 charts from these patients that were seen within the last you know, three months or something. Right. And at the time, I actually, you know, number one, I wasn't signing my charts, and so you get dinged right. every time for that. And, and also, there were, I had no... This is back when I was using paper charts, and I didn't have a little checkbox for myopia and hyperopia and presbyopia and astigmatism, and so there was no official diagnosis made, even though it was you know, right. plainly obvious. Hmm. Anyway, and I never, you know, he fixed the problem, and they never and that was it. caused me any trouble. No, it was yeah. fine. So, yeah, I, I guess, Craig, you, you see things that have gone a bit further than that, usually, in your daily practice. <laughs> Yes, and you know, as I as I discussed in in my um, talk that's coming up tomorrow, I guess uh, VSP has two kinds of audits. One is the type that Charlie just described, which is a ten record mail in, uh, and we can call it an audit, but it's it's done by their quality assurance group, not by their fraud investigators, uh, and it's just a a cursory overview to make sure you are generally complying with the rules and if you're not they tell you what mistakes you've made and ask you to fix them that's very different than the um, unannounced in-office uh, audits that are performed by their special investigations unit where they already suspect you are violating the rules or maybe committing fraud hmm. right so I guess what's the the one thing that docs can do to, to try not to, to be lumped in group number two <laughs> and, and get that kind of audit the rules. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, one of the things people, doctors, need to be aware of is that VSP, because it's very large and they have a lot of claims and they have a lot of providers, they have very good, reliable data that doesn't vary a lot. Um, their standard deviations are small. And so they know what dispensing rates ought to be for contact lenses in your area. They know what eyeglass dispensing rates ought to be. They know what percentage of your um, dispensing should be progressives and what percentage should be trifocals and all these kinds of things. And they monitor all of that. And if you're violating the rules, it'll affect your statistics. It'll cause you to stand out. Um, if you are, for instance, using uh, contact lens benefits to pay for sunglasses for a certain percentage of your patients, uh, which is a relatively easy thing to do. You just bill as if you did contact lenses. VSP never knows. Um, but it'll result in your contact lens dispense rate being 
higher than normal. Mm. And so you'll stand out, and they'll look at your practice. They'll bring up your website. Do you hold yourself out as specializing in contact lenses or something like that? And they see, no, you're just an ordinary doctor like everybody else. Well, they become suspicious. They'll send surveys out then to 30 or 40 of your patients hmm. that um, were billed for contact lenses and ask, what did you get? And there's check boxes there. I got glasses. I got contacts. I got sunglasses. And only a small percentage of uh, people send those back. But if they send 100 out and they get 20 back, and five of those 20 uh, that were all supposed to be contact lenses say that they got sunglasses, you have a problem and you're going to get audited. And it was all triggered by your statistics being off a little bit, which of course follows from you not complying with the rules. So basically doctors become surprised. How did they catch me? And that's how they catch you. Craig, what if those patients purchase sunglasses out of pocket? Well, that's fine. If you didn't bill VSP for it, VSP is not going to um, going to be affected, your, your, uh, your dispense rate is not going to be affected. Mm -hmm. Your statistics remain normal. Okay. All right, I got you now. I got you. Right. So the devil's in the details. The devil's in the data details. Very often. Now, that said, if you happen to be a doctor that uh, solicits business from local ophthalmologists that do a lot of refractive surgery, and so you're doing a lot of scleral lenses, a lot of visually necessary um, contact lens work, you're just going to be a target of, right. of an audit because you are going to stand out and it's because of the nature of your practice. And, and that's okay, but you need to be aware of that and, and, and then be particularly careful. Charlie, have you read your manual? <laughs> um, no, I've read excerpts. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious because you are just our, our representative OD here. Yeah, no, I'm, with I'm, whom I comply with questions. I'm guilty, but every time Craig speaks, I make sure to attend his lectures. That's where I get my, uh, mm. you know, he's given a whole bunch of good advice. One of, the, one of my favorites is when, uh, when contact lenses are dispensed, you actually have to uh, make a note that they were dispensed. Hmm. When a pair of eyeglasses is dispensed, it's not enough just to dispense them. You have to make a note in the chart. And if you didn't write it down, you didn't do it. That's right. Huh. And yeah. even though that seems obvious, obviously if there's an order in there and you have information, you would think that you dispense the eyeglasses to the patient. Uh, absolutely. Well, but Gretchen, to, to give you a sense of how a VSP auditor views that, because that to you and I makes sense, but the VSP auditor says, how do we know that he didn't order the contact lenses and then send them back and for credit and you know so it would look like he actually uh, did the contact lens ordering boy that's a lot of work yeah. <laughs> fraud would be a lot Yet of I've, work yeah I, I have heard them make that argument huh wow well so Craig what's the most common thing that you've seen that people really run into trouble and that they should absolutely 100% avoid if, if they want to stay out of trouble I, I think the most common thing is inadequate documentation, uh, especially in the area of contact lens fitting. Mm. Um, you know, when you bill VSP for professional services associated with contact lenses, um, then you better have in your record that you actually provided some professional services related to contact lenses. So they, they don't necessarily expect a lot, but they want to see in the chart that you actually did Perhaps uh, you did acuities through the lenses, you did an over-refraction, you looked at the lenses in the slit lamp, and you've got some notation that they're fitting well, uh, and, and something like that. You can't um, order, if a patient comes in, they're wearing a disposable lens, and nothing's changed, and so you, you write a new prescription, and you say, I'm going to drop ship your next boxes to you, and you never looked at lenses on their eye, and then you bill for a fitting or a contact lens evaluation. If the chart doesn't have um, recorded that you actually did evaluation, uh, evaluation, then you're going to get in trouble. So, and that's probably the single most common, most frustrating thing, because the doctors will say to me, but I did it. I do it on everybody. And I say, but you didn't write it. Yeah. How mm -hmm. do we know? So, Craig, I use Uprise EHR, and there is a little place where, you know, the contact lens presenting 
automatically imports and so and I take acuities through there and then you know in the next little screen you get to it's just a little drop down you know click the lens is centered you know movement is is what it is and and there's something about alignment and um, I, I think about you often I wonder is that enough you know lens centered movement good it, it probably is because it shows that you actually looked um, the the danger that comes with those kinds of systems is uh, that it can create an opportunity for inconsistent information. Mm. And so uh, you need to be sure you're actually looking at, at what it says. And, um, I, right. I've seen charts where, uh, especially in primary eye care, where the doctors diagnosed, uh, let's say, an allergic conjunctivitis, and you look at the chart, and it says that the conjunctiva was clear, quiet, yes. and white, yes. right. you know, no papilla, no follicles. You know, where the diagnosis come from. Right. That's one thing I like about um, you know Uprise. It doesn't automatically um, uh, populate. Populate. All yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You actually have to make a little. It's fast, but mm -hmm. you do have to make a bit of an effort. So if something automatically populates on one hand, that could be easy. But if you're going quickly, it, you might forget to check or uncheck a certain box. Exactly. And then I mean, you would have the problem that Craig is describing. I see it all the time. I would imagine that almost certainly over the course of a career, that would come back to bite you at some point. Yeah. Yes. However, that said, you know, if, the, if VSP comes in looking at 40 records and they find that once, you're not going to really have a big problem from mm -hmm. it. Uh, they, they look for patterns. They look for... Uh, significant errors and, and generally their rule of thumb is that they expect about 10 percent of the records that they audit to have errors and it's when uh, they find over 10 percent that they start to uh, ding you and that's where they consider the audit to be a failure. What would you say in your next you know 100 cases that, um, that are brought to you what percentage are going to be good guys that are doing their best but just Missed something versus people who know they're trying to they're they're trying to get a, you know get away with something. Game the system. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good question. I've never really looked at it that way, but if if I had to guess, I'd say it's about a fifty fifty. Fifty fifty. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to ask Greg. Do people actually ever just confess to you straight up, like you know, I was trying to work my way around this rule. <laughs> like, this is what I was doing. Yeah, I mean they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they try not to confess. Well, it's a privileged say, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes it's it's just apparent. They right. um, they do acknowledge without confessing. They'll say, uh, "Yeah, you know, I I do sometimes bill uh, for contact lenses and then give the patient glasses because it's just easier." Right. And they feel like, well, you know, it's kind of a break even on dollars, and so they don't feel like they did anything necessarily wrong. And I say, well. BSP views it as wrong, and uh, you're going to get hit for those. And, you know, there are a lot of optometrists. There are a lot of uh, docs out there that are VSP providers, and roughly 35,000. If, if only a, a very small, you know, 0.2%, 0.3% are cheating, that's actually a fairly sizable number of people. Yep. And a lot of money. And a lot of money, and and VSP will catch most of them sooner or later. <laughs> right. Fifty percent, though. I'm still stuck on that number. I, I mean, am I naive? That, that, Does that seem it's high? It's a biased sample, though. It's fifty percent of people seeking out high-powered legal help. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, yeah, it's fifty percent of the people that have gotten caught right. um, and failed audits. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. It's not fifty percent of all doctors. They've yeah. already failed an audit when they call me. Okay, but some people are, it is an honest mistake, and you just, or you get into a rut of a bad habit, which I think is really easy. We all do that, and somebody needs to rein you back in and say, I, or it's like if you're using a machine at the gym, it's really easy to start using it incorrectly until somebody says, yeah, you really need to do it this way. I don't know, yeah. but 50% of people... I would say, Gretchen, the, the most common um, innocent error that I see is the situations where the staff was some one or two people on the staff were responsible for the VSP billing mm -hmm. and they were violating the VSP rules the doctor didn't even know because he or she paid no attention to it. Mm. And that's another problem if you delegate too much of it and you are not overseeing the tasks that are done 
your staff may be trying to rip you off. Your staff may have made an innocent mistake, but at the end of the day, yeah, you're the doctor and your butt's on the They're line. not even, um, they're, they're usually not trying to rip anyone off. They're usually just trying to go faster and they don't think there's any harm. Um, it, you know, the, they're, they're cutting corners and um, no one's checking what they're doing. So uh, occasionally it's, it's innocent errors in that they just didn't know how to do it. They were doing it wrong. Um, but often the staff was aware they were, or the, the individual was aware it wasn't being done right, but didn't think it mattered. Mm -hmm. You know, Craig, you, you were talking a lot about VSP today, but I'm wondering about Medicare too. Is that as big a problem or bigger for some people than getting VSP right? Well, you know, obviously uh, as our scope of practice evolves and we're providing more care to more older people and uh, a lot of glaucoma care and that sort of thing, we are definitely increasingly at risk of Medicare audits. I, my lecture that I give tomorrow, I'm actually, it actually starts with a brief discussion of Medicare audits uh, to contrast it later with the VSP audits. So I go quickly in that and how, you know, the three different kinds of VS, excuse me, of, of Medicare audits. Um, the thing about that, that protects us somewhat on the Medicare side is that even in a fairly busy optometry practice, we're a fairly small biller on the Medicare side. And so we don't stand out, um, you know, among the, the ophthalmologists that are predominantly Medicare driven. It's hard to show up on the radar on Medicare. Right. Huh. However, that said, one of their audits is not based on us. It's based on the procedure code. And so it comes out of uh, Washington where they focus on certain things that they're going to audit across the country. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was amniotic membrane use, for instance. Mm. Um, that was one of the uh, eye care related services that was being audited. And so if that's a procedure you do, you were um, at risk of being audited, not because you do it a lot or anything else, but just because that's a, a service they were auditing. This year, they're focusing on the use of new patient codes, mm -hmm. the 92004, 99203, 204, those things, new patient codes. And, it's, um, and I show in my lecture tomorrow, I show exactly where that is on the website um, because you can look on the Medicare website and they show you what codes are being audited right now. Oh, that was going to be my and next question. How do you know that? Hmm. They tell yeah. you. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, they'll tell you. Now, it, they... They audit uh, across the medical spectrum. So um, this year, the only codes that apply to optometry are those new patient codes. Um, but, you know, that can change from year to year. Most of the codes this year are in other areas of medicine. Got it. Right. So if you had one takeaway message for anybody listening to this, what would you tell them? I, I would give them two. Okay. Two take-home messages. Two for the price um, of one. Yes. One is um, spend a little time at the beginning of each year reviewing your, the manuals for your principal plans that you participate in. If it's VSP and IMED, then take those two and sit down and, and spend a Sunday afternoon and review them. Um, so that's one. And, and that can benefit you, too, because they add things. It's not just for compliance. It's also to see if you're leaving money on the table. Uh, and, and the other one is probably the hardest, but it's really committing to documenting well. You can't take shortcuts. What you said earlier in our talk, Gretchen, if you didn't write it, you didn't do it. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely true. Um, they, they audit your record. That's it. That's what they're looking at. They don't interview you. They don't talk to the patient. They look at your record. If it's mm -hmm. not in the record, you didn't do it. Yep. That's good advice. And that is good advice. And, and one final thing, Craig, if you could give everyone your website address so they could sign up for your newsletter. So if you want to get the most terrifying newsletter in your mailbox. Oh, way to sell it, Adam. <laughs> way to sell it. <laughs> terrifying but useful. Um, you know, I think people might want to sign up um, just so they can be updated on what's going on. How long have you had a newsletter? Yeah, I, uh, actually, I haven't sent anything out recently, but I do have a place to sign up on my uh, website, which is, cleverly enough, my name, Craig Steinberg Law dot com or c steinberg law dot com either one will work and uh there's an area on the left side where you can uh input your email address and and then if i have something to send out that's what i go to excellent awesome all right craig well thanks so much for being here and, and good luck with the class tomorrow
It's always great to talk Thank to you. you. Thanks, Craig. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you guys, and, and good seeing you, sort of, Charlie. <laughs> See you later. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. We really need to get our mic actions going here because we're blowing out each other's yeah, I don't, ears. I don't know what I'm doing here that's so wrong. Maybe I think you moved, I moved, and that was the problem. Yeah. I don't know. We'll He's such to... a nice guy. I'm he is him. great. I'm just going to do this. There we go. Yeah, I really like talking with Craig. Absolutely. And the article that he just, um, it went out on our newsletter. It's going to be on the cover of our upcoming February issue, which I'm finishing up now. It came from conversation on OD Wire where he was explaining some of this. And I said, can you extrapolate this out? Give me yeah. more detail. I think that would be a great article. Yeah, an important article. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. It's good information to have. So we, we only have like two people left to talk to today. Only one. Only one? Yep, just uh, Craig. What about Shane? Shane is, is that today or tomorrow? That's today. <laughs> so today's in the... Yes, he, he's in about two minutes. Is it Shane that we're talking yep. to? Mm -hmm. Yep. Want to switch? Want no, to well, I mean, well, actually, you know what, Charlie, are you interested? It's Vision Web, it's Uprise, it's your peeps. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll hang for just a few minutes. If you wanna, well, we're going to talk to LCT after that. Oh, that sounds good. You have good. to stay for yeah, that. Yeah, you got to stay for, for Craig Thomas. All right, I'm in. All right, so I will get. I will step out of the way for you a sure? couple you of don't, minutes. You don't just want to yeah. hang out here for Shane because he's going to be talking about insurance. Okay, I'll stay. All right, why don't we, we'll stay where we are. So We need more wine, though. I know. We've, we've I will out. go fetch it. All right, go for it. I will be the wine wench. <laughs> oh, Lordy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute you while you uh, go grab that. Thank so. you. There we go. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so it was interesting that, uh, you know. So we're off. No, we're on. Oh. Everyone can see us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but we just don't care. Okay. So. Shane, who was you represent? I forgot. Vision Web. Web. Who? Vision Web. Uprise. Yeah, that's a mystery to me. My, my, my EHR program, Paul, that I use when I check your eyes. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So, yeah. So. And Shane does, what does he do there? Insurance. I yes, remember so when he came on board now. there. Oh, man, just, he... Just be, I started with two questions. Make sure you ask him what Vision Web's all about. <laughs> A lot of people don't know. How can they not know what Vision Web is? It's only been around for like 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> <don't know. laughs> I, I think Paul's probably right. It, it's too high, too high tech. Um, but yeah, Shane. Take me as the lowest common denominator. I don't know. So, <laughs> people, I don't know. Um, so yeah, so Shane's going to be here in a minute. We're going to talk about insurance and claim management and so forth. So um, you know, I, I don't have too much experience with obviously with Uprise on the insurance side of things. It handles all that junk, right? I would imagine, right? Since it is part of Vision Web. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's probably one of its core strengths. I would imagine, right? Yes. Um, Cool. Well, yeah, we do all of our insurance billing in house, and it's um, well, we always have, but um, Uprise makes it easy. So, <laughs> what is going on out there? <laughs> the place is falling apart. I'll get Shane's number programmed in here while we wait. One, two. You want to open up another bottle of wine? What? Right? <laughs> I think I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> so Adam lives um, in a suburb of Portland, Oregon, called yes. Lake Oswego. It's a, it's an affluent area, and uh, I've lived in Beaverton my entire life, forty nine years, and and this was, believe it or not, the first time I have driven around the famous Lake Oswego. <laughs> And holy cow, I'm thinking, brother, I, I got to hang with you. I, I'm just shocked that you've never been over here in 49 years. I know. I mean, you would think that even like maybe like the high schools played each other in sports. Yes, they like, did. Or something but but like. I, I don't even remember catching a glimpse of the lake before. Yeah, well, the, the lake is actually hard to see for most of it, right? Because there are houses around it and there's no like public access. So it's really hard to actually get to, even for, for those of us who live here. Well, I, don't, I don't live on the lake. I mean, there, those, are, those houses are ridiculous, I'm there, sure. You, there's that and the yeah. fact that I live on the other side of the tracks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beaverton is actually, so, so for those who, who don't know the Portland area, Beaverton is actually a thriving suburb because uh, Nike, Right, that's where they Nike, made their home. Intel, and Intel. Oh, Tektronix. Right, so you had sort of all the big, you know, famous companies are now all, all located up there. That's why actually yeah. some of the schools in Beaverton are the best anywhere um, in the state. So. Yeah. 
Which is good for you, I guess, right? Public school for the kids? Yep. There you go. Yep. He so. starts kindergarten. Uh, oh my gosh. This fall. Wow. That's exciting. Yes, it's exciting. You want to see a picture of the little... And they're, they're doing full day now, right? It's full day kindergarten yes, now? Yeah, which yeah. freaks me out a little bit. Oh. Uh -huh. You're not driving, Gretchen. You can just... You're not driving either. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. So one of the, the benefits of living in Oregon, I mean, one of the, the negatives is that it's like constantly gray, but the, the only good thing is the grapes really like growing here. Yes. And, and so, yeah, the wine is uh, something else. Okay, that's my little fellow. Oh my gosh, not so little anymore. Nope. Oh, he's adorable. Nope, he's oh, wow. He looks just like you. He doesn't look like me at all, does he? I don't think so. I think so. All right, so let me uh, get Shane going here. Why is he not on my my thing here? Here you go. Now I got his number. He wasn't doing. Oh, you're looking for his sheet. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Why he's down there? Did he move days or something? I just put him in. You, you need the questions? No, 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 no. We have everything. But I had him. I was probably just having a senior moment when I put him on the. Yeah. Okay. I'll he's give him a call. Last on, so. Yeah. <laughs> You got you got the question? I, I okay. we 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 got him. Okay. <coughs> okay. I'm starting off with the first two, the ones I put in my colleagues. <laughs> Dr. Farkas? Hey, how's it going, Shane? I'm fine. How are you doing? Good. Do you have any time to talk? <laughs> Absolutely, man. <laughs> Excellent. I was getting a little paranoid that I was supposed to go in through a link and uh so I'm, I'm grateful that you called. Uh, my heart was starting to race a little bit. Uh, well, well th thanks for taking the time. So it's actually funny. It's not just me and Gretchen Bailey here today. I, Hi, we also Shane. have We have uh, Charlie McBride hey, here, too. I don't know if you know Charlie. Um, but I do not. Okay, so Charlie was one of the very first Uprise users. Um, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying. So we, we uh, signed on and well, went, went live. In, uh, as I recall, November 2014. And I was trying wow. to remember when you joined that Uprise team, and I was going to guess March of 2016? I've been here about four years now. Been here about four years. So I joined in February of, yeah, 15. Okay. Um, I was off. Yeah, they, 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 they acquired. Um, my little business, and uh, part of the reason was to uh, try to help with the insurance of Uprise, really. I remember, and it wasn't and, just a little uh, business you uh, you had. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, it, everything's relative. Everything's relative. I had done everything I could do with it, and it needed infrastructure and, and such, and so... Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's grown exponentially at VisionWeb, but... Um, for for a uh, one man band, it, it got to be pretty big, I, I suppose. Yeah. Right. You know. And so you know you have a, you have a lecture uh, here at CWR this year, the secrets of a high speed insurance engine. That sounds it, pretty <laughs> exciting and technologically advanced. <laughs> it does sound rather fancy. Well, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so no, I'm curious. Like, what is it all about? You know, um, I do CE these days uh, more than operations, and um, in past events, you know, I've got a lot of, um, from having my hands down actually in those processes, I know a lot of little tips and uh, tips of, you know, tricks of the trade and, and such, and in previous years, I've kind of gone over those things, those individual points where uh, practices can increase efficiency and hopefully increase revenue and reduce their burden, that type of thing. But it's a bit of a shotgun blast, and I've had uh, sometimes uh, I can see kind of the circuits frying in people's head. I get a little too nerdy. <laughs> and uh, so this year I tried to put together something a little higher level that just goes through each step of the process right? rather than individual bits of data, rather look at the process. And so hopefully um, your members can take what we do tomorrow. Right. And kind of break down their process and identify where their weaknesses are. Right. That's the point. Right. And so, and so you know, if you had to give some tips right now, just, you know, really briefly, I, I hopefully everyone will actually sit, you know, through, through the, uh, <laughs> sorry, before I get that, Craig Thomas says, ask Shane 
who taught him everything he knows. Oh boy. So you... Oh, Craig. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, I guess the answer is Craig Thomas? From... <laughs> yeah. Man, I remember back in the day, you know, I'm in Texas. You might can tell from my accent yeah. a little bit. And uh, Dr. Thomas is in Texas. And so um, he was, um, man, I was in awe of Dr. Thomas the first time I saw him. I, honestly, I think we all are. I saw him at, I saw him at a TOA event. And, um, you know, he's just, he's a man. So um, I remember approaching, they did, they did a room crawl at the end of the day, and I, I kind of made my way in there, even though I wasn't an OD, because I wanted to talk to him, to Dr. Thomas. And so, because um, I'm a bit of a billing nerd, so I kind of got him in a corner and started asking him questions, and he said, the, about five minutes in the co- conversation, he, you know, stopped me and said, where do you work? <laughs> and uh, how much are they paying you? And uh, it was a really big compliment because he was interested in, you know. But um, where did I learn uh, what I know? It really, <laughs> I uh, I was blessed out of college. I went to work at an insurance company. I worked at a health insurance company for about five years. And the fellow that owned it, it was privately owned. And the fellow that owned it was a graduate of the college I worked, uh, went, attended. And so I got an internship at the health insurance company, and for about a year, year and a half, he just let me go and uh, be the flunky of each VP of each department. Oh, that was an experience, um, I bet. Yeah, it was a great way to cut your teeth. You know, it was a great way to learn uh, where I fit into the business. And so everything from agents to underwriting and policy administration, just every department, and at the end of the day, he said, okay, so where do you want to work? And I said, well, policy administration, that seems to be um, where I'm drawn to. So uh, that's claims management and all of the things around it. And so it Just was a major medical and insurance administration company. policy doesn't sound very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, um, um, it, it was to me, you know, and I guess that's uh, – uh, I'm teasing what, better. I, when I when I get um, no, I totally get what you're saying, and and a lot of times people are like you know that they have that sentiment, and uh, to me it's a little bit of investigative work. You know, uh, I get to when I'm looking at claims and processes, I can try to break it down and and find out um, where something went wrong, right. and and it's not always obvious, and so. The um, that's the part I enjoy about it and increasing revenue and there's a demand for it you know there was um, there was a need and so putting food on the table was always good. There but, you go. So here's the thing then. So you have a lot of information locked away in your brain, things that we know nothing about, um, since you've made this literally your life for your career. Um, and you know I know in the lecture you're spilling out a lot of the the, the big tips, but I, I just have a question for people who are listening now. Can you just kind of give us like one or two big tips? Um, just so little tidbits th- so people can take away just from today, um, you know, tips about for people who are struggling with doing claims management. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first and foremost, pull your benefits. Um, so many practices do not do this well. And it means that essentially they're destined to fail ultimately. I mean, it's, it's the equivalent of, um, to me, I'm not an OD but just hung around with them for many, many years now. But it, to me, it's like the equivalent of performing an exam without a workup. You know, it's the gathering of this data that allows you to kind of, um, for you and your patients to make decisions about patient care with full knowledge of what the financial ramifications are going to be. And it's just human nature when, you know, you have information, decisions get made. And when you don't, there's hesitancy. Right, right. And so... Um, you know, even if the decision is to proceed with the test, um, without that info, the patient could likely get a bill after the fact, and then, you know, some aren't going to pay that bill, and others aren't going to return. So it helps with decision making. It helps with the office have an efficient checkout process. It helps the builder. It helps retention, um, all by doing a, a little work up front. You know, um, right. my degree is in business. And um, one of the things they uh, taught us in business school was that um, manufacturing a quality product is uh, actually cheaper than manufacturing a poorly made one because you don't have the expenses on the back end of trying to service something, and, right? And so it's kind of that same way. If you um, will invest a little in your processes up front, 
everything else works so much better. Right. And so, um, and it can be done in an efficient way and not and uh, necessarily an expensive way. Right. And you know, so that's, that's kind of a high level to, uh, tidbit. Mm-hmm. Um, if I may, I'll give you a kind of a specific one. Sure. Um, okay. Um, duplicate denials. That, that's probably the biggest thing I see in the industry. Um, it is the biggest denial. Um, I'm privy to a lot of data that comes through vision web. And so when I run, um, you know, metrics and pivot tables and those types of things, uh, duplicate denials are by far the biggest denial that optometrists get. Mm-hmm. So What's a duplicate denial? Just a, so thank you. I appreciate throwing I that over the plate there too, for me. So I'm glad you asked. The, um, let me distinguish between a rejection and a denial first. So uh, um, a lot of people use those terms interchangeably. Uh, a rejection is a claim that never was actually processed. Okay, so think of, a, think of if your um, front staff transposed a date of birth and, or uh, someone gave their maiden name and then they got married and the policy is changed at the poly- with the payer. Right. When that claim gets submitted, the payer is going to get it and they can't identify who the member is. And so they never actually process it, right? I mean, if they don't know who the member is, how could they process it? So that's a rejection. It's a claim that was never made it through the front door. When that claim gets corrected, it can just be sent in as a normal claim. You know, you don't have to uh, do anything special with it. You can correct the data, resubmit it to the clearinghouse or to the payer directly, and they're going to process it as a new claim because they never actually got one in their eyes. A denial, on the other hand, is a claim that was accepted for processing, but the terms of the policy didn't warrant payment. So think of a diagnosis code denial. Um, That claim was accepted. It was processed. And then because of uh, the, say, a nonspecific diagnosis code, they denied it. When that gets corrected, say someone put in – you know, glaucoma, but not a specific type, and the re- policy required it, then when that goes to get reprocessed, and if, if you don't refer to the initial submission, the insurance company verifies a certain amount of data points, uh, demographic information, data service, procedures, those types of things. And when there's a certain amount of those that are exactly the same, and there's no re- reference to the initial submission, that claim will be denied before it's even really examined. It, right. Auto adjudicated, it'll deny as a duplicate denial. And so um, you can identify those by looking for an adjustment code of OA18. Uh, you flip through your remits and see if you see in the legend a lot of OA18. And if so, someone's working really hard, they're resubmitting your claims. Um, but they're not referring to the initial submission. Right. And so how you do that is in box 22 on a CMS form. Uh, there's a little field there, for resubmission code. And you, the number seven goes there for a, number, for a corrected claim. Eight is avoided claim, by the way. Um, and then you put the claim control number or internal control number uh, that's on the uh, initial remit on that Uh, on the CMS form right next to it. And so that tells the insurance company that this is a corrected claim of of that that, um, submission, and then they'll process it as a new claim. Right. So, you know, before we started talking, Charlie and I were going back and forth. Charlie is an Uprise guy, and we were talking about um, claims management systems and so forth in in Uprise. And, um, you know, I guess, Charlie, you you, you don't even have a biller in your office, right? You, You are... I do. You do. And so I'm just kind of wondering, if you have a, a practice management system, what do you look for in terms of claims management to make their job easier or more efficient or less error prone? Um, and Dr. McBride, I do recognize you now that I've had a, a, a beat in your name. I uh, do recognize your last name. Um, and uprises has come so far, and Dr. McBride oh. could attest to that. Yes, so indeed. the... Um, a direct integration with the clearinghouse, that to me is from a claims perspective, that is the, um, the thing that you want to look for. Um, you have disparate systems, and the data doesn't update. 
if you if you're exporting or manually typing in your claims into a clearinghouse, right? Then this you know the the claim statuses, the submission, all of those things, they don't necessarily feed back into the practice management system, and so um, the data that you have is not necessarily accurate. And so for it, it's quite a task for a decent-sized practice to reconcile those systems manually. You know, long haul, depending on who's doing it and how much skin they have in the game, the AR reports become inaccurate, and uh, that means patient statements can't be sent with any degree of accuracy. Um, the AR can't be worked because it becomes an overwhelming task. Right. So direct, directly integrated clearinghouse would be my answer, and the deeper the integration, the better. Um, if I may, Uprise allows someone to pull benefits without going external to the system because all the demographic information, everything is already in there. Um, and it can go in the background and pull that data. It allows uh, info from the clearinghouse about uh, claim statuses, whether it's accepted or rejected by a clearinghouse or accepted or rejected by payer. Those are pushed back into the PM system and reconciled automatically. So, like Dr. McBride has that visibility and transparency. Someone can't hide whether they've submitted or not submitted a claim. Um, the payment data flows back into the ledger, so it can um, the outstanding balances can be reconciled rather easily uh, without a lot of redundant data entry work. So, yeah, having a directly connected clearinghouse will uh, kind of keep your data accurate and that just helps across the board. Right, and Charlie, I'm sure you've seen that versus using paper like you used to do. The process I'm sure has become a bit more efficient than it used to be in the old days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, I don't even know how people survive with paper anymore. It's uh, it has yeah. a lot to keep yeah. track of. Yeah, my gosh. Um, yeah, it's amazing how many practices still use paper though. It is, um, it is really interesting when it comes to that, charting that frankly I, I miss paper oh, yeah really? well you know just yeah, yeah when, when you're with <laughs> yeah. patient yeah but just for so much of this stuff i can't even imagine what it was like it's nice to have it all integrated yeah yeah well i know one of the things that i, I hear from optometrists um kind of over and over that are on paper is the fact that you know they don't want to turn from the patient right you know when they're sitting in the exam room and um, so if you can get a PM system, PM EHR, shameless plug here, Uprise has this, um, that utilizes tablets, then you can still be forward-facing and not necessarily, you know, always pivoting back and forth to the desktop. That's what I've heard. And, uh, Tablet input is yeah. making that a lot easier. Yeah. It kind of removes that uh, barrier. Mm -hmm. Right. That you keep, keep forward-facing with the patient. Right. Absolutely. Yep. So if a, a practice, you now assuming that you have your software ducks in a row and everything's good, if you're looking to hire a biller, um, what kind of qualities do you look for in a person? We were talking about personnel issues earlier. Um, you know, and, and is this something that one insources? Do you outsource it? Is there a, what's the preferred method these days? Um, <clears throat> my advice to, I'll, I'll get that question uh, quite frequently. You know, where do I get someone like you? Where, 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 where's the pool of employees? What do I, what should I get? Right. And honestly, the, the thing that I tell people is to look for someone with insurance experience, not necessarily optometry experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's an office full of people that know optometry and not necessarily anything about insurance. And so if you can get somebody that um, does know insurance process as well, you know, to a large degree, their payer, optometry has some specific things to learn, you know, uh, cataract post-ops and professional technical components and uh, those, uh, you know, uh, DME. It's got some specific things to learn. But really, you know, your play, codes are codes to a biller, right? you know, right. and processes. So, you know, try to identify someone who has um, some insurance experience and teach them optometry rather than the other way around. Right. That's good advice. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, you can teach the, the bit of optometry that they need to know, but you really need that person to be experiencing coding and billing and processing claims, getting things, how to circle back, how to follow up. And it doesn't yes. matter if they know the difference between myopia and hyperopia. Right. And is outsourcing a thing that people are still doing a lot of these days? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That is... Um, 
yeah, yeah, that's what my business turned into. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I managed to practice for 11 years and uh, helped blow uh, John McCormick. If you don't know Dr. John McCormick, mm-hmm. um, I managed his practice for about 11 years and um, blew it up. And his friends kept asking, you know, how are you doing what you're doing? And so um, eventually I, I woke up and went, oh, there's a business here. And so that's essentially <laughs> what um, we do is revenue cycle management. And so, yeah, um, our business has grown and grown and grown. So we're PM agnostic and we do it for uh, working on about 400 practices now. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it, it's funny how you find the, if you can find a little niche, you know, you find your niche and you're willing to dedicate yourself to something, it's amazing what can happen. But um, some of the things, the benefits of outsourcing, um, this one will resonate. There's no payroll tax. You get, in, you get a bill, you know, and um, so there's no payroll tax. Um, a lot of practices have uh, issues with employee turnover in that position. Sure. As soon as they get them trained up, they leave, and um, then it's a bit of the telephone game. Oftentimes, when I'm talking to someone in the office, they're they're they've been taught to push the buttons that they're not they really don't understand what they're doing, mm. and so when the processes break down, they don't um, they don't you know there's no shot at them they just they're probably wearing many hats but they don't know the processes well enough to identify where it went wrong. Right. Sure. So um, so the outsourcing helps that you know we have large staff of employees so when someone gets sick or goes on maternity leave or whatever it may be. Um, Claims payments don't uh, pause during that time. Um, the data doesn't overwhelm us, and transparency. Um, yeah, oftentimes an insurance employee, they may not have. So the the, the other side of that, me saying, you know, get someone who knows insurance uh, and teach them optometry, is that you know if there's someone, not someone in the practice that knows insurance well enough to go kind of poke around and dig around and manage that employee. Right then they can get a little, um, little complacent. And um, maybe they, they're not working the aging properly. Maybe they're not uh, submitting things. And uh, if you don't have that transparency, then you may not know that some claims are not getting submitted at all, you yeah. know, or reworked, that type of thing. So um, outsourcing helps with that kind of thing. Cool. All right. Well, I think this has been a, a pretty enlightening little talk, and I That's hope really that people. Great information it is. Shane. It is. It is great, and I'm hoping that people show up to your lecture as well, because uh, it's stuff that they all need to know. What time is the lecture? Yeah, when is that lecture? That was uh, tomorrow. We tomorrow, said right? Uh, yes, yeah, I, I'm one, at. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm at 12 Central, I believe. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So good luck. And, um, and uh, have guys, can, um, hmm? oh, one one thing. When uh, are we off the? No, we are we are still live. We are still live. Okay, okay. I just wanted to say when I when I first uh, answered the phone, I said, "Well, bless your heart that you started with uh, Uprise," and that was 2014. And um, Vision Web has invested millions and millions of dollars into Uprise, and it has become something that I'm quite proud to be associated with. So um, I don't want to leave any. Uh, inference or impression that it is not a quality PM system is quite the opposite. It's something right. to check out. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you have the, the guy here who's actually seen its evolution from the beginning, which is kind of well, and so impressive. Have you. And so have I, actually, yes, as a patient. So I was on the other end. So yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. All good, right. Good stuff, man. All right. Well, thanks. And uh, it's an honor to be a part of this. Um, and so thank you guys for having me. I oh, sure. It. Sure. Thank you. And, and nice I, to talk to you, Shane. And it was great, great speaking with you. And I'm sure people are going to have questions upon questions. And we'll be open on ODWire to, to hopefully you'll come on and answer them uh, once all, all this is over. Awesome. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks Shane. Shane. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Cool. Yes. Insurance. He elevated Uprise to a whole yeah. different level. Really? Oh, in the insurance area, yeah. yeah. It was there were some there were some problems initially, and he's worked through all of them, and it's just running like a smoothly oiled machine now. In That's the, fabulous. The insurance to hear. portion, yeah, absolutely. It well, is. I would imagine that if he's taken on his own, you know, practice, that he had four hundred different offices. They kind of have to know what they're doing, or else, could yeah. you imagine the disasters that they would have? Four hundred so. is a lot to manage. That's a lot. Oh my heavens. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that. That would, I mean, the, the amount of data, that would be yeah. a challenge, but it sounds like he's up to it. 
Yep. That's fabulous. He had a lot to say. He did, yes. And uh, you know, he's he's got a lot up here. There's a lot that a lot of knowledge that he can share that most people don't know about it. It's so specialized. Let's get to do a Cope lecture for him. He's speaking very agnostically about billing. It's not, you know, oh. not uh, industry, you know, or product specific or anything like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we have one more person to talk to. Do you have any questions? We saved the best for last. You didn't have any questions for him, though. I don't need questions. We can just say, how you doing? And that'll open up a 30 minutes. A little there we way, go. So. <laughs> does he have a class? He does. When is his class? Uh, We're talking about Craig Thomas. My bone and gland dysfunction where dry begins. Yes. Tomorrow? So that is tomorrow. And in fact, I right by it, didn't yeah. So this is a good one because he's talking about natural history of dry eye. So as opposed to the other ones with, you know, the algorithms and what to do, this is a, a very sciencey talk. So this will be good. Excellent. Well, Craig is always fun to talk with. Yes. That's entertainment for sure. I have a, I'm going to have a question for Craig. It's been driving me nuts. So I, I've since stopped recommending hot compresses for my bony and gland dysfunction mm -hmm. because as a practical matter, patients don't do them. Well, mm. and they also can't get it to a therapeutic temperature without hurting themselves. And we talk about the potatoes and the eggs. There was, um, we had an article a few years ago written by Don Court talking about the bundle method of using a worm compress. But there are also other things you can do besides a compress. There are more you know, things you can do in office as well, and mm -hmm. cleansers and... By the way, I recommended your, your oil. The olive oil? Yes! It works. It works. Ah, excellent! A teaspoon a day? <laughs> I take it a teaspoon a day. Every morning before I brush my teeth, oil goes in first. Good for you, Paul. A oh, teaspoon yeah. of Jack and he's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. I know it sounds silly, but for some it people, it, it's it's fairly dramatic too yeah. and quick, and and continues to improve. So to say at least two studies yeah, I mean, it's not for three months. But, uh, I'm not that rubbing my eyes anymore. I don't have any of that stuff. So. That's great. <clears throat> Sorry, I just have to. Uh, create... Here we go. Got a picture. Got a picture. He's doing it on the fly. Look at I'm this. I'm doing it on the fly. This is David Geffen. No, we're going to, he just copied that one and he's going to change it. Just, you could just call it LCT. <laughs> yeah. I'll use, I'll use his full name, should I? Yeah, use his full name. Okay. And he's not from San Diego. He's from Dallas. Some of those cowboys. See, so you're getting the behind the scenes of how this is actually done. Better. I think we should use the picture of him when he went in to um, see a patient after his hip surgery. And he's Crazy. sitting there in shorts and flip-flops with his legs stretched out because he was caring for his patient when he shouldn't have been doing that. But he did because he's Craig Thomas. How do you pronounce Ed's last name from Texas? It starts with an M. Mackler? Mackler? Yes, Mackler. Yeah. I was totally guessing. I, I once delivered a bottle of vodka to Craig Thomas through Ed Mackler. <laughs> Are you sure it wasn't a bottle filled with water? <laughs> Hang on, my phone is ringing for some reason. Maybe it's Craig calling you. Anyway, Craig's always yes, so it is. good about offering. Craig, I'm not advice. picking this up because I'm calling you right back. Yeah. He has to run it through the audio system. Yeah. This is not as easy as it looks. Ooh. Once again, that number is 555 <laughs> Yeah, I don't want people to guess your number, Craig, then you're going to get inundated with calls. 972. There we go. All righty. Hello. Dr. Thomas. LCT. Hey, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, man? Who is this? Craig? It's Adam and Gretchen. No, you must have dialed the wrong number. <laughs> what was that wrong number? Oh, he wants us to call his landline. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Wait, did we really call the wrong number? Apparently so. Huh. 
But that's the number that I was given. You guys. <laughs> Failure. That was me. Failure that all was, around. <laughs> that was the number that I Paul's, have in my phone for him. Paul's Paul's, Paul's phone. 972. <clears throat> Unless you missed dial. No, I don't think I did. All right. All right, we look stupid there. Oh. No, now we said scratch that. Now we want a different number. A different number. <laughs> I don't know what number we're calling you at, Craig. Now we've got another one. Should we be saving all these numbers? That, that's his cell number. Oh, I mistyped in there. That was my error. I had a typo. I'm pulling a paw. <laughs> Whoever sits in that seat, it rubs off of them. They have to put the wrong phone numbers in, so I dial them incorrectly. I've only done one, one error so far today. I got the no, you had, you added. You had two more acts I had to correct before I called. I checked them last night. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hey, Craig, LCT. how's it going? I really should have Now we have you. Oh my gosh, Craig, I've been I've been trying to call you, but like I keep getting the wrong numbers. So I'm I'm glad we found you finally. I'm here. I'm here. Oh man. I've been listening for a while. Doing a little computer work. Nice. I listened to some of the classes earlier. It was pretty good. Yeah? Things are looking good this yeah. year? Mm-hmm. Excellent. Good start. Good start. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of dry eye going on, but it looks like your lecture is going to be highly technical, just based on its description. No, not really. Uh, I, I'd almost say it's the reverse. The, hmm. the, the, the gist of it is to, to get away from so much of the technical diagnostic stuff, all the tear interferometry and tear meniscus heights and this and that. And, and I don't want to diminish that in any way. But my thing is that, you know, most of the time, you know where the problem is going to be. It's going to be in the meibomian glands and the eyelids. The, the testing that I'm going to talk about is how to get more information on the meibomian glands. And once you fix that 80, 90 percent of the time, you're going to make the person's dry eye better. Uh, so again, that's by definition, that's what I'm going to talk about with the title. Uh, and so it's going to be really more, as you said, Adam, if you understand the concept, you can pick whatever treatment option you think is best, uh, you know, and go from there. Like Charlie was just talking about how he's gotten away from hot compresses. Mm -hmm. Charlie, if you listen to my lecture tomorrow, you're not going to do that. Well, I mean, it, if it, it goes that the, the the science and the peer-reviewed literature and everything says that that's not the way to go is with cold compresses or ice packs or that stuff. This is going to make it worse. I agree it uh, works, but, but at the end of the day, boy, and when I ask patients a year later when they come back, are you, are you actually doing them? And most of them, you know, shake their heads and, and confess that no, hmm. they've gotten out of it. Well, you know, and again, you know me, uh, respectfully, I would say that's a management problem. Uh, who, who's the, who's the manager? <laughs> okay. that's, that's, not a, that's not a failure of the, the, the technology of the applied heat to make the person's blepharitis or my bombing gland dysfunction better. So it's, it's not a failure of that. It's, that's a management problem. Uh, so you'd have to change, change the management to make that better. So, so let's say you're depending on the patient to be a responsible part of the program. Well, I don't usually do that. I take over. You know that. Uh, I'm not, I'm, all I'm dependent on them to do is to show up because <laughs> they're not going to do anything else. So, I mean, if you're dependent on them to apply hot compresses or put some rice in a sock and heat it up or put a boiled egg on their eye or, or do any of that stuff, uh, you, 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 you are confirming uh, what most of us already know is that you have, it's almost like rebates with the contact lens companies. Okay, it's 3% utilization. Uh, that's why they keep doing it. They know no one's going to do it. They just want to say it. So you can keep saying, hey, do these hot compresses. Nobody's going to do it. So it's, it's like the tree falling in the woods. If, if nobody's there to hear it, does it really make a sound? So, so Craig, if you keep what, telling what people to do doing? stuff and they don't do it, they should be, you should be doing it in the office like I'm going to talk about tomorrow. That's what you should do. Mm -hmm. you, should, you should get some kind of – uh, uh, you you got to get some IPL or you got to get a Mybo Thermal Flow or you got to get a Lippy Flow or you got to get a – uh, uh, eye lux, and you got to get one of the five or six or seven really slick, modern pieces of technology to take care of people's eyelids because that's where the problem is. And we, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's the difference between doing a tangent screen and doing a, a threshold visual field. I mean, you no, know, not, I went to school 35 years ago, okay? 
if we're talking about, hey, go home and put a hot compress on for 10 minutes and then massage it down real good. And I want you to do that every day for the next six months. Okay, 2%. Fine. Uh, it, it's like giving people glaucoma scripts when they got no money. Okay, right. they're not going to buy the drops. So, so take control. If I got people who have glaucoma and they don't have no money, I give them the drops. If I got people who have meibomian gland dysfunction and the application of heat is a critical component of the treatment program, then I will take that over and we'll do it in the office. Uh, they'll come in every three weeks. They'll come in once a month. They'll come in whatever is required uh, to get the job done. And we do it here in the office. I, that would be my recommendation to combat patient noncompliance where the traditional recommendation would be to increase patient education, try to force the issue a little bit, try to, try to educate them and teach, Hey, this is for your own good. Okay. All right, fine. Or you can do it in the office and actually just get it done and make money while you're doing it. Okay. That's what I'm going to talk about. Right. Right on. And so my, uh, my question to you is, you know, now we have all these new wonderful new gadgets, right. That you can use in office. What do you think about the latest crop of them? Like I know IPL is becoming like a thing. I think we might IPL's even have talked about it cool. here. You know, I don't, you know, I don't have one, so mm -hmm. I can't speak authoritatively on it. Uh, I, I, I did quite a bit of reading on it to prepare for the class. I know several colleagues that have the technology and they all like it. Uh, you know, you gotta, it, it's a little bit, I, and I actually had a, 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 I didn't do a demo, but I had a pretty good presentation uh, uh, about four or five months ago where I had them come in and give everybody lunch and we talked about it. Uh, my, my patient demographic uh, precludes it though. I'm, I'm I probably, you know, 70% of my patients are black, dark skinned black people. And most of the time, it's just too much risk of depigmentation and altering the, the cosmetic appearance of the person mm -hmm. uh, with the treatment. So you can't do it on black people usually. Uh, so that's going to knock out a chunk of my patients. I mean, I, it's pretty expensive technology to have a limited application in the first place. So for me, because of that, I didn't really go too heavy into the IPL. Mm -hmm. But everybody I talk with loves it to death. Uh, so what I did is, you know, so everybody's got to pick their own thing. Uh, for me, the thing is the MyBeflow. That, that's my thing. It's something we could do in the office. It, it, it's something I do as part of an exam. Uh, it, it doesn't have any, any uh, reusables or disposables I got to buy. Right. You know, some of these technologies, every time you use one, you got to spend 80 bucks, 90 bucks. Uh, the, it could go up to 300 bucks every time you use one. You know, if you're in a part of town or a part of the state where people just don't have a lot of money for that stuff, you know, you're not going to do it. Right. Uh, so, so, you know, what I've seen, and I, you know, again, not to denigrate or disparage anybody's presentation, because there's room for everybody's thoughts, and every, there's no right or wrong way. Everybody's practice is different. You know, if, if I was in Beverly Hills, I'd be practicing different than I do now. Uh, you know, if, if I was in Manhattan, I would be practicing different than I do now. Uh, I practice the way I do because I got to practice like this to stay alive, because that's the people around me, and, and I own my own building, so I can't move. Uh, so you know, you got you got. You got, you got to work with what you got. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I've got people with eye disease. Fortunately for me, uh, it's not good for them, but, you know, they, 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 I didn't make it happen, so I don't feel any blame. And, it's, you know, I just, I've developed a practice that, you know, probably 50% of my business is medical business. Uh, and I'm trying to grow it, not shrink it. I, it could be 80% as far as I care. Because uh, I, I heard you guys talking about the Warby Parker and, you know, the convenience factor and this and that. Okay, there's no convenient blepharitis treatment. If you try to make it convenient, then it doesn't happen. See? Right. You know, I mean, you got to go where they're not at. You know, I mean, why does everybody want to sell glasses all the time? Um, and, I mean, you know, <laughs> you keep trying to do it if you want to. And, and it's easy money, so we all do it. Uh, but, I'm, you know, everybody knows what I keep saying. Uh, the, the writing's on the wall. Uh, the only thing is I'm not scared of it. You know, people are always going to have glaucoma. People are always going to have dry eyes. People are always going to get cataracts. They're always going to get diabetes. Man, diabetes is like, it's an exploding thing. Uh, I, I listened to some class earlier that a guy was trying to not to be mercenary, and he was talking about, you know, the average income of this diabetes patient is $300 a year of medical. And, you know, and I'm trying not to gag and, and laugh at myself. I'm like, man, that'd be cutting mine in half. You know, what are you talking about? $300, that's a, that's a handshake fee. You know, if you got diabetic retinopathy around mm -hmm. here, so it was you know it's interesting everybody's perspective. If you're coming from zero, then increasing your your ticket average to three hundred dollars is a big deal. If your ticket average is already five hundred dollars, uh, you know what are you going to learn? So everybody's right. different. Uh, you know I'm glad to see 
that there are other people talking about it like the way that I talk about it sometimes. I was, I was pleased to see that, you know, that there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, if you have a person with this kind of condition, there is some return on investment uh, over the course of 12 months because how are you going to pay for the technology if you don't make any money? You know, everybody, you know how the OD wire crowd can be if you talk about making money. <laughs> oh, oh, don't talk about making money. Oh, okay, but now, hey, you got this really slick $70,000 Claris machine that somebody was just talking about. How are you going to pay for that bad boy if you don't make any money? Okay. Uh, you had Craig Steinberg talking about people cheating. Okay, you know, people got glaucoma. You don't have to cheat that much. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's so much different. It's so different. So back to the dry eye thing, you know, that original question that, that Adam asked me, you know, is it technology? No, it's not technology. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go biblical. I mean, I'm going to teach you how to fish. I'm not going to give you a fish. You know, I, I can give you a fish. I'm going to teach you how to fish. And then you can decide what you want to, what kind of rod and reel you want to buy, what kind of bait you want to use. I'm going to teach you how to fish. That's what I'm going to do. Right. I, I like it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a different approach. I, you know, my question is now, since you're taking the treatment out of the hands of the patient, what kind of success rates have you seen since you started doing that? Where yeah, you do just, these you... people show up every three, mo- three weeks for IPL yeah, is, or oh whatever gosh, you're doing? You don't understand. <laughs> you just don't understand. <laughs> you do not understand. I guess we don't. <laughs> Help us understand, uh, Craig. Well, then again, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm trying not to give a commercial. I mean, I'm just, you know, I, I'm, and I have much more more experience with the specific technology that I deploy. Right. But I've, I've had similar comments from my friends that have other technologies. I know a bunch of guys that have a lippy flow. I know about a bunch of guys that got this new iLux thing. You know, the little thing you press on the eyelids, that thing's pretty cool. Right. Uh, yeah, the, the, the thing that is, and everyone has good and bad. See, the thing with the iLux, you know, the, the, the efficacy appears to be incredibly good. But you got to go 80, 80 bucks every time you use one. And at least for me, you know, when I was watching it and had it done to me, it's a procedure that the doctor would do. Mm. I would not want my staff doing this. I don't want my staff coming, you know, just I could teach them, but I don't want to teach them. I mean, I, I, I got staff that could put college employees in. I don't want them doing that. Okay, that's my job. You, do, you all go do something else. Run the machines. You know, that's, that's, that's my thing. So the MyBeFlow technology is staff delivered. <laughs> that's the first thing. So with the, again, I'll, I'll have a couple of pictures of it. And it's not a MyBeFlow lecture. But it's a critical component of my treatment program. Uh, the, the treatment program is essentially, you know, without going into the presentation, it's three things. You've got to clean the eyelid margin. Right. You've got to heat up the glands and get the mybum out of there. And then you've got to go with some kind of topical or systemic anti-inflammatory. And there's just some, some blend of that thing. But, but if you don't heat the glands up, open up the ducts, get that, that, that sticky, gooey mybum out of there, oh, you can put Lodamax and everything else you want on there. It ain't going to be nothing. Right. Uh, you know, the, the source of the problem is the clogged glands. Uh, the way to unclog the glands for an optometrist is lippy flow, IPL, MyBeFlow, ILUX, something like that, okay? I'm, I'm trying to get into this introductal probing, uh, but it looks a bit exotic. Uh, it doesn't but that sound very fun. Could, no. <laughs> no, but it, but it works. You know, the, the articles that talk about it, you know, it's like, like how lippy flow works. You know, you do it one time and you're done for a year. You know, you do this introductory probing one time and you're done for a year. Hmm. And, it's, and it's something I could do as opposed to charging somebody $800 for it, you know, because I, I, I'm not going to be able to do it if i got to charge $800. There's nobody around here with $800. Right. Uh, so I can't, I can't do the lippy flow. So I, you could go to these classes, and I've seen them. We've all seen them. You know, they're cool. Uh, I wish I'd have thought of it, you know, hey, let me show you how to make a zillion dollars on a patient with dry eye. First thing you do is get you an Oculus and a lippy flow and, and you charge eight hundred dollars every time you shake your hand. Okay, that's great. If, if you got a part of the country pay. where everybody, yeah, yeah, it's hey, you know, knock yourself out. Uh, if you can roll like that, uh, I can't quite roll like that. You know, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> not, I'm rolling. You know, that's not the part of Dallas, Texas I'm in. And I got plenty of company. There's a lot, you know, I, there's plenty of optometrists like me. You know, I'm not in some ghetto. It's not like that. But I'm not in the affluent part of town. Right, you right. Know? And I've been I've been practicing long enough to where the part of town that that was somewhat affluent is now less affluent right you're just a ham and egger like everybody else yeah i'm you know there's a waffle house down the street i've eaten it before (laughs) (laughs) so what else going on y'all what else what else uh you know i I saw the ocpa talk i thought that was cool yep uh the private equity thing is a big deal around here right now yeah what do you think about that craig 
oh, it's, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. It's real. Uh, very surprising. Uh, it's good and bad. I've been courted. Everybody's been courted. All the yeah. big dogs are being courted. You know, you got to have a million dollar plus practice a year, and they'll find you. Uh, I know, I know, dozens of guys, ladies too, that have been courted in negotiations. I already know several that have sold. Yeah, uh, the money's outrageous. Uh, it's outrageous. But let me ask you this, uh, Craig: If you yeah. sold, could you actually deal with working for someone for a couple of years before you just exploded? Not a chance. Yeah, you'd love to play I mean, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to be you know, giving away my negotiating posture because I'm, I haven't said yay or nay yet. Right. Uh, but it was, I, I've been working on this for months, uh, trying to make a decision. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a difficult thing, but the, is it Bruder? Is that his name? Bruder McBruder's uh, something. Uh, he was talking about it on the, ben on the Chudner. podcast. Oh, ben, ben Chudner. Chudner. Yeah. Chudner. Yeah. yeah. Chudner. Bruder yeah, is a yeah, mask. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, hey, yeah. you know, uh, Chudner. Yeah, <laughs> so, <Chudner. laughs> but I agree with everything I heard him say. Yeah, Ben's uh, a good guy. And yeah. yeah, he 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 had it almost exactly like I would say it, uh, based on my conversations with a bunch of people and, and me looking at it myself. And if you had to condense it down to some basic formula, if you're going to work ten years or more, you should probably keep your business. If you're going to work ten years or less, you may want to sell to some of these guys because they're going to pay you triple what it's worth. Right. And I mean triple. OK, you won't come close to getting what they pay from any optometrist. And I mean, not even close. That's a lot okay? of money That's to walk away deal. from. That's the deal. OK, they're paying triple. They, I mean, it's like it's, it's like they got two billion dollars and they don't know what to do with it. It's like monopoly money to them. <laughs> so I've never seen anything like it. It's like a feeding frenzy. So I, mean, I saw I saw it starting years ago when, when I was doing some stuff with the Armark guys and they mm -hmm. got sold. You know, I mean, they got sold for 880 million. I mean, that's crazy. It's crazy. The are, money's just, it, you know, it's like, where's the money coming from? You know, are you seeing the, 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 the firms bid against each other? You know, no, 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 no. The, no, I mean, again, it, you know, it's kind of, some of the stuff's kind of secret squirrel, you know, they sure. kind of, <laughs> you, you, you got to sign non-disclosure right. papers as soon as you shake their hand almost. Uh, there's five or six companies. You know, you got one or two big dogs, and then you got some some the second tier, but they all got money, so it don't really matter. You know, it, it, what's the difference? What's the difference between a hundred billion and, and, and two hundred billion? I mean, well, know, it might be money. how your practice shakes out at the end. Is your practice going to remain fairly close to what you created, or is it going to turn into almost a franchise? And I think there are differences. It, it, it among... depends on the group. Right. Right. Depends on the group. See, right. That's what I've seen. So that is I've, the I've difference. Seen, I mean, yeah, there is a, there is a, no, no, they're not, there's not, they're not cookie cutter. They're different. The only thing that's common is the, the, the outrageous money. Right. <laughs> that's, right. that's the common part. Yeah, that, that appears to be pretty consistent. But no matter what, if you're going to keep your practice more than 10 years, you can probably out earn what they're going to pay you. Right, right, right. But for a guy that's getting ready to go, or a guy that's got a, let's say, I mean, I, you know, let's say, uh, I, 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 again, I got to be kind of sensitive. Uh, <laughs> let's hypothetically say there was a 47 year old optometrist that was quite successful and had been successful for a long time and had put money away and could really almost retire if he wanted to right now. But, but likes working and likes making money. Let's say that guy got courted mm -hmm. uh, and they said, hey, we'll buy your office. Uh, to me, the 46-year-old guy who really had no plans on retiring, now he's thinking about it because because here's the here's the verbatim words that I'm hearing, y'all. It's a, it's comical. It's comical. <laughs> it's, it's it's like guys getting up out of my chair with the mind flow. So I've heard the verbatim words from guys that have already sold, and now I'll, I'll say, man, you sold your practice, you sold your business, for real, you sold it, and he goes, Craig, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Yep. I said, like, what? I said, what? That's, that's <laughs> too much money to walk away from. He said, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I was like, wow, that's strong. But then if I say, you know, because I'm talking to a guy that I'm pretty familiar with for him to even be telling me this kind of stuff. And then the next question would be, how much did you get? Yeah. And you thought I'm, you thought I stole something now. Uh, <laughs> they, they don't even know me. Okay. <laughs> you know, that, they are, that, that information is secret. Top secret. Top, tippity top. <laughs> okay, no numbers.
Hmm. Okay, they they didn't kidnap somebody's firstborn or something. There's <laughs> everybody I talked to, man, I'm telling you, they got the code of silence going like some Chicago police officers. I mean, tell you, I mean it's, it's crazy. Craig, okay. across the board, are all those doctors we having to work said that. for their for those pra for their practices after they're sold? Say that for again. Across the board, do those doctors then have to work for the practices that they've sold? Yeah, they work three to five years, depending on how much they want to work. That's got to be a painful three to five years. <laughs> Man, I don't know. The money seems because they pay you whatever you was making. Yeah, but okay, then you, you have to no follow their cut. rules. No, nah, I mean, the guys I've talked to said they don't come in rocking the boat. They come in pretty mellow most of the time. They, the, they, what they change the is they, they change the, the buying. That's the first thing they change. Okay, you don't get to pick and choose who you're buying from. Right. That's what they change. But they want your staff. They want you. They don't want to be disruptive. They don't want you to leave. You know, that's the last thing they want. They want you to stay at least three years. Three uh, years? Five is, is, yeah, minimum. That's a long time yeah. to not but, be your own they, boss. But, well, but, you know, let's say it was a guy like me. So let's say, you know, I got a $2 million practice that I could sell to another optometrist for a million two, maybe. To me, if you got the wherewithal to borrow a million two, you just ought to go start your own business. But, but let's just say that would be the price because that would be the price. It ain't going to be $2 million. You know, rarely do you see the $2 million practice sell it for $2, $2 million. Uh, you know, these guys will give me four and a half, five. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, there's no chance of that happening to any optometrist. It's a lot. Okay. But then I got to mm -hmm. decide. I mean, I had meetings with my CPA and all that. We talked about it. Me and my partner it was like, hey, you know, what if we got – what if we got six million? What, can we do it? You know, if they gave us six million cash, will we walk away? I'm like, man, I might. I didn't look but, at it. But you wouldn't you know. walk away, though. You would be tied there for but several walk, years. Yeah, but, you know, then you come. What was the first question you asked me? You know, could I suck that up and put up with that? I don't know. You know, where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, hey, I don't know. I'd almost rather work 10 years, you know, <laughs> than yeah. we got this far. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I haven't made the decision because they haven't made me a final offer. And I ain't stupid. Uh, I'm going to let them make me an offer. <laughs> well, I also think it's doctor personality and how and how much you want to be in charge and what happens if there are well, small I mean, changes that you don't agree with and you can't walk away then. You, You've got a no, contract. No, you got, no, you suck it up. Okay, that was the, the <laughs> negative. Okay, you are absolutely an employee. Don't even think anything else. Yeah, okay. you don't get to decide yeah, anymore. Yeah. You can't decide yeah. that you want to be the doctor and do certain things. They... But they if might you get, tell but you to delegate to staff. But if, but if you're, if you're going to retire in three years, okay, you can do, I could do anything for three years. You keep your mouth shut for three years? I could, uh, you know, <laughs> to make $3 million, I could. Could you? Yes, Every sir. man has yes, his price. Ma <laughs> yes, absolutely. I might, okay. Okay, so what do you do older, after that? What do you do after you are cut cut loose, your golden parachute? You're still a young guy. I mean, if, you're, if you're 65 or 68, you retire. What you if you're 47? Enjoy yourself. Then you take whatever money you got and you go into another business. That's true. At okay. some point, you're still young enough. If you actually wanted to keep doing this, I suppose you could, right? After you oh, leave, yeah. you, you could. Oh, you, you'd have to. Yeah. The, 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 the apparently, again, I'm, I'm just hypothetical <laughs> you know, you got pretty significant restrictive covenants. Sure. So there'll be no selling your practice in north dallas and then you move in 20 miles to south dallas and starting over there right none of that okay so there's a pretty wide blanket of like, like don't even think about it you can go to i can go to oklahoma maybe okay <laughs> but there'll, well there'll craig. Be no craig thomas in <laughs> dallas texas practicing where my regular patients could come find me right so yeah, craig i'm hearing yeah. from a friend of mine who's listening to your conversation saying that um these venture capitalist companies flip the practices in a year or two and that's what hap is happening with ophthalmologists, and they sell the practice for profit to new owners then. Are you hearing this? Mm -hmm. I am not. That is my that is word on the I'm street. Hearing. No, I don't think that's the case, that because is, as Paul surmised before... That is not before, what I'm hearing, and that no. goes exactly against everything I have heard. Yeah, what, what Paul surmised you know, before... Flipping a practice does not, employ, does not suggest main, retaining the owner for five years. No, and that is not a flipping the practice strategy. They'll never make back the money in two years anyway. What right. they're going to do is, is what Paul suggested as we were getting drinking this wine, 
and essentially they're going to they're going to roll up as many practices as they can, and then eventually sell to the biggest fish they possibly can. Yeah, like they'll Luxottica. sell to another venture capitalist <laughs> company. That is what my source is telling me. Yeah, like ten years down the road, or they'll sell to Luxottica or whoever else is they gigantic might. enough to swallow them. But as as we all know, and as the Los Angeles Times, I guess, just revealed yet again, <laughs> you know, if you could sell a bunch of glasses, there's quite a bit of profit there. Sure. Uh, and again, from the the little bit that I could kind of see and that I could glean from people you know, without them going secret on me, the the biggest thing they do is they change how you buy stuff. Right. And they'll squeeze another 10, 15% out of that some kind of way. Even if you're in vision source and something, they still, they'll squeeze it. Right. So, so if you if you got a million dollar practice, you know, and it's it's netting 300, okay, they'll, it's going to net 375. And then as soon as you bug out in five years, they'll put some new grad in here. And they'll have such systems in place, it'll be like an autopilot. Right. And, and they'll just be, they're, now you got a million dollar business, they're netting 500000 out of it. Right, and because they're probably, not paying you. Yeah, because they ain't paying me, see? Then a guy like me, you know, let's say I got my own building, and they'll, they'll do a 20-year lease for me. Right. Maybe for 10 years. I mean, so they pay me pay me double what I'm paying myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, then, it's something you got to look at. So what have you, you thought about at? what you might do then if you if you take the money and run in three years? <laughs> well, Move I to Oklahoma? Still do my, you know, <laughs> no, nah, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be a consultant like I am now. You know, uh, I'd still try to lecture. I have a website uh, you could buy. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheap. Well, I, I mean, I, you know, but, you know the, the answer to the question is I don't really think I want to do nothing else. That's why I don't think I'm going to sell. Right. Because I like doing what I'm doing. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, you and, love and, your and, job. And I, yeah, I mean, and, and I've, I'm kind of living this semi-extravagant lifestyle that I've gotten used to. You know, I don't really want to <laughs> take a pay cut either. Right? <laughs> you know. Well, you know, you know what? A comfortable lifestyle. <laughs> you know what? You can tell, and I go to all these ridiculous conferences, right? I'm there at five or six of them every year. You can tell the people who actually enjoy being there from the people who just want to just shoot themselves in the head. And you could tell that Craig really likes what he's doing. Right. And right. likes being there. And so, yeah, that, that's, I, don't, I just don't you know, see you bugging out in three years. Personally, that's just no, my opinion. And, 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 and I really can't either. And the only thing that would make, it, make me do it would be an extreme amount of money. <laughs> and, well, and these guys are ordering on extreme, so you got to at least listen to them. Well, this is a, I don't say it's a once in a lifetime. This is going to peter out in about three, four years. Yeah. All, all the buying is going to be done. It's going to take a minute, but it's going to, it's going to take three or four years. There'll be a different landscape. Oh, well, yeah. It's like and a game get, of Monopoly, right? And Everyone you get starts one in the beginning. Yeah. To do yeah. this. So you're, nobody's going to knock on your door again in 10 years when you're ready to retire. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it's not going to expire next year, but I don't think it'll be like this five years from now. And honestly, I don't care. You know, I'm 59. I can do what I want. I mean, nothing to me. You know, six years, six months ago, nobody was talking about this mess. Yeah. Not really. Hey, you know. Craig, I got a question. Yeah. What's the acquisition time on an OCTA on your Zeiss unit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 30 seconds. They'd... Yeah, I heard you talking about that Heidelberg, man. You know, there's a reason I don't have one, and, and it ain't because it's not good. It's because it's hard to use. <laughs> okay, the things, the, the images are the best. You know that. That's why the ophthalmologists have them. Uh, although I, I got to tell you, man, this new Optiview I got last year, this thing's top of the line. It's top of the line. Okay, uh, I did a trial with the with the uh, the uh, Zeiss technology, and it's good. You know, I mean. Any angiography is better than no angiography, yeah. and, and I didn't think there would be significant differences between them. But in my experience, there are differences between the different companies and the, and the platforms, and they have pros and cons. Uh, the Heidelberg historically might have the, the highest resolution, sharpest, all of that stuff. You know, but I remember talking to my retina guy about it. I'm like, hey, man, do I really need to go here? And he says, yeah, if you really want to make a decision based on one half microns difference in the left eye. Yeah. Knock yourself <laughs> out. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to be doing that, you know? So it's, it's like, you know, him and you're splitting hairs, you know, it, it, some angiography is better than no angiography. So if, if any angiography is better than no angiography, 
then it's almost back to the Warby Parker thing, the convenience, the ease of use. So if I can do, you know, 15 of those things a day and it don't mean nothing, and you're doing six of them a day and it's like pulling teeth, yeah, that's going to make a difference over the course of a year. Uh, especially when my information is 99.9% as good as or better than yours. Uh, so, you know, it does make a difference. Uh, so, so, you know, again, the, the bottom line is getting good images. Uh, but especially with the angiography, man, uh, as you've seen, you know, what you're going to see, I would think, I mean, I'm not that familiar with the Heidelberg, uh, but, you know, you got a lot of motion artifacts when you try to do angiography because it takes longer. You know, it takes longer than a regular scan. And if they blink or move or something, man, it's tricky. Uh, I just put my new uh, uh, Angio analytics software on this week on my, my machine because it, it actually measures the vessel density and then it assigns numeric values to the geographic zone. It's pretty cool, pretty slick. So it's taking it even one step further, you know, where right now you can look at a, a scan and you can see capillary fallout or some areas of non-perfusion or, or changes in the shape of the foveal avascular zone. But now you can actually assign numeric values to the vessel density and track that change over time. Then I'm thinking, man, this is going to be great. This is going to be so cool. So we put the new software on and it takes a little bit longer. <laughs> it takes a little <laughs> bit longer to do it now. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, a little longer. You know, you start to get some more motion artifacts. So the staff has already noticed it, and I was just like, hey, y'all handle it. Y'all figure it out. I don't want to hear it. Just put the scan on the, on the computer. That would be a management problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a management problem, and I'm delegating. Hey, Craig, I have You're a question delegate. for you. Yeah. This also came in from my anonymous source. I understand that you had a radio show offering love tips. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I heard about that. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. What Ten were years. some of those love tips? <laughs> this is a family well, program. Was, uh, <laughs> As yeah, we're drinking it, wine. Yeah. <laughs> it, it morphed over time. Uh, so it's, its focus was on male-female relationships. And, and I had a kind of my, my, my Ph.D. thesis thing on this subject where I wrote this article that got printed in the paper called the men are worthless and the women are stupid <laughs> and I, I i spent the whole time expounding on and explaining that and how the women have to recognize how worthless the men are in the context of male female relationships they might be a good provider and all of that stuff you might be a good optometrist but you know they don't take care of his, his, his woman properly uh or vice versa but but in my sense it was always talking to the to the women and trying to teach the women the true nature of the man. Uh, and then as I was on the radio, it was a gospel, <laughs> black gospel radio station. Then after a few years of that, then we, I cooked up with Reverend Sharon Patterson and we formed this thing called the Love Clinic. And we took it on the road and we would go around to different churches and schools and put on relationship seminars. So like, like an example would be, it would be a title of one. We would do a, a seminar called Ring Around the Collar. Okay, what do you think that's about? I think that's about Charlie's wife not getting his shirts clean enough. <laughs> I'm thinking that's about members of the clergy abusing their flock. Mm. Oh boy, that's a little bit of a different. Uh... Oh yeah, yeah. Like like like. Let's say you let's say you a a 60 year old woman and your 70 year old husband passed away, and and maybe one of the deacons at the church, he might want to call and and see if you need any comfort. You know, and you're, you're, you're grieving. And, and if you're not prepared to receive that comfort properly, you, something may happen. And, and, and if, you're not, if you don't have your defenses ready, you might be, you might be comforted, okay? You In a different way than you anticipate. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's a, that's a one example. That's just one example. So, so are these archives that I can go check out? <laughs> I've got some tapes. i got cassette tapes. It was way back. <laughs> I think you need to send me a package. Yeah, I could. I may see, I, I've got a few left. For I mean, it was, it, yeah, but I would love to hear that. I, no I think you would actually be a great guy to deliver that kind of information. Well, I really would love to hear I, it. Oh, it was. Oh, it was. It, I had a blast. You know, and it, what happened is it started off as an eye care show. So it was a call in, one hour call in talk show on eye care. I would start talking about glaucoma and this and that. And then it went to love. All that stuff. Then it went to teen pregnancy. 
I and care. I was on that for like a year. Teen pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I ran out of eye care topics. You know, I, I mean, you can only talk about glaucoma so many times, you know. So after a few years, I'd run through the A to Z on eye care. So we started going into social issues. So then it went into the teen pregnancy because Dallas, Texas at the time, I got a whole statistics from the Texas Department of Human Resources. I had all these political connections being, you know, political. And Texas was like number 48 behind the Mississippi and somebody in infant mortality. Mm. And again, I'm in a part of town where 70% of the patients are black, you know, black girls, you know, got a pretty high infant mortality, highest in the world. Uh, and I was seeing it with my own eyes. You know, I mean, I had 13 year old girls who were pregnant. It was wild. Oh, that's right. Uh, you know, I mean, Oh, I mean, it didn't mean nothing. <laughs> this is regular clockwork. So, so we, so I got interested oh. in that stuff. Oh, I mean, I, I would have a 17 year old kid with, with three kids, man. You know, we, I wow. could have a, a I could have, I could have a 33 year old grandmother with the 16 year old daughter and the two year old toddler in the exam room at the same time. Okay, all right, I got tired of that stuff. Oh my so, gosh! So, I, so then you so start I, talking I, about I love. So, so then I started talking about that. I'm like, hey, let me let me get on this thing here. You know, so we started talking about that, and then after we got deep into that, it, it hit me. I was like, you know, why are these ladies in this situation in the first place? You know, why are some 15 year old girl pregnant with no money and getting ready to drop out of high school. And, and you know, and it hit me, you know, because some guy keeps impregnating her, you know, that's what it is. And then I'm thinking, okay, well, let me, you know, if it's 15 year old girl, you know, 15 year old guy, let me figure out how to get at him. And then once we got all the statistics, and this one, the light bulb went off. And what all the statistics showed is that 76% of the time when the teenage lady, girl, young woman was pregnant, the average age of the guy that was getting her pregnant was 21. Oh, and, that's wrong. And so wrong. the average age differential was five and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't 15-year-old guys getting with 15-year-old girls. It was 15-year-old girls getting preyed upon by 20-year-old guys rolling up to the school in their cars at 3.30, saying, hey, baby, hey, baby, jump in. That's what was happening. Okay. okay All right, I now I understand. The, so you yeah, were trying to yeah. teach them teach the men how to yeah. treat women and teach the women how no, not no, to be taken the men. advantage of. No, forget them. No, <laughs> oh. no, these were female-only seminars. No, I, the, oh. the guy, I had no access to the guys. The guys were grown. <laughs> so there's 20-year-old guys having sex with 16-year-old girls. Okay, I want to talk to the girls. If, and if tell I, them to smart up. If you get the girl smart, if you could get the girl smart and get her to control her own body, unless she was getting ready to get beat up and raped, then she was in control. And, and so I said, look, you in control. That's what we're trying to teach. You know, it's, it's your call. You got you. You the cop. You the traffic cop. You know. You say green light or red light. It's on you. You know. And I try to teach them how to say no. Uh, so we went at it. Me and Reverend Patterson. We did the good cop, bad cop when we do a love clinic. But she would come out, start the thing off, go with the biblical principles, try to be chaste, try not to have sex before marriage. She would do all of that stuff. And I let her finish. And then I would come out. Okay, for everybody else. This is how we're going to roll. All right. These are the rules and rigs. How you, you're going to be active. This is what you got to do to control this thing. Okay. You got to regulate it. Okay. It's like liquor and cigarettes. You got to regulate it. So you got to regulate the sex. You got to control it. It can't be, it can't be, we were just kicking it, you know, and it just happened. Oh, it just happened. I got to, I had some 17 year old girl in there with a, with a, you know, year old baby. I said, you, what happened? Oh, we were just kicking it. It just happened. I'm like, right. Okay. I'm like, where's he at now? Uh, we, we ain't talking no more. I'm like, Jesus, help me. Okay, so that's how that started. So, so then I, so I'm like, okay, the women do not understand how the men are. The men keep taking advantage of them. They keep lying to them. They, they tell them anything they need to tell them to get that sex. That's all they want. And I said, let me teach the women how the men are, how the men act, what the men say, what they do. You know, because they, they keep... You keep thinking your man is a good man, and he's really a low-life dog. Okay, you just can't see it. Craig, All the guys can see it. Craig, I They're really need to hear these tapes L Lordy, now. let there be tapes. I really need to hear these now. I, oh, my. They, actually, they so, sound so, really so I did great. 10 years of, I did 10 years of that as the love doctor. Wow. Oh, my God. I need to hear oh, these. Oh, we got to hear them. <laughs> I got it. They sound wonderful. They really sound great. How did the girls respond? In the beginning, they would all be defensive. And it's a Reverend Pat. I, you know how I am. Let me listen to me. I mean, I would come in strong, you know. And they would. I mean, I remember the, the the best example of it. I was we were at this junior high school, and you know, I mean, so you think of you're the junior high because because 
Thirty percent of the people are sexually active. That's why. Wow. Uh, this is Texas. So I mean, with this junior high school, and it was way across town. It's like twenty-five miles from my practice. You know, I mean, I, but some teacher was a patient there, and she heard about what we were doing, and you know, she begged us to come. So we went over there one day. You know, we would do it like once a month. We pick a school and go once a month. It would be a, it, all girls assembly, no guys. We never talked to the guys. Just a waste of time. Because uh, if the girls were smart, it didn't matter what the guys did. So that's what it didn't matter what the guys did. Just teach the girls. <laughs> it didn't matter what the guys do. Just ignore the guys. So we're over there with these young girls, and I'm breaking into my thing, and you know, trying to, you know, hey, you know, we gotta, we gotta control the sex. We gotta, you know, I'm not saying don't be sexually active, but if you don't do it, there's, you know, there's right and the wrong way to do it. You know, we gotta, you gotta do it properly. I'm not making moral judgments. I'm just putting the rules and the regs out. Okay. All I want is for you to not have a baby. I don't care about nothing else. I am an anti-teen pregnancy. That's all I'm here for. Uh, you have sex with 10 guys, 10 times, I don't care. Just don't have a baby. So I'm going through my thing, you know, going through the whole spiel. And this little, this little girl named Ashley, I'll never forget it the rest of my life. And she looked like she's about 60 pounds, a little, looked like a little stick person. So Ashley raises her hand. You know, I'm always interactive, let people talk and raise their hands. So I'm going through my thing. And, and you know, she, got, she did what happened pretty regular especially in the beginning, uh, you know, the girls would get defensive. Uh, they would like, you know, who are you to be over here telling us to do this or do that, da 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 And so Ashley, this little girl, Ashley, raised her hand, stood up, and she was indignant. She had an attitude. You know, she said, who the hell you think you are coming <laughs> over here talking to us like this? I don't know you. You ain't my daddy. Bye, 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 bye. Was like, she pregnant? Okay, you finished? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, but she was sexually active, and she admitted it. She says, I've had sex. I'm like, good, that's why you're here. Well, I'm here. You know, I'm expecting that. Let's keep talking. So she basically challenged me and says, why am I over here? I said, okay, that's an excellent question. I said, anybody else got the same question? Your hands go. I said, all right, let's answer that question right now. So I was at the, it was in the auditorium. You know, I always did an auditorium. Well, you know, maybe, you know, 150 girls there. Uh, and, you know, think back like grade school. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like, like I'm like, it's, you know, a time warp. So I'm in the, in the auditorium and they've got the big chalkboards on the wheels. You know, oh, right, you right. Slide mm-hmm. them around. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. You get that visual? Yep. yep. So they had the big chalkboards there where you can write and move the chalkboard around the stage. So I pulled this big chalkboard out and I said, Ashley, this is why I'm here. Okay. This, this, I want you to listen to this real good. I said, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent me and you on this chalkboard. I'm going to be one line and you're going to be another. I said, now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start off on the top of the chalkboard and, and I'm going to start off with you. Uh, you know, I'm, we're talking about you right now. I said, here you are, Ashley, 12 year old girl over here in East Dallas, uh, and, and, and you're running your program. And what you've already admitted to me is that your program is drinking and drugging and sexist. Because that's what you told me you was doing. You know, you said you were sexually active. You said you smoked marijuana. Uh, you said you had already drunk alcohol. Uh, so your program, your 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 uh, after school, your 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 enjoyment factor, your your program is drinking and drugging and sex. And I said, Ashley, I got to tell you, I really don't have a problem with that. Uh, you know, when I was in college, that was our program. Uh, you know, I mean, you look early, uh, but I'm not going to say that's not really a bad program for a young person. I'm not trying to make judgments on the program. I want to see what the program is. So that's your program. Now, with that program, what seems to be happening about 20% of the time to young ladies in the 186,000 student Dallas Independent School District is about 20% of the time you're going to get pregnant when you run in that program, okay? So that's the first stat you need to know is that 20% of the girls in Dallas Independent School District, 10th largest city in the country, 186,000 students, at any one time, you've got 20% of the girls either pregnant or have already delivered a baby. That's astounding. Okay? Oh my wow. That's what we're dealing with here. All right? So I said, this is what's going to happen 20% of the time when you run that program. You go in there pregnant sometime in the next two, three, four years. If you get pregnant while you're still in school, what all of the statistics I got from the Texas Department of Human Resources says is that 85% of the time you're going to be poor. You're going to be on Medicaid. You ain't going to have no money. I'm going to be paying for your stuff. <laughs> and 60% of the time, you're going to be dropping out of high school. 
So now you're going to be uneducated on top of being poor. So what happens here is I said that chalkboard and I said, here's Ashley over here in East Dallas. And then I said, here, she's running her program, drinking, drug, and sex, and drinking, drug, and sex, and drinking, drug, and sex. And I, I drew a straight line about halfway across the board. And I said, now, all of a sudden, Ashley gets pregnant. And then I stopped. I said, now, here's Dr. Craig Thomas, eye doctor, over in Duncanville, Texas. I'm 25 miles away from here. I don't know Ashley. Ashley don't know me. I'm running my program. My program is getting up going to work every day, doing eye exams, paying 20 employees, paying a bunch of taxes, coming home, doing this, doing that. That's my program, okay? I got my program. Ashley got her program. We're 25 miles away. Neither one of us know each other. Never should. I said, Ashley, this is what's going to happen. If you get pregnant, you're going to get on public assistance. I'm going to have to start supporting you and that baby and you're going to cost me money. I, then I went up to her line, which had been parallel to mine. And I said, so once you get pregnant, your line is going to drop like a rock. And your line will come down. And your line will touch my line and cross it. The instant your line touches mine, it becomes my business. My line is never going to touch your line. I'm never going to do anything you got to worry about but you keep doing stupid stuff and it keeps coming and touching my line and I'm pissed off about it. And that's why I'm over here. <laughs> stay away from my line. If you stay away from my line, I won't be over here messing with you. What did Ashley sense. have to say? How did she respond to that? Uh, and she said, me, I broke it down. You see, I broke it down. I said, stay away from my line. That's all you got to do. Okay. You have 10 kids. I don't care. I can't support them. And they can't be criminals. <laughs> okay. You got to raise them up right if you go have 10 of them. What'd she say? Okay. <laughs> she took it a little bit. You know, she had a little attitude. You know, she, she, you know, she, she, she didn't cuss me out. <laughs> okay, I have a really important question, Craig. Does Ashley work for you now? <laughs> no, no. Because you could see how I could ask that, right? <laughs> Couldn't you see how I could ask that? You know that he kept in touch with her and yeah. mentored her, and then she works in his office. You could totally see no, that. The only thing I liked about Ashley is she had the intestinal fortitude to challenge me in public. I give her credit for that. <laughs> That's for a 12-year-old right. yeah. kid, that was pretty strong. Ash yeah. Ashley gets props. All right. Well, Craig, we are running out of time here, but thank you so much for this. As you got to regulate the sex, uh, you gotta, man. Yeah, that's that's the key phrase of the day. <laughs> I'm gonna say that every time I see you now. You got to regulate the gotta sex. Regulate. <laughs> hey, nice All talking right, to you, buddy. Glad I could help. All right. Thanks, Craig. All right. See you. Hey, Craig. See it was later. good to talk to you. I'll see you soon. Okay. Catch bye. -bye. You later. bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was classic. It's a good thing we were drinking before we had to Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Oh, oh he's Talking funny. Craig is always oh, an education. Oh, my God. He was just, he was just, <laughs> wow, that was crazy. All right, everyone. Well, I guess we're done for the day. <laughs> uh, can't top that. Are so the classes over? Maybe we should come. Classes on. go on until like 8 o'clock or something, right? Or oh. no, it, was it 8 Eastern? When do they go on until? One moment, please. Let's see where, where we start. This one should start at 7. What's today? Today is... Is... Uh, 6. 26. Uh, they go on until 8.15 yeah. Eastern. So we've got... No, uh, we don't have to stay we for that. To, We're done. Okay. Because <laughs> most people are in their class or they're abandoning oh, ship okay. by now. So, so yeah, we are, so they're, they finish yeah. in half an hour anyway. Yep. So we are, I think, just about done for the day. And we had our wonderful mystery guest And yes, here. we had the mystery guest, Charlie. Thank Thanks you for, for being me. here. I'm so glad you put hilarious. a bag over me... your head and then do a big reveal. <laughs> yeah. That well, interview wasn't bad, was it? It was a pleasure. I am so glad you did. You'll have to do it again. Yeah, you got to come back to the studio sometime. Well, you know, wait, we always... might be in, where are we going to be next year? Where are we going to be? Where's Whitney? Oh, was she, was she in? Like some island? She was some island. Where was Portuga? she? Portuga? No. She, anyway, we're going to an island Yeah, next we don't year. want to do this here. It's too cloudy. So... <laughs> Oh my gosh, no, but it was great seeing you and, uh, you know, hopefully, you, I'm going to be reposting this, just FYI, so, oh, wonderful. you know, because, you know, because everyone misses it the first time around, but this live stream, once we go off the air, continuously runs in a loop on the live stream page until we pick up again tomorrow, so. Awesome. You can go home and watch it. Tonight. Yeah. 
That was really? hilarious, by the way. You whipped out your cell phone, and you were actually videoing the screen, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did that with you, your first J&J &J thing. Oh, I thought that was cool. Yeah, that was that was kind of interesting. It's very behind weird the scenes, to see yourself. Now you got scene, to so. peek behind the curtain. In our, the vast studio lot yeah, here. Yeah, my, my wife was like, you're going to Adam Farkas's? <laughs> yes, we're going to Adam Farkas's. So here's my evidence. It's your proof. Yes. yes. Well, she can yeah. watch it tonight, too. That's right. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Dad. Um, and we will be back here tomorrow, bright and early, 7.30. And thank time. you, Steve, for being thank you, the Steve, man out to there. watch the uh, Sorry the I CD missed you, class. buddy. Yeah, sorry yeah, about looking that. Looking forward to that. Steve is doing a good job out there actually making sure that things are going okay because, as I just looked, you know, we've had a million emails with people having questions and support and stuff, and Steve has been out there handling it. So Excellent. Right on. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, and we will pick it up again tomorrow. Until tomorrow morning.